Welcome everybody, it's uh, Unstoppable Stiletzi, and welcome to the Age of Empires 3 Wars of Liberty League uh, 2023-2024 to matches for week uh, 16, yep, we're on week 16 now. So we got quite a few matches to do today, we got about 15 in total, you know, had some family stuff come up in the last two weeks which made it virtually impossible to, um, do my matches so we had to skip over skip over those ones because my opponent could conceivably also had issues as well with um committing to a time to do for the matches so hopefully now for actually for week 17 it's confirmed that I will be doing my matches tonight like my act the matches that I'm playing so you will see me play for week 17 don't worry about that but week 16 I've kind of you won't, unfortunately, won't get to see me for this one. You'll enjoy the rest of the people, though. We got plenty of Juanitos Muy Bonitos here to entertain you. So let's start with these two nice Juanitos Bonitos here, Severo and Fufi. Hmm. Alright, so we got the uh, Swedish with Fufi. Who is his opponent? He has uh, Germany. Nice, good old Germany. The Booming Civ. So this should be a pretty interesting one, you know? Two Germanic Civs going into total war with each other. Who will win is really a good question, actually. I mean, on one hand, Swedish, they can do a large mass of the Beveringers using their allotments from the Torps. On the other, you got Germany, obviously, with their manor booming, so they could get a lot of villagers and then output their own army to deal with that. So it's it's going to be a bit of a balance, balancing act for both players to see how they can really scale their Civs bonuses against each other. Yeah, definitely. We see um, Fufi building a uh, trading post in this spot over here. Pretty good idea since um, Swedish actually has some pretty decent age 1 card options, but none of them apparently include uh, settler shipments. Which you think is kind of strange, like if you don't have settler shipments, why do you care so much about getting early XP? Well, the thing is, is Swedish have a wide variety of um, cards you consider semi-essential to doing really well which we'll probably see in their deck real soon. Some of which you know, some of which you might not have heard of if you haven't seen. So, first one's gonna be Colbertism for the Food Trickle. Another good one to get early on is uh, Land Mana Party. Basically, every market technology you research will give you a free settler. Which, in the end, gives you about... What would that be? About seven to eight settlers. Well, actually, nine settlers, yeah. 9 to 10 settlers, which is quite good actually. Yeah, it's actually very powerful. Because it actually adds up to more than having two villager cards here, really. So, consider this to be like a discount on villager booming. Also, getting advanced torp is good to get early on, so you can quickly invest in allotments upon age 2. Also, this one here, the Norwin Logging, is also a very important card to get early since sawmills is really the best way to supply yourself with wood as the Swedes since it trickles so much of the wood and also drops wood, wood uh, crates around it that the villagers can pick up. Oh, it looks like Swedes are uh, fighting for a Cherokee Rifleman right now. You know, that could be pretty good since... Uh, a lot of his allotment armies, should he go with that, are going to be heavy infantry. So having one little skirmisher in there to support them is always a welcome sight. How about Germany? What's his game? So Frankfurt Trade Fair. This OP mess of a card. You know, as we know, they're removing this because giving somebody free market technologies from age one onwards is kind of insane. You're going to see that right now, him start to start clicking in on all of them. Hunting dogs, placer mines, um, gang saw, and then the ones in age 2. Steel traps, amalgamation, log flume, and then circular saw in age 3. And some point in between blunderbuss and great coat, so yeah. That's a lot of technologies. 
totally for free. You know, he does not have to macro, chop any wood, or do any mining to actually acquire these technologies. He just gets them sold for free, and then the villagers start gathering better right off the bat. That would combine with manor booming. That's a nasty situation to deal with, you know. Uh, sir, are you going to get a gang saw and placer mines? Yep, good, good. Take advantage of that, you know, you got it for free. So, start researching those things. It's nothing holding you back, literally nothing. But your own imagination, you know. Nothing at all. What is he aging up with? Um, the Statesman? So, this is going to give him some coin. It's going to give him an outpost wagon, here called a redoubt wagon. Which, you know, it's the same thing as the Governor General in Vanilla. Same concept. Same concept. How about Swedes? Uh, the Foreign King. This is an interesting choice. What the Foreign King does is he makes allotments cheaper. So this is looking like uh, Torps. A Barracks Torps is going to come up very early. And we are going to see spamming of Beveringer allotments. That definitely looks like the case here. He just needs one more shipment and then he'll be able to start sending advanced Torp. He is starting to build the market now to start utilizing his land mana party. When uh, Gang saw arrives, it will give him a free settler. And any subsequent market technologies like hunting dogs, placer mines will also give him a free settler. This is the way they catch up in villager population to Germany, actually. So, in a sense, this is the land mana party card is a good defense against Germany since it ensures your vill numbers will be somewhat better than average to deal with the civ that has vill numbers that are way above average you know every vill counts he is good oh so he is gonna go with Norwin logging first probably is a safety option you know he probably wants to make sure before we start spamming out allotments we actually have the ability to make more houses we need to support that since the allotment big buns do reinforce the rules of uh, population so they won't appear in the UI if you still don't have the population for them. Definitely have to make sure you consider that factor before again. Uh, the neat thing about the Torps though for Swedes is it acts as like a little mini house that I think has about 15 population so it does provide you a little bit of population off the bat to get your first batch of Beveringers out with. He's probably gonna, if he wants to be super duper greedy, what he can do is he can wait till he gets his uh, fourth shipment in and send an advanced Torp before he builds his Torp out, just to make sure he can start spamming those uh, wampments very early. But then you see Germany over here, they already have a barracks down. So, we don't know if this is a defensive barracks. Well, from... Yeah, he is going to train some units from it. So, we might see a little bit of attack from the Germany player. The good news for Fufi, though, is this was built defensively by the town center. This was not built center map around the mine here. If he did that, we would conceivably see much more of a deeper threat to his economy. We do see the Torps coming up, though, which is great, you know. He's definitely going to want that. Now, how much XP does he need to, um... He needs about 65 XP points to get the advanced Torp. Uh, yeah, looks like it. So now he has to... Yep, here comes advanced Torp. Once that arrives, I think we're going to see a lot of Beveringers start to pop out here. Definitely. Absolutely, we're going to see lots of them. In the meantime, though, he will add in some, uh, like, one volunteer to give himself a little bit of a defense with the Cherokee. But it is kind of clear here that uh, Germany, for the time being, has is committing more military up front now in the form of their skirmish units. So if uh, Fufi wants to survive this, he's going to have to think about getting those allotments of Beveringers out very quickly. What the good news is, though, is he has both sawmills. This one's almost done. This ensures he's going to have maximum wood economy to be able to keep affording those allotments. Since the allotments cost all three resources, not just one or two. 
So in terms of the wood department, I think uh, Foofy's going to be in great shape. Also, he's got steel traps now with the free settler on part of Land Mana Party, so his food's going to be looking real good as well. All you have to worry about then is just coin, right? Which he seems to be have his uh, gather point too right now on the TC. Is he going to move these over to mining conceivably, I think? Because coin is like the one resource he could probably use. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think that's a reasonable choice. Definitely, definitely. Um, let's see. Oh, another train post. Another train post went up. Yeah, it's Swedish. You get so much wood from the sawmills, it almost makes sense to go heavy on trading posts and native sites. It's totally possible we could see a lot of Zapotec and Mapuche natives in this match because of that. So yeah, definitely look out for that. Definitely look out for that. That's definitely something worth looking at. Yep, we see the, um, comes the volunteers. Yeah, when are we gonna, s well, right now he doesn't really have a love. I, yeah, I think when he ships in the food crates, he's gonna have enough to start making some allotments of Beveringers. But then again, he really hasn't really pushed deep into the base, so he doesn't know that his opponent is mostly doing skirmish units. I wonder, I, these uh, volunteers from Germany, though, are going to pose a risk to his uh, training post expansion over here. So he's going to have to think about that for sure. Will we get up in time, though? Let's see. Uh, that's a good... Nope, nope, he was way low on HP to survive that. Yep, not good. At least he had a bit of a warning so he could retreat with his rangers and his vol otherwise called volunteers, yeah. Now he can sort of go back over here and just wait and see, alright, what is his plan going to be next? Is he going to push all the way in or what? what's, what's happening? What's happening? Yeah, at this rate, I think um, we are... Probably gonna see a bit of a skirmish now. Swedes, what are you gonna do to deal with this? Are you gonna get your allotments up? Or you? Yeah, he's gonna go grenadiers instead. That's honestly probably the better play because if you are gonna put any heavy infantry on the field, at least have them be uh, grenadiers that can at least blow up this larger formation of units. Oh, he is. Here comes the allotment right here at Beveringers. Yeah. He's going to get a group of about... What is that about? How many of these? Twelve, yeah. Each allotment sends you about twelve of them. That is pretty good, you know. And if you can send that in a constant stream, that allows you to quickly overrun your enemy's uh, base with pop more population than he can defend against. Oh, that was not good. I just saw that. You kind of let the grenadiers just slip on in and get a free charge grenade throw. Yeah, that, that cost him quite a bit. He took quite a bit of casualties, and, you know, some of the guys are just barely hanging on to life as we know it. So, yeah, always make sure when you're dealing with an opponent that has grenadiers in their roster, you always pay attention to your army. If you let them get a free grenade throw in, that could actually cost you not only that skirmish, but, ten but potentially the match. Right, because if you were doing like a revolution, you were doing something that was very dependent on that army, that army would basically be wiped out by the grenade toss, since grenade tosses are indiscriminate. You know, they do not have any malice at all. They can even rip apart cavalry in proper numbers. So yeah, watch out for that. Now we're gonna see here if these grenadiers do something else, but now Germany is more prepared. They're watching their military now, so now they can avoid a serious grenade problem as long as they can dip back and forth here and avoid any serious... Oh, but we still see the grenade throws doing uh, a little bit... Yep, yep, oh, that was bad. Four units? Come on, man, that was painful. That was real painful. 
Oh, and then he's going to secure this spot with the readout. Very nice. That tower will definitely discourage any pushes in the future here. Germany will literally be forced to probably go up to age 3 and start getting artillery from their croup factories to deal with redoubts since they're so hard to take down with just infantry alone once they start being supported by armies of this size here. Yeah, definitely. Oh, so it looks like uh, Capital Age is coming soon for Swedish, yeah. I just saw the 700 coin come in. Yeah, it makes total sense at this point for Swedes to go to age 3 and consider again some Hus Troopes. Their, their uh, assault unit would be really good for them. And he's also getting some free food from his trade route that he got Stagecoach on. So economically, Swedes are looking really fine right now. You know, especially against a city like Germany, which is automatically a good eco civ in every matchup. It's pretty good, you know? Gives him a lot to work with. What is he going with? The, p the political exile? I think that one's going to give him a faster age up if I remember correctly. Uh, I'm just watching right now to see, um... Yeah, get off that, get off of that targeting of the manor here. You're going to want to retreat back to the tower, I think, conceivably. And if you can get a good grenade throw in, like that, Wonderful. Very good. Because a really nasty grenade throw like that can actually force your enemy to retreat, which gives you more time to build up. Oh, but then we see more allotments coming in. This is when the Beveringer allotments makes a huge difference. When you start to lose numbers, the Beveringer allotment can refill them very quickly, especially on the front line. Look at that! He landed them right on top of the Hussars. That was not good. That was not good for Germany at all. They did not need that in that moment, you know. Those Hussars were really trying to push and meet shield, and then the Beverages just stuffed their bayonets right into them. Next, he's gonna send a fort. If you can get that fort down around here, conceivably, Swedes would be in really good shape for central map control, and they would not have any direct threats to their center base for a long time, conceivably. Conceivably not. Oh, but then we have Germany already in age 3 themselves. We see skirmishers. So, Beveringers are not looking too nice right now, you know? These skirmishers are gonna... Get this fort wagon out of here if you know what's good for you. You know, you got a bit of a distraction going on here. Uh, sir? Your fort wagon? Get it out of here. Or do something with it, you know? You don't have much of a distract. Now he knows that that's there and he's going to start shooting at him. See? This is what happens when you idle too long with your fort wagon. What is he doing with it? Where is this going to go? He's going to... What are you doing? Don't put it over there. Put it in the back. Alright. Okay. No, this is not going to survive. See, he shipped the Ulans in from Poland. They're gonna just siege this thing down like that. That is just really poor replacement right there. You put it on the opposite side of where you wanted to put it. You wanted to put it in the back. And you might have just cost your whole forward offensive now because of that. Good going. Good going, buddy. You really, you really did good for yourself there. <laughs> yeah, that was not a good play from Swedish at all. You should have put the four in the back since it was obvious you were losing ground in your center map there. Very big no-no. You just wasted a ship and for like nothing. You could have sent like maybe one of these combat cards or maybe eco or even eight skirmishes, but no, you wasted it on a fort wagon that you got destroyed. Yeah, nice going. <laughs> Germany, on the other hand, uh, Germany is building up very well militarily. Like, very well, actually. He's even going to be sending in uh, Dresden Elberstadt. This will grant him two barracks, and it will also make the veteran upgrade for line infantry free. Does he also have the... Uh, no, he does not have the other one for stables, so he only has the barracks one. Alright, so at this point, we're probably going to see a lot of line infantry coming out of the Germans, because that uh, veteran tech is going to be free for him with Dresden already sent. And now we're going to see the German Fort Wagon coming down. 
I hope Germany knows how to manage their fort wagon. You know, it would be sad to see both players just throw a ship in like that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Germany knows how to use a fort. He's probably going to put it in the center map here since he does have a dominant military right now. These u ones are really going to be good at killing any skirmishers that they make because of their high attack. The Hussars are going to be a bit of a uh, support for the u ones because they have a bit more HP to keep the mass alive. And then obviously you got all these skirmishers that are going to be doing some heavy work over here. Veteran Beveringers, no match for the skirmishers. The shock units are going to shock the villagers a lot when they're getting destroyed by them. Yep, very shocking. Oh wow, look at the map. Um, if you can get that redoubt up, great, because he did send advanced fortifications, so these actually are H4 towers, basically, that shoot cannonballs. So yeah, th this is the one thing that's probably going to keep the Swedish alive right now. You know, if it wasn't for advanced fortifications being an age um, free card for Swedish, they probably would have been dead by now, but having all these big nasty towers here, blowing them up with splash attacks, this is going to help Swedish survive just barely. You know, it affords them, it gives them the time they need to actually turtle in their town center, long enough for the military units to be wiped out. It looks like uh, Sabero's going to hang around though and try to siege um, stuff if he can you know, do some sort of damage. I don't know if you should stay here or you should try to retreat at this point because the longer you stay in this base, these cannonballs are going to eat your army alive and then you're going to be back to square one again, dealing with the Swedish army again. Because if you retreat right now, got some mortars in age 4 or maybe some uh, foot artillery in age 3, maybe you could push from the exterior of the base and slowly siege your way in. Because you gotta consider it this way. The construction of redoubts with the advanced upgrades on them was an act of desperation to save his tail, you know, because you had him right where you want him. This tower spam is the only measure he had of keeping you out of his base. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, take these skirmishers, take them back to the fort in the Sarah map, and just save them for a rainy day. And I'm sure it's going to be raining real soon, so, you know, I think you're going to be in good shape. We do see, uh, Essen style work coming out. This will grant him a free, uh, croup wagon. And he will be able to, uh, build steel guns from that croup, croup factory should he want to. It's obviously a much slower rate than the other cannons, but should you be able to get it up? Oh yeah, those steel guns in H3 definitely have a big advantage, should they actually get the spawn. This is kind of interesting, we saw a tower placed on top of the German hunts. Wow, that was not cool at all. I think you can handle this one though, since it's an isolated tower. You also got Cuirassiers working on the infantry. Look at that splash attack, that's brutal, look at that two splash. Decimates the whole army. <laughs> that is insane. Look at that. He only lost one unit. You know, I think after watching the Liga, people, um, the devs watching the Liga so many times, they actually decided to make Curacaos a one splash unit instead of two splash, mainly because of this. The Curacaos just get way too good of fights usually for it to be justifiable, you know. It's kind of broken when you can take like five assault units and wipe out a whole army of infantry without any losses. You know, there has to be some sort of fairness involved in that. Because even other assault units like the honor guards and the sculptors of the other cultures cannot do that, so... I kind of get why in the uh, Great War patch these Curacaos are going to only have one splash. He'll put them on in the same place as like Samurai and uh, Machetros, making it a little bit more fair and even to deal with. Just thought I'd throw that out there because I don't think I mentioned that at all in any of my uh, preview videos. The Corsairs are being nerfed down to a one splash assault unit instead of two. Making them a little bit more fair to deal with, you know. Not as broken anymore. 
but one thing that's not going to be nerfed is uh, Zapotex. Yeah, Zapotex with their epic 36 seeds taking down trading posts. That must not be good if you're Swedish. You know, you really are depending on those supply lines of uh, crates coming from the uh, trade route. So, if you're Swedish right now, you're probably very worried about losing that additional resource. At the same time, it looks like Swedes are actually about 100 points in score ahead of the Germans, which... that You never see that. You never see any Civ get a score higher than the Germans. The Germans usually always have the better score. So, in some ways, I feel like Swedes are definitely well prepared to fight this out. You know, he's got an army of grenadiers here, which would discourage an infantry push. He is getting the Hussa Troopes as well. These are basically the sweetest form of Cursairs. They already have like the one splash active, so they've already been nerfed down to that level. Veteran Grenadier is great. He's also going to be sending renovations. Renovations will make his buildings have more HP than normal. So these towers are going to be even harder to take down. So yeah, definitely if you're the invading party here, you're not going to want to deal with uh, redoubts that have extra HP attached to them. These uh, veteran Hus troopers, though, these are going to be pretty good. And remember, with uh, this card here, Kalmas Varja, basically you can add a multiplier of heavy infantry to these, making them a hybrid between an Escolta and a Curacao, which is kind of insane, actually, when you think about it. Because it really has the attributes of two different assault units in one, making them technically better than even even uh, these units when the Great War patch comes out. Definitely, um, cavalry combat. These are going to gain more attack and HP from that. Very important that you keep your assault units nice and tanky so they can get the most value. Oh, and then we see advanced paddock. Here's the paddock right here. This paddock heals cavalry units, and once this arrives, he's going to start spamming allotments of Hus Troupe from it. So it's basically the same as the one for the Bevringers, but it sends these instead. They allow him to spam out a lot of assault units in a very short amount of time. It's very powerful when you save it for the right moment. You know, because you could have like. 50 Hus troop base at some point, that would totally decimate a lot of these units you see here pretty easily. Because really the only anti cab you see on the field right now is the natives. You know, the Zapotex and the uh, Mapuche Ironwoods coming over here. Also, we see the observatory coming up. This is a annex of the town center. For those that don't know, the Torps is an annex of the barracks, meaning that it's an attachment of the barracks. You, basically, your barracks constructs this building right next to it. Same thing with the paddock, and then the observatory would be the annex for the TC. It has a good line of sight, so as you see right here, the observatory can see quite far away in this direction. It also has the Portuguese explorer ability of revealing a certain circle on the map, you know. That's included with the observatory. So it's a pretty good thing to invest in. Uh, Lutheran religion. Give them about two priests. I don't know. I don't usually go with Lutheran that much. You know. Well, I used to use Lutheran a lot in the old days when they used to be really good at training units quicker. Yeah, used to be pretty good back in those days, but. I haven't used religion a lot lately since a lot of the religions have been dumbed down quite a bit, I think. In my opinion. Fortunately, in Great War Pets, there will be no religion, so everybody's going to be secular whether they want to or not. How about Germany? Like, what's Germany doing? Germany could actually go to industrial age, like, right now if they want to. I see the 2k food and the one... They have way than enough coin. So, Germany, instead of going for foot artillery to start with, is taking the greedy option of setting his croup factories to the steel guns using the Essen Stylework card. So, 
he would rather wait for really, really long amounts of time to get these steel guns going now. So by the time he hits industrial age, he's going to have about two steel guns ready to go. Yeah. I mean... Well, another thing to consider, too, is, is if you send one of these factories, the uh, training improvement for heavy cannons like the steel gun will affect the crew factories as well. So once you hit industrial age, the option of making steel guns from your crew factories becomes more delectable, I would say, because the uh, train rate is a lot quicker, goes up quite a bit. Spando Arsenal will let him basically have it access. It's Spando is basically the same as Advanced Arsenal, except it makes the Arsenal technologies half the price instead of it uh, at the cost of it being available an age later than normal. So you probably see the counter infantry rifling coming out once that arrives, as well as probably the gunpowder unit technologies for the skirms. Definitely very possible. And if that wasn't enough, the Spando also gives you an arsenal wagon too. I think that effect was removed from the uh, Great War patch because, you know, if you're going to have all these neat little effects from a card, you really don't need to give them a wagon to build the building with as well. That's kind of overkill, I think. And I guess the devs agreed with that, so they removed it from it. So what is he getting now? Guard Skirmishers and Guard Decor Curissaires. Yeah, that's the special little secondary RG upgrade the Germans got. So basically these assault units are going to gain about 40% HP in attack. Oh, Hus Troop A is doing a bit of raiding here. Yeah, I just saw that. He got one kill, surprisingly. Now, will this uh, Hus Troop A get out alive, though? No, not if you're doing that. You just <laughs> you just bounced into him. Said, oh, stab me, kill me, kill me, kill me. Uh... Any steel guns out yet, by any chance? Um, no, not yet. I mean, this this is how slow the queue is for steel guns before you send that um, factory-based heavy artillery training technology out. Takes quite some time to get these. You know, hopefully they get out by the time you go to some go to conflict. And also, you gotta consider the fact that um. They cost about seven population, is that right? Yeah, seven population. So you gotta make sure you have the housing room for them too. Because if you don't, then it just starts the clock all over again. And you have to wait for another queue of them to get that one. I'm just... Yeah, oh, so he did get one... He got two steel guns already. That's great. And then he's probably... If he get at least... What is it? One more... He could get two more, yeah, and then he could ship um, this card here to get a fifth steel gun, and then he should be ready to push at that point. Should definitely be ready to push. At the same time, the Swedes, what are the Swedes doing? They're mostly focusing on getting upgrade cards, it looks like. We see... Wait a minute, did he already send this a while ago? I thought he got this a while ago. I guess not, um... Calvary combat. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. Maybe he had to uh, send. Yeah, he sent the coin probably, I can imagine. Yeah. They're going to be going to Industrial Age soon because if they don't, they're going to be in pretty big trouble, I would say. They definitely need those uh, stats improvements on the Hus Troop Base to be able to keep up. Because. And also, you're, you're going to want to get this too before any combat occurs, just so you're dealing the proper multiplier damage against the natives so you can get to the skirmishers and the steel guns in time. The engineer, this will grant him some foot artilleries, which in this matchup here is going to be pretty helpful against the skirms as well as the natives over here. And you could easily upgrade him to field guns as well because you've already got the foundry constructed over here. 
More houses, yeah, good idea. So you can get some more allotments if you need them. You can train out the rest of your... How many settlers does he have? 54. 54 settlers on the field. How about Cerbero over here? How many does he have? 78. So he's, uh, he's just about at his vill... His, um... Villager pop cap, really. Yeah, he's basically built them out to their build limit. And mathematically, you also have to consider... A croup factory is also considered about five settlers. Five villagers in one. That's why they cost five population to build these, because they do five villagers worth of work to put out these cannons. And that's why you notice that the... Uh, German build limit for settlers is so small of only 79 to account for each possible croup factory you can build from age 3 all the way to age 5, which in this version is about 4. In Great War Patch it'll be about 3, so you'll actually see the settler build limit increase by 5 to accommodate that. Yep, here comes the, um... Stuttgart Manufacturing. This will give him a factory wagon and a steel gun, too. Quite good. Quite good, indeed. At this rate, you got such good control of the trade routes that, um, getting the trains going on those trade routes is a pretty easy choice, I think, at this point. Definitely. Absolutely. Yep, here come the steel guns. Right. Popping off the towers. These towers got a lot of HP from the renovations though, so it's gonna take a bit of time probably to start doing that. And of course the Swedes are gonna be reactive to that change and they're gonna try to think of a way of dealing with that. Oh, he's got Nordenfelts coming out of his steel mill here, so that's gonna be kind of an interesting situation to see. Oh, and then we see mortars working on the fort over here. Yeah, he's gonna be careful with that though, because he knows he could easily drum down these Corsairs onto these mortars in an emergency. So it's gonna be interesting to see who sieges who down first, because if he could siege the fort down, that would conceivably give Swedes a bit of time to go for a push up here. But we'll see, we'll see for sure. When does this Nornfeld arrive though? Because the Nornfeld could actually be a pretty big game changer here. Nornfelds, for those who don't know, are basically rapid fire machine guns similar to the organ gun for the Portuguese. But instead of anti infantry multipliers, they actually have anti cavalry multipliers. They're one of the only anti cavalry artillery pieces in the game so far. And basically, if you can get enough of them, they would be able to spray down this army of Guard du Corps pretty easily. So you gotta keep that in mind. If you can get at least one Norn felt out in time, I think that'll benefit him really well. Assuming the steel guns don't target it down, though. That's the other thing you gotta be careful of. But then you get your, uh... You know? Yeah, get into a fight now, so maybe your Norn felt can arrive in time. Uh, yeah, um, I don't know what's... So now we're going to see some combat here. Guard Hus Truppe take on the Guard du Corps. They try to claw their way into the steel guns in the back, but it's getting kind of hard with snaring. Uh, will that work? Uh, no. Oh, no, no, that's bad. That's very bad. You, you didn't have enough population to even get one Nordfeld yet, so you're not going to have that advantage. Can these Hus Truppes do their job? You didn't get the heavy infantry multiplier that I talked about, so you're going to be suffering a little bit more losses than you could have if you got that, you know? Yeah, you sh definitely should get that um, next time. But it looks like you are going to make it through the natives. Now you just move on to the skirmishers next. Yeah, just push on to the skirmishers now. Yeah, clean up that one uh, guard de corps, and then you should be able to go on to the guard skirmishers and the steel guns in the middle. Definitely. And that, yep, now just start attacking the steel guns. Steel guns are your biggest threat right now. Then the skirmishers would be the next thing to target. Yeah, and how are your resources looking? Do you have a lot of resources? You have plenty of food, so if you do have to trade from the market a little bit, I guess you could. Luckily, you got some mortars over here to work on the fort. 
gradually claw this fort down so that way you can actually go for a proper assault without too much ranged attacks from the buildings. Yep, now he's getting the uh, Comus Varha. This will give him the necessary anti-heavy infantry multipliers on his Hus troop base to actually deal with the natives a lot better. And I think they will, the card will arrive and he's going to try to retreat and let the card arrive because once that multiplier is locked in he should be able to clean through these natives pretty easily. He also has enough pop to get the Nornfelds too now so that's going to be another factor for Germany to worry about. Yep there's the first one. See, see this is the uh, multiplier right here about 1.5 against heavy infantry so he, he will deal some extra damage against these natives, these hand units. Let's see how that multiplier works in real time. So yeah, you see that they're getting cut through a little bit easier now, you know. It's not a big, big, big difference, but just enough to deal enough damage with each splash attack to cut their way through this native bunch a lot easier. Oh! Take this Norgfeld and you need to make sure you're targeting him onto the guard de corps at all times. Yeah, yep, definitely. Yep. Do that. You should be good to go. The other cool thing about the Nornfelts is they actually have 60% hand armor. So they're actually really impervious to any sort of melee attack from the guard de corps, which is great. You actually are better off targeting them with skirmisher cannons usually. Now, this is the worst thing you can do. Why are you going into melee with them? Why are you doing that? You would have taken it out a couple of seconds earlier just by shooting them from range. Because they don't have any pierce on them. Only, only hack on them. That was not a good idea for you, Germany. Not a good idea at all. But, you know, looking at the resources and the score, I think it's safe to say Germany has won this. You know, I mean, Swedes are definitely struggling in the coin department. They're t about 200 points behind in score. They don't really have a lot of military left on the field, so it's safe to say that uh, Germany has survived this. You know, and they played this very effectively. They stopped the initial push. They took center map control themselves. And then, even with the destruction of their fort at the hands of the mortars, they turned it around into a instant kill of his enemy. Yeah, very good. Very good, you know. It was getting a bit worrisome there. I thought uh, for sure Swedes were going to do some sort of push to kill you in the end. And cut you, cut up your economy, but you came through with your guard de corps and your natives and your skirmishers. So, good plays, good plays overall. You know, we don't always think of skirmishers as being a strong unit for Germany, but remember, they do actually get a card that gives them some uh, decent multipliers for them. So, yeah, sometimes skirmishers with Germany is, you know, a pretty good option. What cards did he send out, by the way? Did he have any? Yeah, so he even had long-range combat, which benefits skirmishers attacking HP. So he was definitely concerned that is an option here. And boy, was it a good option, you know. Let's look at the post game real quick. Uh, nine, tw yep, good resources, a lot more resources. Uh, military just had a little bit more, and therefore some more kills than he did. Because of that epic economy protecting that. Yeah, yep, it seemed like Germany was actually ahead for basically the whole match, just about conceivably. Yeah, seems like it in terms of unit count, unit count across the board. Yeah, good match, both of you. That was really a, really a nice one to see, you know. Definitely like that one. So now we're going to load up the next one now. Yep, we're going to load in this one now. Alright, let's go. <laughs> All right, let's go to um, recorded games. We're gonna see match two now of Sabero versus Fufi. Telling from the first match, the next one should be pretty pretty even, I would say, between the two. 
So what is Foofy doing? He's Foofy is doing the hards. Yeah, he's doing the hards today. Very good pick, a very aggressive sieve. And I think after seeing his fatality in the first match, he's probably thinking, um, why don't we use a quick and easy kill sieve like the hards that we can easily take a basically abuse town destroyer with and just siege everything. Yeah, that car is insane. I, I bet we're going to see that today from him, you know. That's the way he's going to claw this back into Jebel Musa. Uh, right, so now we see Chinese on Sabero's side. He does actually play the Chinese Civ quite a bit, so he's pretty familiar with them. I like China, you know, I like the Chinese Civ. They're one of my favorite Civs in DE. Last week, you remember I, um, tried the new Porcelain Tower build order? We're starting with the Porcelain Tower and then going for the French consulate instead of the um, Russian one. Works pretty good actually, you know. I gotta say, I see some potential there because you basically use the resource crate technologies from the French consulate to facilitate an easy fast fortress and get easy shipments in, so yeah. I definitely think that might be the future for China in competitive DE play, but as far as um, Wars of Liberty play, China's got some cool units. You know, they got the Kanzu Braves, which, um, as you know, they have the ranged attack of a skirmisher, but the melee attack of a wine infantry or a musketeer with the bayonet, so they counter just about everything except artillery. Does he use those at all? I'm curious. Uh, does he use Kanzus? I always use them, you know, I always use them. Both for fun purposes and I also like how efficient they are. I'm curious what deck you're going with. So he's going to actually just ship in some wood it looks like. That's totally fine, you know. The thing is, is with every age up, with China and Moore's Liberty, each village and town center will produce a free villager. So if he wants to ship in this wood now to make some more villages, that would actually behoove him really well because that would be a bit of a vill boom for him. Like almost like a semi manor boom for him. Not quite as strong as the manor boom, but almost like one. Because right now he would be getting about two villagers, one from the village, one from the TC. If he can build up maybe two more villages, he'll get about four free villagers. Which, you know, is a lot better. Because not only do you get free villagers, of course you're going to have the population you need to start pushing out early without getting housed at all. Like, literally at all. And that's where I think the Hods come in. The Hods, with their... Wait a second. So it looks like Foofy is playing fair today. He's not going to be cheeky at all. I don't see Town Destroyer here. Uh, what I was going to say is I would imagine Foofy to go with Town Destroyer with his, ex with his war chief and start sieging down these villages. Basically putting China into a serious vice. But looks like he's going to play more fairly, it looks like. And I wonder how he's going to be able to pull this off without Town Destroyer. Because to me at least, I feel like China has the more numerous and better army in larger numbers, but... Maybe the Hods have something up their sleeve with forest prowess and light cannons. We'll see for sure today, you know? We'll see what they got for us. We'll see for sure. Yeah, we see the uh, Disciple scouting out the area. With these poor bears chasing them right behind them. Yeah, I'm just looking around, seeing, uh, what's, uh, well, he's, the messenger, yeah, the messenger. This is going to basically give him a quick age up. Conceivably, he's going to put some war huts on the center map here, and he's going to start pushing on China, like, right away. Because, obviously, with China in particular, there's kind of a window when you can rush them real early, and they don't know what to do. How, how far is he from age, reaching age two? He's actually about still has halfway to go because he's only got about two vills working here. See, when I play China D, I have three to four villagers building the wonder. 
because I know it's better to uh, sacrifice a bit of eco early on just to make sure you're in age 2 when you can start shipping in some units in an emergency, right? Because if you add the hogs going super duper tomahawk on you, you're going to need to ship in a Chukonu to deal with that or else you're basically dead. You know, it doesn't matter that you lost maybe one villager, a couple of villager seconds, you just have to do it, whether you like it or not. He is going with the Summer Palace, though. This is like gold standard, you know. Except for that porcelain uh, tower build in DE, I think Summer Palace is always the way to go, I think. Free units, why not take it, you know. It's that the Standard Army, the Han Army, whatever army you like. <laughs> I'm guessing he's going to... Oh, yep, he's going to stick it to the Han Army, the old Han Army. This one trains the quickest, I think. So this will grant him an easy group of um, pikemen as well as uh, archers in the form of the two Konu and the Tigerman. And on the other side here with Fufi, we see... Um, we don't see any military yet, which is making me think a little bit that this is going to be a fast industrial build. Yeah, this might be an FI. We might be seeing an FI right now. And that would make a lot of sense, because if you go with an FI with HUDs, you can get your um, light cannon shipping and start really pushing in hard. Also, you can use the old ways card to make your big buns really cheap which all of them inevitably give you crates so then you can just spam a bunch of tomahawks with light cans and mantlets to basically push on them super duper hard really yeah definitely yep kill that disciple right there Yep, and uh, yep, we do see the fast capital with the warrior. The warrior will grant him some mantlets that he can use to defend the base a bit with, as well as a travois to build another military building, ideally a siege workshop, so that he can start making light cans right away upon age four. But what's China's plans going to be? Are they going to attack right away? Right now, I think he's just skidding along from the armies he's getting from the Summer Palace. Don't really see much trained units yet. Yeah, and it's going to be a question to see if he's going to go for an immediate push in age 2, or is he going to hold back and wait till age 3 to send in some Kang Zoos or some Boxers? Or even these Kanzu Braves, yeah. The Kanzu Braves are pretty tough. Pretty tough cookie. I mean, at this moment... Looks like he's going to commit to age 2, because I do see him shipping in the Nian Riders. Just as a heads up for anyone that doesn't know Wars of Liberty China, the Nian Riders are a bit different than the Step Riders in DE. The Step Riders in DE are closer to a Sawar or a Nagi, where they have a multiplier that's only good against skirmishers and, ar and archers. But for the Nian Riders, they actually have a full anti-infantry multiplier similar to the Spanish Lancer. It's not that big, it's like only about 1.25, but it damages all infantry equally. Instead of just um, one particular class. Making Nian Riders a bit more balanced against heavy infantry units than they would be in uh, DE as the Step Riders. China going for a trading post down here. They're gonna, they already took this one over here, but Hods took the one on the top. Definitely a big conflict for the center trade route since those trading posts could make or break you, really. Ah, so China went with the German consulate. Nice. This will. They're going to be researching this technology. This will grant them a food trickle. They could also get a wood and a coin trickle as the German consulate allies. 
pretty powerful stuff. And also, German consul allies make uh, banner armies cheaper in their food costs. Which inevitably leads to more spamming. So we see treasure guardian bears and mantlets. A combination you rarely ever see. That's a lot of bears. How much HP do these have? They almost have about 400 HP. These bears can conceivably kill the Nian Riders without much of a fight. It's kind of scary to think about. Treasure Guardians beating normal units. Yeah, and they even got a siege attack too. Yeah, they're, they're actually sieging the trading post. They're clawing them with their little bear claws. Yeah. Never thought you'd see the day that Treasure Guardian Polar Bears are the new Hod's meta. What is Foofy doing, by the way? Is he gonna... Ah, so he got free wood chopping technologies. That's pretty good. You know, I just saw that. He just picked up, um, this one right here. Hadanansi Woodworking. It basically gives you all the wood chopping techs for free. So you can keep up with spamming units. It looks like Foofy's gonna go for a full mantlet rush. This could be pretty interesting. They have a lot of HP. They got, like, 50% pierce armor, and they got about 50 siege. Unless he can build up a large number of Nien Riders, I think that the Mandlets are a decent option here. Also, considering the fact that China is not really training their own units right now, they're just sort of skidding off of what the Summer Palace has given them in the form of Tigerman and Chukonu. This is probably the worst army you want to go in against these Mandlets, besides maybe the um, Yellow Army since they don't have, these aren't artillery units, these are simply just siege units and infantry, siege troopers. Yeah, the Mandlets are going to have a pretty easy time pushing in here, I think. I mean, these Chukanus are probably not going to do a lot of damage to them, I would imagine. Oh, almost, he almost sacks down that villager. Almost. Yeah, he's going to have to bring these home, though. He's not going to be able to do any more raiding stuff. He's going to have to bring these home. Because the Nian Riders are the only thing that has a multiplier that can actually deal with these Mandlets. The only unit. And even then, you see the Mandlets doing really well here because the Chinese units just have such low HP. Being almost like trash units. So yeah, even these Mandlets with their pretty average range attack can actually do a lot of damage to these Chinese units. Which is kind of funny because, you know, in Arena, people always tell me, don't do the mantlets, they're bad, don't do mantlets. But here we see the mantlets actually being the main unit of choice. And Germany forced to make some Yuans, Shabaka Yuans, from the German consulate just to deal with these. You know, they have about 40 attack at this point, and they're going to have even more. They're going to go up to... Yeah, they should be going up in attack, I think. And they, yeah, they should have more attack at this point to deal with these mantlets. Combined with the Nian Riders, he should be able to clean up these mantlets. Hopefully pretty easily for him. Otherwise, this could be a real... Wait a second. Oh, yeah, because mantlets and... U because uh, Nians and Yulons naturally have low HP. It's actually possible for... Um, you know, these mantlets... Is, yeah, they survived it. Yeah, they actually beat the cavalry units. Think of that. Think of that. Hand cavalry units getting dominated by mantlets. You don't see that every day. But only with China because their stuff has such low HP and attack. You know, if it was any other civ, like maybe Germany with their Hussars or something, you wouldn't be seeing this. You wouldn't be seeing this at all. We actually see the Summer Palace being changed over to the Green Standard Army. And... The reason for that is this will grant him access to Meteor Hammers as well as these um, Banner Cavalry. Giving him a pretty strong maneuver unit as well as a good uh, anti-artillery unit. And the thing that's going to give the Meteor Hammers a bit of an advantage here is the fact that they can dish out melee damage against these Mantlets at range. Right, they don't have to go right up against them. They can just sit in the back next to their matchlock shooting banner cavalry and start whacking these uh, mantlets with their big hammers. I mean, they're doing a little bit better. I mean, they took one out. 
But I just don't see this Chinese roster doing anything. Yeah, I mean, even the Meteor Hammers again hammered themselves. Think of that, a Meteor Hammer again hammered. Yeah, oh, they took that one out. That one got taken out. Is that? I don't think that one's going down, though. Yeah, as long as he shoots at. Oh, yep, the TC took that one out, I think, with the skirmishers. Uh, this, this is pretty painful if you're China. You're trying to get this stuff out of your base, but you're really getting sieged apart by mantlets. And nothing else, just mantlets. Mantlets, mantlets. That's a lot of mantlets. Way too many mantlets. Way too many mantlets. Maybe the people in Arena should really reconsider Mantlets, you know? If they can do this type of stuff here, you know, why can't we use them in Arena? You know what I mean? Maybe when we do another game in Arena for Tad, maybe I should uh, consider using the Hod's Mantlets, or the Iroquois Mantlets, as, it's, as the Sibs called over there. And now he's getting conservative tactics. This will actually buff up the HP and attack of the Mantlets even further. And he also has these two cards to send. These will also buff up the stats. So, yeah, we're going to see a lot more um, coming out. Actually, wait a second. Even these cards benefit the Mantlets since they have the infantry tag. Yeah, that's kind of unreal, right? They get like two sets of combat Almost like two or three sets of combat cards. So by the end of it, the Mantlets are just really, really hard to deal with, you know? They just get so many stats, it's not even funny. And you're saying that Mantlets aren't good in Arena. I think they might actually be pretty good, you know? They technically get even more upgrades than the Huron ones do for the French. So yeah, definitely consider getting them. Yeah, let's look at this. The Mantlets are just meet you on their way through all this uh, stuff here. Absolutely unreal. Absolutely unreal. This is just... Un unconceivable. Look at, look at these mantlets just sieging their way through like that. Yeah. Like like nothing. And there's really nothing China could do. They made their cavalry units. They made their infantry units. They made just about every unit in their roster. And it could not clean these mantlets up. What's up with that? You know what's the one thing he probably could use, but he can't... Can he afford it? Yeah, he can't... Uh, wait a second. Yeah, the one thing you can make China that would deal with this is flamethrowers. But you don't have... Does he have a mound castle at all? Does he have a mound castle? See, here's what you need to do, China. You need to build a mound castle anywhere on the map. Make, like, five, ten flamethrowers. And this army would get roasted and destroyed. This is the one time you need flamethrowers, and we don't see that. Boy, would it be great if you had flamethrowers. You know, you really need flamethrowers for this type of a matchup. Seriously, you do need flamethrowers for this. You do need flamethrowers. Without a doubt, you need flamethrowers for this. There's no other way, really. You just need flamethrowers. That's all I can tell you, you need flamethrowers really no other way you're going to deal with this. You need flamethrowers. Get the flamethrowers and I think you'll be in good shape. I mean, you got like one long dragon. I mean, that's doing something, I guess. But, um... At least it's a free unit. Uh, yeah, not even that. That's not even really doing a lot to these mantlets. It, like, barely even poked it. <laughs> barely even did a scratch to it. Yeah, I mean, what's the next step for Foofy? Is he going to just go up to Industrial Age and get the guard level mantlets? Yeah, that, that would be scary to think about at this point, because even these veteran level mantlets just sieging everything down. Mantlet Wars are winning. Mantlet Wars are winning. And on top of that, he could technically even build the onto these Huron sites and make the native mantlets too from the Wendats. Yeah, the Wendat mantlets.
Yep, here comes the mail months coming down. Yep, working their way south here. But I don't think these boxes are going to be able to deal with them. They might be because they're hand yet, but I doubt it. Yep, here comes the boxers trying to deal with them in melee, and then they have to retreat because they know, yeah, we're not going to last. I don't know why he went back and forth, though. He should have just committed all in if he was going to do that. Okay, so the boxers can't even really take out one manlet. That is kind of worrisome, yeah. They just barely took down one manlet. And at this point, China's like, you know what, I'm gonna make my own mantlets. I'm gonna make my Wendad mantlets. Mantlet on mantlet action. The war of the mantlets. The war of the big planks of whatever makes those shields against each other. He also made the Kanzu Braves, which, you know, that's a pretty strong unit. I just don't think they're gonna be strong in this situation. I mean, if you can cut through these mantlets with something and keep these guys alive, these Kanzus are definitely a great uh, unit for you. So, give you a lot of value. Yeah, but there's the thing, you just don't have any flamethrowers. You need flamethrowers. It's the only unit that could actually win you this match is flamethrowers, and you're not making them. Because it has a crush attack, it has anti-infantry multipliers, and it fires at a rapid rate. Just enough to spray their way through these manlets, which don't have a hand at that don't normally use their hand attack. So yeah, you need to use the flamethrowers for this. And do we, yeah, we do not see a castle anywhere to make those, so. Yeah, that's gonna be a serious issue for you. You need flamethrowers to deal with mantlets in this large scale. There's really no other option. You need flamethrowers. You could say it like a million times. Of course he's not gonna hear me because this match already happened, but if I was there next to him like his his uh, coach or something, I'd say, man, get a castle up and make some flamethrowers. At the same time, we do see additional upgrades coming in to benefit the um, Mantlets. Since this does have the infantry tag, this will actually gain HP from this infantry hit points card. Which, it, look at the HP now. It's about... How much stats is that? That's like... Does it show the HP or... Yeah, I mean, we'll see it go up, actually, once that card arrives. For sure. Um. Yep, see, now it's 928 hit points. That's almost like 1k HP on these things. That is just unconceivable to deal with now. Yeah, it is. Like, what do you do against that? <laughs> because, you know, 70 seeds now with... a and he doesn't even have all the possible upgrade cards on him yet. And he hasn't even gone into any later ages yet. That is just not good for you, you know? That's just painful to think about, you know? What do you do? What do you do against that? Yep, and then the Mamlets are going to come down here. Clean up these villies. This town center stands no chance at all against 70 Siege. What? You need flamethrowers. You need flamethrowers. Get some flamethrowers. Start flaming. Flaming hard. Start broiling these mantlets. Or else, you're not gonna make it. If Phil's just running away, how many resources does he have? Yeah, he could build a mound castle right now, somewhere over here, and start spamming flamethrowers. Flamethrowers. Just ship this in and see how good it is, and then you'll make flamethrowers. Make it from... ship it to one of these villages over here. That's all you have to do, man. If you made some flamethrowers, you would actually be able to win this match and make it an easy 2-0 victory for the encounter. But, because you're not building flamethrowers, you're not gonna... you're gonna probably have to see the fateful sands of Jebel Musa to decide your fate, you know? Fate will be decided in Jebel Musa if 
this is the best you can do right now. Yeah, I don't think you got what it takes right now because he's he's spending he's showing his coin into these cavalry units that he knows can't do the job. Because he doesn't know the flamethrowers is the play here. He needs about like 20, 30, 50 flamethrowers to just rip apart these mantlets and then run them right into the base. With maybe some uh, hand mortars right behind them. That would be the way to go. You need lots and lots and lots of flamethrowers for this. It's the only unit that counters this at all. Is flamethrowers. And you're going to need a lot of them too. Which I'm, I don't think you can afford a lot of them. Yeah, I mean, this is a shoo-in for the Hods, because they knew what unit to make. He figured, yeah, if we spam mantlets, we should be able to siege his trash units. Which is 100% true, as you see here. But then you don't consider the flamethrowers. But luckily for you, your opponent doesn't know to use flamethrowers, so they just fell for the bait perfectly, like the way you envisioned it. Exactly the way you wanted to. Yep, that war academy is going down. He's barely holding on on resources. Yeah, these uh, late game uh, Chinese cavalry units just can't deal with mantlets and numbers like that. You just get axed down by all those tossed tomahawks. Well, that's a GG, I think. You know, unless we're missing something here. GGG, GGG, GGG. What are you even doing, man? What is this? <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? More, more mantlets? I mean, all right, it's probably the second best thing you can make, but still, why are you putting the town center in the same spot you just yeah. lost it in before, almost? Dude, oh my, yeah. GG, you know. Foofy did a great job, you know. I I admire the fact that he did this with just mantlets. It's like he was performing some sort of secret challenge. Some hidden ending here by going with just mantlets, you know. He definitely did the most perfect cheese against the Chinese, I think. And China fell for it too, so that's on them, you know. That's on you, Sabero, for falling for that, not making flamethrowers, I guess. Yeah, look at the kills there. The siege, 17 buildings, 124 units. Doesn't matter that you have more units, or you even making these lead meter hammers. They just don't know how to deal with mantlets because of their high HP. You have to use flamethrowers. That's your best option is flamethrowers. Say it with me, people. If I face hards as Chinese, I'm going to make flamethrowers. If I don't, then I am lost forever in the void. I am lost forever in the void if I do not make those, um, yeah, exactly. You must make flamethrowers It's China against hearts. Say that every night when you go to bed, you know? If you don't, bad things will happen. Well, anyways, uh, we're on to match three now in Jebel Musa. This should be a pretty fun one, you know? Match one and two were really good from these opponents, and I think, uh, match three might even be more in more enticing so let's see what they got you know uh, just making sure we're all good in here okay let's go so Barrow versus Foofy match three let's go let's go 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 let's go 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 all right so Maori yeah Foofy likes Maori you know he's He's a Maori enthusiast, you know. I like Maori too. Maori is a very unique Civ since they're the only member of their culture in the game. Who knows if we'll ever get any additional Polynesian Civs, but at least we know we got Maori to enjoy. He, Spore's gonna stab the little snake here to death and not get poisoned with venom, hopefully. Because that would be fatal. Yeah, he's gonna get 80 food. Very nice. You know, the more food you get early on as Maori, the sooner you can perform your voyage and maybe even get some of the bigger voyages. You get more benefits. As for Sabero, he is using the Glen Colombians. Glen Colombia. I like Colombia. Good sieve. 
You know, they got a lot of fun units to play with. You know, their Granado de Ataki, their Rampilenas, their Canal Police, as well as their Independistas. Definitely very fun civ, you know. They're actually not even that OP either. Like, you'd have to deal with Haiti with their OP immigrant rushes. Colombia doesn't have that, you know. They just, um, fight better in the mid game when they get their presidential palace and they can start making their special units. And they can really start to invest in more upgrades for their machetros. You know, because they're sort of like a machetro in special unit civ. And their Voltageos are, and Yaneros do have a lot of value as well, so gotta keep that in mind. Yeah, I'm definitely excited to try to play Grand Columbia against people in the Great War Pass. Like, hopefully I can play against the Juanita Boliviana using them when we do our testing. To see how they do with that German immigrant colony available to them. Because I can see a lot of potential with that, of them being able to get a decent fast fortress time and maybe making some of their neat units earlier. That's definitely for sure. Uh, but today Swan is muy guapas. Today Swan is muy guapas coming in. In terms of the rest of the deck, we see Presidential Palace, we see a favorability of Canal Police, and also Granado de Turquí. It has a pretty decent amount of unit shipments here. He does have um, this that lets him make the Schwar natives, that are basically blow gunners that counter cavalry units and shock units. All the necessary. He had this is the charged attack for the Yaneros. Yeah, good stuff. I mean, I'm, I think this deck is perfectly acceptable, you know? Everything you need, just about. As for uh, Fufi, though, let's see what he has. This card here, Moko Mokai, this is like a must-have for Maori since it lets you gain coin from killed units. He also has some nice uh, two shipping cards here of military to do a rush with. He has... Uh, Add this adds its technology here. It's like the HODs card we saw last game. It gives you all the wood text for free, but it's available one age earlier than normal. Also has the necessary unit upgrades, so I think Maori are probably in good shape in terms of deck. I like how they built a little livestock pen here for their little pig. Maori always start with one little piggy here, so they have to fatten up their little piggy so they can make some nice ham and bacon out of them later on. And, um, here we go. Voyage to New South Wales. This should be pretty good, you know. This is going to grant him, I think it's going to give him some food. It's going to give him some stuff from Australia, I think maybe a dingo or something. Yeah, he's going to get a couple of dingoes from it. So it's like the midway point between going with the South Island and Fiji. Yeah, the Fiji gives you a lot more stuff in the shipment, but this will this is like the balance normal age up costs, right? Because you could go with the South Island trip that gives you nothing, literally nothing, but it's 200 food cheaper and it arrives the fastest. This is like the nuanced um, type of voyage you could go with. As for Grand Colombia, they have started out with the Panamanian Contrabandus. This will grant him, I think, some uh, coin, is it right? Yeah, coin. I think it's the uh, Ecuadorians who gives you the Comida. Yeah, and it's the Panamanians who give you the Dinero. Stone washing is coming in. This will help with mining since it's the market level 1 mining upgrade. Okay, another house. We do see a... There's a tent somewhere, I think. Where's the tent? Yep, here's the tent, yeah. See, tents are basically like houses, but they're cheaper to make, but they only provide about 5 population, and they have a lot less HP than the standard houses do. About half. Which makes total sense, since it's about half of everything for half the cost. I think we're going to see some sort of... Uh, 
Yep, here comes the tent barracks up here, built by the Explorer. He's going to be probably rushing out of this area towards the uh, Maori, using this forward base up here with tents. He can also build tent stables with this Explorer as well. He can also build even additional tents to uh, improve his population at what it would cost. He is going to start by shipping in the Wayu natives, though. These Wayu natives are a pretty strong um, native cavalry that resembles the old school Yaneros. The old school Yaneros basically um, used to not have any sort of multipliers at all, but what they did do was um, have a bonus from nearby herdables. So, surprisingly, what we might see is this little piggy here giving an improved aura to his native cavalry. You know, he, they might actually gain additional s speed and attack from that little herdable right on this spot over here. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, definitely. We do see uh, Maori going for their next voyage, though. What voyage is that going to be? It's going to be the voyage to the South Island. So this is like a fast fortress. It's the cheapest age up option and the fastest, but he does not gain any benefits from it. It's like an exiled prince with a discount. That's the way to think of it. But then you got conscriptos applying some pressure to you. So what do you do about those? You're going to have to retreat, right? You're going to have to go back to your pa here. But question is, is he going to have enough population to ship something out with? Because to me, you don't have a warrior building yet. So you're not going to be able to upgrade him into the Taparas or the Pumakumos when you need him to. So yeah, get them back to here, start building up that pa, and then you're going to have to, yep, start chopping some wood down. You're going to need a lot of wood. Is he constructing anything here? Yeah, he is. He's got one working on it. I would get this up, like, really fast if it was me, because you need to get this up, like, pronto. Yeah, no, this is not good for you. You need to get this up. You need the population because you're gonna, yeah, get the training ground up, get the Pumakumu or the uh, Tupara upgrade for your skirmish unit, and then you're gonna have to start taking on these infantry like right now. Yep. What's he gonna start? Yep, he's gonna start with the Ted Marksman. Oh wait a minute, he started with the little Marksman shipment. Okay. What's this? No, it's 11, so it's actually a bit bigger. All right. And then he's going to try to gather up enough food and coin to get a upgrade for him. It's the Porokumu, so he's going to go with the Porokumu marksman. The Porokumu, they have longer range than the um, Tuparas. The Tuparas have a short range sort of like shotgun style attack like Escopateros that they rely on. Oh, so he will be able to afford the Porokumu marksman. So these marksmen that come out are going to have the Porokumu upgrade once they arrive. Yep, here they come. They should be out right now. Yep, here come the poor Akumu. He's going to have to target these native cavalry first, though. Target the native cavalry first. Yep, take that one out. And then you can take this one out. The cool thing about Maori is, as they kill units, they gain a little bit of an aura to gain additional attack for a temporary amount of time. Think of it as like the opposite of the Serbs. When the Serbs um, have units die on their side, they gain more attack around those dead units. But for the Maori, they do the same thing, but it's the enemy's dead units that buffs them up, not their own units. So yeah, you see that little bonus there, and now they're going to start to... Yep, their attack is going to go up slightly, and they can start to eat apart these conscriptos very easily. Very, very easily. Who is this? Uh, is that a... Is that a spearman? Yeah, you actually trained a spearman, I think, and uh, it died. Yeah. Yep, yeah, he's just going to keep training more of the Porokumu, since that's his upgrade unit right now. It's probably the way to go, and then he can ship in some more Porokumu. Does he have any catapults, though? Right, so sort of like Siege. Nah, I don't think he has any grap grapnel teams or uh, catapults in his deck, so... It's going to be kind of hard to siege your enemy down, I think. That's going to be kind of your area of trouble.
Definitely see that being an area of trouble for you. And now we're going to get the Tehedawa Spearman. Yep, the Tewahatawa Spearman. Yeah. Basically, they have a bit of a splash attack. Yeah, that's what, that's, that's what they do. And then the Tau Spearmen have more range on their uh, poem. So here comes the Spearmen, and then they're going to be turned into the Tewadahadawa Te Spearmen, or whatever, however you say it in Maori, the Maori dialect. Yep, here they go. Enjoy the nice little splash attack that they have. About one, about one splash. And now we should be good to ship in either spears or marksmen as needed, since they're already upgraded up for age three now. You can take a nice shot at that one Amoy Guapo over there. There you go. Machetros. Oh, yep, he's gonna take some shots though. I mean, the thing is, is Kind of the best way to get free kills against Machetros is simply just to shoot them at long range with skirmishers in big numbers, right? Because they are lower HP since they are a foot assault unit, they don't quite have the HP as like Sculptas or Curacers, so you can usually deal with them pretty fine if you can target them down with skirmies in fair numbers. But now he's going to try to position his head of a Spearman to, uh, Punch in these conscriptos. Yeah, I don't know if sieging that building is really the best use of your time right now, since you're gonna basically give the Maori some free kills. But they can use the ship in even more units at this point, so I don't know. And remember this building the Pa here can actually train units as well. Yeah, this acts like a barracks. So the fact that he already has his upgrades locked in means that he doesn't even need a training grounds anymore. He can just use his TC to produce infantry. But wait wait a second, do... Uh, who's gonna get the advantage here? Uh... Yeah, it looks like the Spearman just barely got the advantage there. Yeah, good. Okay. I was worried that he was gonna idle his Spearman. The Machetras were gonna chomp him within a couple of hits. Looks like, uh... The Tejeda was Spearman, uh reacted in enough time to um, defend against that. We do see some uh, marksmen being shipped in. These marksmen will definitely help against both Machetras and Conscriptos, assuming they can keep them out of melee range. Oh, Dingoes. Nice. Dingoes will eat their baby. Very good. Very, very good. Very, very good. Yep, he's going to build a second pond now, just to give himself some more population. He does have some reasonable shipments to send still, so he's not out of, not out of steam just yet. But he's, he is going to want to clean this up before uh, Columbia gets to age 3, though. You know, once they get to age 3, then you have to deal with the Presidential Palace, which will basically give him defense, and it'll also let him train some nastier units that would wipe this stuff up pretty easily, like the Granado de Turquie. Bernardo de Turquie would easily clean up an army of both marksmen and uh, Tehedawas because they happen to have an anti-infantry multiplier being a lance style unit and they might not even have to kill them all in their melee because they just kill a large number of them with their grenade toss beforehand since they're a charged grenade throwing unit looks like Grand Columbia is switching over to Escopateros you know, they know that they're dealing with spearmen and skirmish units, so they figure splash skirmish units ourselves is probably going to be the solution here. Maori have found one of the forward tent barracks, and they're going to siege it down. You know, they want to deny the Colombians that uh, forward base advantage if they can. But at the same time, they are know that your enemy is away doing stuff down there, so they're going to come up here and... Uh, Cause some problems up top here. Yeah, I can sort of see him marching in right now. Right by this set of trees over here. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely, definitely. Yeah, he's kind of gotten a free, free uh, pass to just walk right in. But now we do see the marksman returning, so I don't know what's gonna happen after this. We do. Yep, he's gonna. Yep, he got him in the TC safe. Good. Yeah, just run the spearman up forward against the machete. But you need to target the infantry really well, though. Here. Make the maximum out of your ranged attacks. You know, don't give his uh, escopeteros the time they need to clean up the spearmen, because the spearmen could be a really great distraction. It's great that he has one spearman left, but he, yeah, he lost it, unfortunately. I was going to say, you could use that spearman to snare him a little bit, and give your skirms a bit of distance. But now you got the Macetros right on top of you now, so it's a little bit nasty to deal with. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, you don't want to be in this situation at all, I think, where you have the machete right up against you like that. No, not at all. Ah, but he's... he's doing it. He's doing it. You know, uh, no, no, he's not doing it. He's not doing it. No, you, you... Six is not enough for that. No, you're not doing it. You're not doing it. Okay, so Maori is not looking too good right now. How many resources do they have? Yeah, they're, they're basically starving for dinero right now, you know? They're basically brokies right now. No coin at all. Big time brokies. Yep, they are going to try to ship in some fighters, though, but he doesn't have any upgrades on the fighters. You know, he didn't get the Hoera upgrade in time, so unfortunately those fighters are not going to be upgrade enough to deal with this. Then, of course, you got the Yanaros coming in. The Yanaros are basically going to clean up any sort of marksman that comes out of here. What is Columbia's next step going to be, though? Like, are they going to... Yeah, they're going to ship in some Yanaros. And then you're going to make a Grito de Independista card, right, to send the Presidential Palace, I assume? Yeah, I think that's probably the way to go. Yeah. Definitely the way to go. Yeah, unupgraded fighters, man. I mean, he's basically desperate at this point that he needs these. Even though they're not ideal, they don't have any sort of benefit at all going into this. Yeah, I mean, they're doing alright enough just because the Aneros have low HP and they're not quite upgraded yet to anything, so... That's the only reason he seems to be doing alright right now, is the fact that nothing here is quite upgraded. But if he had his upgrade, he would have cleaned this out, right? He would have been in better shape. And now he's going to ship in some artisanal cannons. This or be the be the uh, finisher here. Yeah, I think just like two cans is enough to finish off this opponent at this point. Don't really see him coming back at all. You know, not looking too good. Not at all. Not at all. Absolutely not. <laughs> Oh, he is shipping in some red coats, though. Some condiments. Yeah, I mean, six of them alone, though, nah, not not too good. You know, that's not gonna really do much for you, really. So, yeah, it's about the end of the road for you. Yep, only about six of these. Mm. 
Yeah, Grand Columbia on the other hand, they got quite a few options up their sleeve, you know, they could... Oh, so they'll go the Pardo routes, they're gonna train Pardos, nice. Pardos are pr pretty strong units, you know. Pretty good stats. And they only cost food too, which is kind of neat, you know. If you're out of, like, coin or wood, you can just spam Pardos into Infinity and beyond. It's also going to ship in some Voltageros to have a bit of a skirmisher unit to deal with the Redcoats. Quite nice. I mean, I think uh, Maori is already dead at this point, right? Like, I do not see Maori coming back from this at all, like, absolutely at all. Grand Columbia did their job militarily a couple of times already to ensure that they have no army momentum anymore. And the Maori economy is basically almost non-existent. You know, I mean, we could do a vill count right now. Like, 19 villagers present. And he hasn't even gotten any of his Kumara storage technologies yet, so he's not even trickling in any food from his paws yet. Combine that with uh, Sobero over here, he has about... 36 villages on the field, so economically he is doing far better than you are training additional artisanal cans as well so yeah now one more thing you could have done with your boat set here is you could have made some dugout canoes and start grabbing these fish over here here and over here you know that's one easy way that Maori tend to get some support in their food and coin areas is building some dugout canoes from their boat shed, which they can place anywhere on the war, by the way. They could have placed it all the way over here and kept it out of the prying eyes of his enemy. And he'd get a nice side resource, but he didn't do that, so... Fortunately, he can't get any of these. He does actually have enough wood to make some dugout canoes, so that's probably what I would do. Start using some of that wood and start making some dugouts. Put them on this fish over here. Put some on the whale. You know, just so you're booming out your eco a bit to keep up with the opponent. Not that it matters, because it seems like they have a far better military presence at this point than you do. You know, they got skirmishers, they got spearmen, they got artillery, so they're sitting pretty right now, especially if it inspired artisanal can, so not even just base upgrade. He's gonna send um, Bank of Octiroa now. This will basically grant him a bank. Give him a bit of a coin trickle to Maori. Combat school. So what is he planning on making at the combat school? Is he going to make trench riflemen or something? That's kind of an interesting choice. Is he going to make those uh, Tigray Lancer copycats? Yeah, I don't know. What is he planning on making with this combat school anyways? Apparently the textures died in this match because I don't see this custom uh, skins from the building. This looks like a German barracks right now. Yep, he's gonna plant, plant the bank right over there. Yep, take a conscripts are dead, now you just have to deal with everything else just about under the sun, so... Yeah, I mean, GG for you, Foofy. I mean, I knew your plan was pretty solid, but unfortunately you took the wrong fights at the wrong time, I think, and you just got the and out. You know? Like, if you could have had your spearmen a little bit more defensive against the Machetras in that earlier fight, and you could have kept your army mass, I think you might have had a chance of building up enough so that you could use that big army to keep harassing him while you built up grapnels to siege down his base with. But anyways, it's a done deal. It's the end of this encounter. Good game, both of you. You both had very strong plays through this whole uh, encounter, so I'm definitely proud of both of your performances across the board. Foofy really shined in match two, whereas Sabero really came on top, I think, in match one. And match three was sort of a mismatch between the two. You know, kind of goes both ways. Yeah, see, Foof, uh, Foofy did get the more kills, though, but um, unfortunately, Grand Columbia just had more units, and that's how they came out on top here. Yeah, that's, that's how they pulled this off, I think.
and now we're going to move on to the uh, next uh, encounter now. We'll see who that is in just a few seconds. Um, let me just pull in. Okay, so here we go. Here we go. Alrighty then, so now we're going to go into the core game. So now we're going to do Kazan versus the Leon. Is that right? So it's going to be a three-match one again. So D Delian causes another upset, it looks like. Very interesting. I wonder how he's going to do that exactly. Because remember, Delian actually killed Alucard once in last week's encounter, which nobody would have expected, but he somehow pulled it off, you know, in the most biggest Alucard throw in history. So... Is Kazan simply going to throw like Alucard did, or is Delian got something spicy planned for him? That'll be seen. Kazan has Central Americans, whereas his opponent here has the Bulgarians. Quite an interesting combination, to say the least, you know. Both of these civs are pretty solid, I would say. I actually like both of them quite a lot. The cool thing about Bulgaria is they have a really strong Oppel Senate infantry rush. So basically the idea is you spam lots of Oppel Senate infantry using multiple cards to uh, basically reduce your need for houses since your barracks will provide the population and then you can turn them into Hajusi or Siphon using the Samara banner cards as needed, right? Or you can keep them as Oppel Sand Infantry if you don't need to swap them or anything. But certainly if you go the Siphon route, then you can just siege down the TC pretty easily, so it's usually a good idea to do that. Yeah. What is he going to use his land owner's investment for? Is he going to put a barracks down somewhere? Well, at the moment it looks like he's just going to scout around with it, which is totally fine, you know. Japan does the same thing with their cherry orchard rickshaws, you know. Just look around the map, it acts like a second explorer for you. And then when you're done with that, just plop it down wherever you want to. I imagine he's going to land it up here, I think, right next to the gold mine here. So it's, you know, midway point between his enemy. And just to make sure we know what he's doing, we're going to check the deck. So he does have, um, Krastata Kazarma and also Guerre Militaire. So these are the big cards to go with with Bulgaria. This one here, it will give your barracks the ability to house about 40 population. So basically, this card, if he does end up making a barracks with this landowner investment, this card will have a value of about 1,000 coin. So basically a full 1k cords of wood shipping in age 3. Because you get about 80 about eight houses worth of population plus one barracks which adds up mathematically to 1k wood and then this one over here likewise will have a value of about 800 wood because you get again four houses worth of pop one barracks for another 200 wood and then for another 200 wood you get a train post so yeah Bulgaria is really good again heavy value with their uh early wood advantages, you know? Because it's you basically get two sort of... Well, this one is like a full-on 8 street card, where this one is sort of like a Chilean wood shipment, really. In H2. Yeah, we do see a barracks coming down over here, so that's definitely what Deline has planned for us today, I think. What is Central America going to do about this, though? What's their uh, strategy? So we see, um, who is, um, Regimental Holnero. So, I actually remember seeing Kazan go with, um, Central Americans on Jebel Musa in the past. I think what he does is he tries to go for a full-on fast capital age into Reglamento Holnero spamming, or booming rather, and while he's doing that is he ends up building on all the native sites and spams lots and lots of natives. I saw him do that on Jebel Musa where he was gaining significant uh, wins with, I think, both immigrant units and um, the native maneuver cavalry. 
I wonder if he'll try the same thing here with the Mapuche and the Zapotex. So he will be starting out with the uh, first Confederate wave, which will grant him a town hall, also some uh, coin, silver coin. Whereas um, Delian, he's going up with uh, Grandmother Tonka, just like a Tonka truck. She grants you some deer, some uh, geese actually, yeah, some herdables. And he's also, oh, he's going with Vledsky's Legion. What's up with that? What's up with Vledsky's Legion this early? See, what it does is it lets you train units in blocks of uh, 10. It's not too dissimilar from the Japanese technology for isolationism. I just don't know why he's going with it this early, though, because to me, you go this, this, this. And then you can send this after if you want, but really you would want to keep a shipping open to go for this or this. Yeah, and turn it into whatever you need. I don't get what's up with the Levski's Legion, because that kind of seems like a throw of a shipment right now. Because, what's your plan right now? Are you just going to queue... Oh, so he's going to probably just queue him out of one barracks for now. Right? Which... I kind of understand this now. This is kind of making some sense to me. So what he's going to do is he's going to just keep have like uh, blocks of 10 out of his initial barracks for now. And then when he can afford to, probably a little bit later on, he'll send the send this uh, card here, the Crestata Kazarma, later on. So, yeah, that makes total sense, because actually in this way he can deploy the infantry out a bit earlier than even I could, so. It's kind of a different angle that I didn't think about, but sure it makes a bit of sense to me now that I think about it. Oh, that's going to apply some serious pressure, though, because now his whole Neros are going to have to stay in the base, toasty and warm, away from the nasty bullets of the Opal Shenan infantry. Now, if he could siege down this, um... Oh, he's not going to be able to, though. Not only because of the build rate, but also because you got these Serenos attacking you. Yeah, just get away from that, man. You gotta deal with those Serenos. Those Juanitos Molimanos poking at you with their little spears. Yep, just retreat. Retreat right now. Very good. Very good. Yep, and then you're going to send the uh, Kazarma now, which is going to grant him basically another four houses of pop right off the bat, and as soon as he plops the barracks down, another four houses after that. So basically he'll have about 120 population. Kind of feels like the Lakota, doesn't it, with not having to worry about houses as much. And then when he sends the Gear Militaire, then he'll have about 160 population, only requiring about four more houses left. Or even just one more barracks, and then he would be all set for pop for the rest of the game. Yeah, I mean, at this rate, he's probably just trying to keep some pressure on the Central Americans and stop them from really growing a lot. Which, at this rate, is probably the way to go. We do see him going with some Confederate... Uh... F... Frighteners? Confederate Frighteners. I never heard that word before, Frighteners. Basically, what they do is, is they scare your, um, military units and they... Give them like a Duke of Suffering level effect that slows them down. So these Opal Senate units actually get slowed down as they approach those Confederate villagers. Pretty much. So yeah, that's what makes them unique. You can see it in the description right here. Oh, so they actually reduce the gather rate of um, enemy villagers in the Moors area. So, my bad. That's actually the Confederate houses that slows you down. So yeah. That's the way the Confederates work, the immigrants. They basically reduce the ability of your enemy to do stuff within a certain range. Like if you have your Confederate houses out on the map, they'll slow the military down and snare them a bit. If you have the Confederate villagers on top of a resource that the enemies are on, 
they're going to have a hard time gathering from it and give the Confederate villagers more time to eat up that resource themselves. Uh, what's this? Um, Mapuche Iron Clubman? So he's going to make some uh, natives to get some siege. I don't know if that's the way to go or not because conceivably what you could do is you could probably go with a bit of a um, siege with the Opal Senates because what you can do with the Opal Senates is you can use the Samara banner, turn them into Scythemen, and that would actually be a lot more substantial than just making some natives. Not that I am against you making natives at all, because that could certainly supplement you. Oh, wait a minute, no, that's actually Central America going with the natives, my bad. So, really what he's trying to do here is he's trying to use the Iron Clubman to attack the Opal Senates. Because the Opal Senates are actually kind of a trashy unit, so even hand infantry like the Iron Clubs, the Ironwood Clubman can actually do pretty decent against them. Oh, so he went with Los Altos. I just saw that, so... He is playing a bit differently than last time. He is actually thinking about military units a lot earlier. Oh, and we do see the Samara banner for Scythemen coming out on the Bulgarian side, just as predicted. So this is going to grant him a large stack of Scythemen to siege the town center with. He's going to have to position his Opal Senate infantry, though, carefully to make sure that the Conscriptos do not get in the way of that. Very good play from Delian. Very good play. But you're going to have to target uh, this. Target that. No, no, you got to keep attacking the TC, though, man. That's, that's the one thing you got to do. You got to keep attacking the TC. You got to keep attacking that town, sir. Yep, big time. Just keep attacking the town center right, like right now. Yeah, no, 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 nope, nope. Keep attacking the town center, man. I mean, uh, I yeah, do, just stop wasting time here and start sieging. I guess it's all right because you are dealing splash damage against the units, but uh, all right. I guess it's low enough in HP that that's all right. Okay, I'll give you that. Yeah, he, he will be taking down this town center, though, just so you're aware. There's no way he can save it at this point. Yeah, that's going down. Now, question is, how much resources does uh, Bulgaria have to keep this queue going? So, yeah, they can they can conceivably keep sending in awful sand infantry. And now he just needs to siege down the barracks, and then he's going to send uh, Guerra Militaire to give himself some more population, plus a trading post to get some more shipments across the finish line. Yeah, this is not looking good for Central America right now. Not good at all. You know, they're kind of in a really nasty spot in Pickle because they got these villagers exposed here. And guess what? The immigrant colony cannot house these villagers at all, these whole Neroes. Basically, they're just sitting ducks right now. They actually have to run around the map to even avoid getting killed right now. Unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's quite unbelievable. Yep, and here comes the Opal Sand Infantry to start shooting down. Now we got, um... Yeah, look at this mess. Like, only the Confederate villagers actually has the ability to garrison in this building. These whole Neros are basically dead right now. All of them. All of them are dead. And then he's gonna ship in the Opal Senate Cavalry. The Cavalry Opal Senetsi Pobinix. These guys are basically like a weaker form of the Hussar, so they're going to be quite useful here. Like chasing down any remaining Colneros, especially the ones over on this side by the wood. Yeah, I mean, at this point, it's safe to say Bulgaria has effectively picked up this match as a win. You know? It's something about Delian and uh, the uh, Mendocino map. He seems to be get miraculous wins on this map all the time. Seems like now first he duped uh, Alucard on this map, and now he's duping Kazan on this map. Something about this map really uh, shines with him, you know? Really does well on this map. You know, and I think it's probably the sneaky barracks he put on the corner over there that granted him what he needed. That's probably what did it for him, you know? 
Yep. Oh, nice. And then, um... Now he's going to start sieging on this, uh... Town Hall here. Yep, here comes the Opal Senate Cavalry. Very good. Let's start cutting into these. And now he's going to use the Samara Banner for Hajusi, so all these Opal Sand Infantry are going to turn to Hajusi. Here we go. Yep. Full army of Hajiks. Right at your disposal. Now I think it's safe to say that Central America is screwed royally because um, now these Hajusi are going to be really good against his Conscriptos and his Pardos. So those are two less units that actually friends his army at this point. And believe it or not, Wazaltos is totally infantry based, so not looking too good right now. You know, I think if you're Central America, you only have a couple of options left to really have any defense at this rate. Does this man even have a tower or anything to receive shipments from? Doesn't look like it, so I mean, what is your plan exactly? Like, are you going to send the Moon Children in? That might be an option since they have a really good multiplier against all infantry units with the infantry tag. Are you going to ship in the five uh, Pardos and Escapateros combo card? Yeah, that's really all you have left right now. Like, this little army of Escos and Conscripts and one Machetro? Like, really man, is that going to do you any good? I don't think it is. Delian played this build perfectly. He did it really, really well. He knew when to send the Samara banners. He actually did something I would have never conceived of and went with the, um, one second. One second, I gotta answer something. <sighs> Let's keep going. <laughs> yeah, as I was saying before though, Basically, Delian played the build, like, really well. He knew when to send the Kazarma card and the Militaire card, but he actually did the Levski Legion before that, which actually facilitated an earlier rush with the Opal Senate Infantry out of a single barracks. And then when he had the resources to, then he could queue out double barracks. From this one over here, and then this one over here, so... In a way, his timing was even better than that of me, in the way that I do the build. So maybe I got Kinsera sending Levski's Legion first before going with the Militaire. Just so I can pepper them up with some Uppelshad infantry beforehand. Before the real spamming begins. Well, this is kind of interesting. I guess uh, Delian feels so confident at this point that he's going to try to... Um, take over some uh, areas on the other part of the map. So this is a frontier wagon, right? So yeah, he actually sent frontier defenses to build some tower houses. And he's ideally trying to take over any sorts of hunts and mines left over on the map. Basically allowing him to um, deny Central America any more resources so that they can't rebuild their TC and do anything, you know? he's. I'm sure Kazan at this point is fully aware that he's basically dead, but, you know, he, he will try to fight to the very end and try to claw his way back if possible, so things like this, having towers on top of the hunts and the uh, mining, basically denies you that comeback. You got this hunt over here, you got this one over here, some of the mines over here, some over here, but, you know, eventually then you run out of those, and then since you're so far behind, it's really hard to think of coming back at all. In fact, it really is, you know? It really is. Definitely, definitely is. Yep, and now it's gonna be pushing in. He is gonna age up now with, um, Vasil Levski. 
the same Levski on the card icon, I assume. <laughs> yeah, and he's basically gonna give him some- I think he gives you some sort of infantry, I believe, like more Apple Sand infantry. He says, you know what, screw that, I'm just gonna spam Apple Sand infantry, no reason to age up at this point. Numbers is probably more valuable at this stage, you know. What are the odds of him even aging up to age 3 at this point anyways, the Central American, so... At this rate, he's thinking, yeah, let's just spam a bunch of units at him. It's probably going to be more efficient in the short term and finish this off real quickly. Yeah, definitely. Oh, absolutely. Like, I would do the same thing, you know. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, definitely. Absolutely. Um. Sending Furrier? At this point, yeah, you may as well send any sort of hunting or lay card since you got full reign of the map and you can eat about just any just about any meat that you can think of on that map. The map is yours, buddy. You won it. You won the map. Therefore you've won the game. Yeah, like what what is this? Like five Escos, eight conscriptos, two Pardos? Like this is not an army. Like this is not an army at all. Like he doesn't even have enough coin to send the moon children in yet. Which would be his last conceivable hope, I would suppose. Yeah, but he's like, ah, nah, 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 I can't deal with this much longer. I'm getting beaten, I'm getting sprayed with bullets here. I got the safe coming in to decapitate us. I got the, um, Apple Sack Calvary hacking my, uh, Formeros down. Like, what is even the point anymore? Like, uh, GG, GG. Machetro's down, villagers going down, we got, uh, infantry getting sprayed with bullets, which is, um, wonderful for Bavaria and Delian. GG, yeah, very good, Delian, you know? You seem to be mastering this map, I find, you know? You won last game against a conceivably stronger opponent on this map, and now you did the same thing again this week on the same map, just using Bulgaria this time. More resources, great. Yeah, this is, um, unit count mattered a lot here. And if I look at the graph, see how he was always able to stay ahead of him in unit count? And how he just exponentially grew. This is, this is, this graph here is how Bulgaria always wins, is in unit numbers. And then the swap over, obviously, to a critical unit like the Siphman or the Hajusi. That's how they do it usually. It's usually how they pull it off. Alright, let's go on to the next one now. Alrighty then. So far I think that this um, stream has gone pretty well. We haven't had any drop frames yet, which is great. You know, I think we're going to have a good good uh, recording. Not a lot of interruptions either, you know. I had one for like five seconds so far, so... We're making record time, I think. You know, we might get this recording out maybe even tonight. Who knows, you know? Whenever I can, I'll get out to you. All right, so Kazan versus Dali in match two. <sighs> yeah. This is looking like a good series of matches for today, so I'm definitely excited for him. Now we see Kazan with the Russians. He really is good with this Civ, so Delian better watch out. You know, if he wants to avoid Jebel Musa, he's gonna have to really play his A game. Delian, Romanians. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. This is the same position Delian played uh, the Civ last week, and he didn't do too well. He lost to the Tupi. Now he's dealing with a very similar Civ, the Russians, that spams out a bunch of weak uh, skirmisher units, right? Like the Unstoppable Cantonistas, or whatever you want to call them. Stilet they used to be Stiletzis, now they're Cantonists. They basically work the same way. Uh, yeah, I mean, Romania, they got their strengths, obviously. They're pretty good at spamming Dorabante and Calarasi with their, um... Faith-based resource changeover cards, but other than that, I don't know. 
Oh yeah, and then they get the train post trade route card too that makes free Dorabonte from the train posts. Those are their two big assets. Other than that, I don't know what they do really great early on. As for Russia though, Russia definitely has some early game advantages. You know, they're really good. You, I don't even really need to explain it. You've seen Vanilla, how good the Russians rush. But the big difference here is the Russians have even an additional tool, the uh, Plastunis, which is a foot assault unit, which is a, yet another option that they can use to push in with. They actually also get Partisans instead of Halberdiers, so they actually have an even earlier polearm option to start sieging and rushing with. Okay, so Distributivism. This is like the gold standard of every Russian deck known to man. If you don't go with this card, you're not playing Russia properly. Yeah, and from the looks of the deck, we definitely see a lot of presence of the Plastuni. We also see some Cantonists, some Cossacks. Uh, yeah, it's definitely looking in that direction that we're going to see a lot of rushing here. Rushing Russians. Russia rushing. And now uh, the Romanian deck. I think this is the same deck we saw last week against Alucard. It has a lot of the Verdon wagons with the Roma villagers in them. It does have some military units here and here. He, I think his main goal is to take over the trade route and try to do a lot of damage in H3 with all these shipments. But will we make it there? Who knows at this point. Anything is possible. The possibilities are endless. Yeah, and always when you're playing Romania, always remember, every time you send one of these cards, it will actually subtract from the build limit Children of the peasants hats. to accommodate more numbers of the Romas. Which, in most cases, is probably Generates. good if you can manage the Romas properly, but do remember Roma villagers gather worse near the town center. Children the one way they make up for this, though, is the ability to trickle experience points while they work. So they're actually the same thing as the uh, Mapuche villagers that do the same sort of thing. They auto-gather XP while they're working. And I think you should try to place the Verdon a little bit away. If you could go for this... M and see, this would be a great place to put a Verdon wagon right up here with the mine and the moose up here. Because you're protected mostly by the water and also the native side of the Cree here. And you could easily build a teeny weeny little wall here and just gate this off. So yeah, if you could put your Verdon wagon up there that would definitely keep you well defended absolutely well defended but we'll see we'll see how it goes I mean I have a feeling Kazan's gonna clean house here since he's really good with the Russians he even beat me in my encounter with them with the Russians and I was playing Germany of all things so yeah he knows a thing or two about building up with Russians in age two and three and I think in the end Russia's just gonna have the bearer army to go in for a full push against Romania. Yep, should be aging up any second now, I think. Hopefully. Hopefully you age up. <laughs> What's going on, man? You're 900, uh, about 900 Comida and you're not even aging up yet, man. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing, son? What are you doing? What are you doing? It's four minutes and you're not aged up yet. <laughs> Dude, what are you, are you trolling or something? What are you doing? Age up. Age up right now. Young man, age up right now, young man. Or you're gonna die. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's not, he's getting up there in food and I don't see that little... Yeah, here we go, here we go. Alright, so the Arzan. Alright, Core Master, 400 wood. Pretty standard stuff. Took a while though, because I was getting scared that he forgot to age up. Like... What would happen if you aged up like five minutes later and then delay and somehow delivered a fishing blow to you? Like that would be the major upset then, a two and zero defeat from the hands of Delian. That would be a serious defeat on your part. See, Delian though he aged up pretty early with Mihail Su too, so he's going to be ahead in age two and can conceivably apply some serious pressure. Su2 in particular gives you about three free Scythemen, so he could actually start sieging ahead with these, like, right now. And depending on where he puts his blockhouse, yeah, this could be a serious problem. He seems to be playing the similar game he did last time. 
stick in the barracks in a sneaky little corner of the periphery here where ideally villagers and explorer would not be looking at so yeah that's it's gonna see if he can pull off a sneaky attack again with that all right so um now we see the slave been starting to siege on the market a bit but unfortunately he is is he aware of yeah he doesn't know about this blockhouse at all which is gonna hurt him if he's not aware of it because what I think might actually happen is is he's gonna be busy doing all swinging his punches up that way and then Russia's just gonna keep attacking this way and that's gonna deny you any sort of defense right you're not gonna be able to trade off properly because he's gonna be trading off of your economy he, you're gonna be trading off of his economy so that's not gonna be good Draw Bonte here to shoot at the Cherokee warrior, effectively killing him. Yeah, I have too much walking, not enough shooting. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, well, I guess so. I guess it's all right because I guess that blockhouse was pretty. This, might, yeah, that's actually pretty good because he will take down the blockhouse for free just about denying Kazan that 250 wood. Yeah, he, Kazan is effectively burnt through 250 wood. Yeah, that's pretty good actually. Yeah, that's quite good. You know, good job, Delian. You, you definitely sent him back quite a bit doing that. Now he's going to ship in some more Dorabante. Hopefully he finds out about this before it hurts him too much. Yeah, but at the same time, now that he's lost that defense at home, he's going to have more time to attack you at your home. In your neighborhood. Watch, watch, watch over here. You, you know he's, um... Yeah, he sees that, right? Yeah, he knows about the foundation. Is he going to shoot it, though, in time? Hopefully, uh... Yeah, good. All right. Great. Great work, um... Here comes the Calaras Cavalry, another batch of Dorabante. So, effectively, Delian is doing quite good at keeping Kazan busy. Now, it's going to be seen if he sends these Cantonists at home to defend the base, or is he going to send them forward here and start raiding? That's going to be seen. That's going to definitely make a big difference in how this match goes, I think. He will kill the Explorer, though, and get some XP off of that. Great. Uh, wait, Cantonus, where are you going to go? Is he going to go here, or is he going to teleport his way back over? Oh, so he's, he is sending them over here. Now, Galean, just put these uh, guys on melee, and you should be good to go. Yeah, definitely. Dorabanti have extra hack armor than normal heavy infantry, so if you go into melee against these Cantonists, you're probably going to see a bit better performance, honestly. But it doesn't matter, he was able to clean up the Cantonists pretty easily. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. What's going on here? It seems like Kazan is getting eaten alive over here. This does not look like Kaz the Kazan we know and love. He's getting destroyed by these uh, Romanian units. Yeah, I don't know. It, it just seems yeah, like Kazan me. is taking a lot of uh, casualties here than I would have expected. Yep, and then he can still ship in Hajusi, he can ship in these crates. I actually think Delane Del might actually win this 2-0, which would be insane. Yeah, it would be. Like, And now, of course, you got your settlers over here, and then you can just shoot these... Uh, lag... Oh, well, why did you not shoot them? Why did you not shoot these units? Like, yeah, it's like... I mean, it is good because these animals are starting to die a little bit, so he is losing conceivably food value from these hunts by you keeping them in there like that. But, yeah, at the same time, I gotta wonder why aren't you shooting on time with these things? It must be lag, I think, you know. But overall, I mean, Delian is playing this really well. He is keeping his opponent in the base really well. But now, he, since you're leaving, now he's going to start to wall up with the remaining wood he has and build blockhouses. 
which you know at this point this is going to give Kazan a second chance to come back conceivably he sends the Cossacks out of here and he's going to slice right into these uh, Roma villagers and peasants but you just have to put him in the wagon right just throw him in the wagon good and then just retreat with the wagon that's the one good thing about the Roma the Verdons is you toss them in the wagon and deny the raiding. They also have really good hack armor, so the wagon will almost certainly always get away. Oh, that was great. Great work. Yeah, Delian is going to go for a capital H for sure now, because he just has the room to do so. You know, his opponent, at this point, does not have a lot of, um, have a lot going for him to do a lot of pressure right now on you so if you can go up to capital age now and get some better units that's probably the way to go it's absolutely the way to go um what about food though he's me down food though for some reason maybe get some more hunts or something and what about this are you gonna put some pressure here and start shooting at these moose hunts a little bit yeah, I think that would probably be a smart move. Um, just shoot this. Why does he keep walking in and not shooting anything? It's like he's lagged out like extremely or something. Like he doesn't notice. It's gotta be the lag. I mean, he's this happens every time he goes into the base. He just doesn't shoot a damn thing. So I'm thinking, you know, it's probably lag. Lag it's holding him back from targeting properly. And that's very frustrating because lag is not good. You know, lag can ruin good gameplay. Hmm. Yep. Definitely lag is not your friend. You know, you don't want lag anywhere. He's going to queue up some more Dorabanti though, I think. Which, you know, it's good. I just think you should go to Capital Age now and maybe get some Vanders. Get some real skirmishers and start denying him any sort of infantry supremacy. Yeah, that's what I would probably do. Yeah, and then, um... Can he afford more door bands? He could probably fit one more in it, I can imagine. Yeah, what's the cost of these? Yeah, he could fit one more door bounty, but he's not... Probably gonna... Oh, mule artillery, so he wants to ship the mule artilleries in, maybe? Nah, he's gonna send the uh, another Verdon wagon with some more Roma villagers. Alrighty then. But, he does need to be... Does uh, Delian finally understand about this block? He does know about the block coast, okay. That's important for, for him to know that there is a forward base building in his area. So he can try to clean that up as soon as possible. You know, I think you should deal with that blockhouse first. And then worry about the houses down here and the settler. And then after that, you just force them back to their base. And then you can fight out pretty normally. Oh, we see every, just about a smorgasbord of every Russian unit here. Except for the Parzans. We see the Cossacks, we see the Plastunis, we see the Cantonists, and we see line infantry. Just about everything under the sun. The Russian sun, that is. The Verdon wagon's trying to get away here. But wait a second. He's trying to push. He's going to push with this army. He's actually going to try to push him. What are you doing, man? What are you doing? Go back home and... Why does this always happen with people when they play Romania? They never go back to their base to fix things. They always try to trade off with their base and siege them. It's, it's, it's a commonality. I just don't understand why people do it. It's crazy, you know? Why not just save your your economy, man? Like, I mean, I get that you want to take the TC down and finish them off again, but seriously, dude, like, what are you doing? He will get the TC down, though, at least. That's good. That's, that's at least a good thing. What will he get from it, though? He can make some Hajusi from it, which can conceivably help him out quite a bit. Uh, yeah, I mean, at this rate, I just don't know at this point what people think of nowadays. Uh, 
Yeah, and then you gotta stay on top of these though, like if he makes any line if we do have to kill them though. Because you gotta deny him that army presence. How many resources? Yeah, see, Kaza has quite a few resources to keep training stuff, though, and you're kind of dwindling a bit. Yeah, you gotta stop idling. You gotta put these to work on something. You know, that's another thing. That's definitely another thing you gotta consider is get these to work. I am shocked, though, that Delian is making this so close. You know what I mean? He is putting Kaza on down to the little wire here. Right? Literally, like actually. Down to the literal wire. And this is kind of epic, actually. Yeah, it's, yep, he's got the Roma working. Alright. That's good. That's definitely good. But you gotta get these Dorbanti up here into a group, and you need to start shooting these line infantry effectively now. Also, what's Delian doing? Like, what's he planning? Train more Dorbanti, I guess? You really need do need to ship these in though, because if you did that, I think you could finish them off. Ah, yeah, you know what? I take that back. I think at this point, because Kazan has blockhouses still active and has uh, conceivably, he does have more resources. I think Kazan just barely wins here, barely. A very close shave. He didn't like win outright. He had the win simply by the fact that he has more settlers. He also has blockhouses. See, if Delian did this appropriately and just saved his base at home, he could have taken down their blockhouse and then he could have pushed normally at his opponent. And I think this would have been a 2-0 upset against Kazan. But because you did not do that and now that your house and you don't have any wood can't even train anything. Now you're just the same duck for the remaining military running around the map at this point. You know, he's, he still has all the Pastunes, Cantonists, and so forth that he trained before, so... Yeah, you're just gonna lose by the fact that you're totally housed at this point, and you're sitting on a bunch of resources that you can't actually tap into now. Yeah. Pretty much. You know, and then you even got Russia building houses near your barracks here, completely finding it, so that barracks is not going to last much long either. Yeah, GG. GG. GGG. GGG. Yep, more line infantry coming out. Looks like a defeat to me. A very, a very narrow defeat. I want to make this clear that Delian did a very tactical job today. He won his first match pretty well, and he almost won this one well, too. So, Delian is definitely getting up there in military strategy. He's becoming more of a tactician like me, so that's good to see. You know, and... He, yeah, that, here's the thing, like... The resources were not that much different. You know, I think the only difference was at the end when, uh... Kazan started pumping out more units. In the early game, Delian did really well here, and he dominated him on the unit graph for a while. So, yeah, very good stuff. Really good stuff. I'm not, not disputing that. He did very good stuff today in this match. You know? But now he has to go to Jebel Musa to see if he's going to be the victor of this encounter or not. That's going to be the final test, it looks like. The final trial. For Delian to see, is he going to get away with the 2 and one victory? Or is he going to lose 1-2 and two to Kazan? That is going to be the big test for us today. Let's see for ourselves how this goes. Jebel Musa, here we come. We're ready for you. We're coming for you. <laughs> Alright, so Kazan's going with Japan. Another favorite civ of his. Um... What is Delian going to do? Danish, yeah, he likes this. How does this always happen? Delian always plays Danish. He always he always plays Danish on Jebel Musa, and he always is on this side of the map. There's something weird about this. There's something very weird about this. You know, Delian always plays Danish, and he's always on this side of the map on Jebel Musa when he does it. Crazy. 
At least this time I he grabbed his XP crates, so he's going to be getting Colbertism really early. I think last time when he faced Alucard, he didn't actually grab his XP crates early on and missed out on those resources, but this time he's being more careful, you know? He doesn't want it to be like last time where he just got spammed by um, Manyoso Outlaw Madness from Alucard. Now he's going to have to deal with Japanese infantry with their their Jensui this time, I think. With the Jensui basically being the more modern variant of a Daimyo, land them train infantry and boosting their stats nearby uh, with an aura. Yeah, but anyways, the early free shipping for Danish will grant him Colbertism with a food trickle, and then he probably will ship in some settlers right after that, giving him a slightly better starting economy than his opponent, I think. But then again, Japan, they got some crazy economic tricks up their sleeve as well. If he can spam a bunch of shrines all over this map along this trade route, grabbing all the animals, that could definitely benefit Japan really well. He's currently got his shrine configured to the wood, so he will be looking to build additional shrines, it looks like, in all of these different peripheries here. And let's look at the deck as well. Um, so he is going to go with uh, Heavenly Kami first, so he can just make the shrines a little bit cheaper to build, as well as improving their trickles. They're going to become much more efficient with that card active, and he will be able to get more of them, which in indeed leads to more efficiency from the shrines across the board. Whereas Delian, let's look at his deck. Um, Polar Bears, a signature thing of his he likes to send because they got a lot of HP and they're good at tanking. Standard Danish infantry, a lot of crates, some good upgrades here. And factories, yep, factories. I don't know about neoclassical architecture though. It does allow the capital to trickle experience, which sounds kind of in intriguing. How by how much though? I don't know. I don't think I've seen it active before, so I don't know how much it lets the capital trickle XP. Do see shrines coming up over here, though. So I think he's going to work his way down this roadway here to grab all the animals. Yep, I do see the shrine coming up over here, too. So by the time uh, Delian ages up, he's going to have about 16 settlers active. Quite good. Combined with the food trickle, he's going to be in good shape to rush in age 2. How is Cousins wood, by the way? Because he's got them working on wood right now. Is he going to get any other um, shrines up very quickly? Now, one more thing he could do if he wanted to be really greedy right now is he could go up with the consulate to get the uh, Portuguese allies to make the shrines even cheaper than they are. But at this rate, he's not really chopping in the wood, so that's probably not the way to go right now. And that would actually... The Portuguese allies would also... Wait a second. Let me think. Let me think long and hard. Um, trying to remember something here. So, do they port do they even get the Portuguese allies anymore? I'm trying to think. I. They do, they do. Yeah, because Spain was removed and replaced with the USA, so they do have Portuguese still. All right. I had to register, register that in my brain for a second. Like, I knew one of the consulate allies got swapped with the United States. It was the Spanish, yeah. Spanish had been gone for quite some time, unfortunately. Hopefully they make a return somewhere. With the Philippines, maybe, or another civ. So, we see the Golden Pavilion going up for Japan as their first wonder, which you don't usually see a lot. I guess he's thinking more or less on the lines of getting his military up to speed early on to deal with any potential Danish pressure. Here comes the second Cherry Orchard, after it did a bit of scouting around the map. Any more shrines coming up? Oh, this is Delian. He's going with the barracks and uh, redoubt, so it's almost like a blockhouse in a way. You know, tower and barracks together together forever.
and he's gonna conceivably start shipping uh, units out of this tower as well. Right on top of him here. This also looks like a pretty brief match from what the timer says, you know. It's not a big match. Not by a lot, you know. So we'll see though, we'll see. We'll definitely see. Comes the land sold that toes. Oh, we got a couple of free keys here from the Golden Pavilion, Egypt. That's definitely going to be a bit of a problem for um, Delian dealing with these skirmisher units when he's going to be doing mostly heavy infantry from here. Yep, the land sold out, so not that, they're not that tough, you know, they, they're actually, I think, weaker than even Russian line infantry in H2. But they are cheaper, they only cost about 50 wood and about 15 coin. Really, really cheap unit. Like, godly cheap unit. So yeah, I mean, that's definitely something for, um, the uh, Kies to spray across pretty easily and defeat. Yep, when Solats back up with the Parzans and get ready for a siege push of some kind. That's what I would do. Get ready for a siege push. Big siege push. Where's the barracks for, uh... Oh, he's not going to use the barracks. He's going to use the Ago Takamori, the Gensui, to train the Kies himself. Okay. Alright, so... Yeah, he's going to also make some Shagumas, which is the Musketeer unit, the Line Infantry, and the Kies, the Skirmisher unit. So, yeah, he's going to do a Gensui attack using his, uh, the Ago Takamori here. If he can somehow take his partisans and thrust them through oh, Siago here, that would be a fatal defeat of Deliant, of Kazan. But will he do that, though? That's going to be seen here. Get, get those partisans and sieging and doing some sort of work. Why is he just running through his base like this? Like, you're not picking up any siege, you're not... Is he aware of these, the uh, Diamyo, or this... Gensui as it's called in Morsel. Yeah, now he sees it coming out here though, so he's fully aware of it at this point. Yeah. He's got to think about shipping something in. Ideally some volunteers. He's also going to train some Hussars it looks like. Good idea to deal with the skirmishers. So now ship in some volunteers. Oh, polar bears, that's another option. You know, the polar bears might do some good. But then again, he's going to target down the tower first to deny your shipments there. But then, of course, he has to protect the Gensui at all costs. So yeah, that's definitely something you got to make sure you do with Japan is make sure this guy survives. Because if he dies, you know, then you lose your military building of sorts, you know. You're really in deep, deep doo-doo at that point. I mean, at this rate, he's going to see about four, oh, three Hussars, all right. He just missed that window to add the fourth one in. But he's going to make it up with Lance Soldatars instead. Poor bears get over the, uh, up, 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 stab, stab the horsey. Get the, get the Siago. Don't attack the infantry. Attack this guy. He is your enemy. Your sworn enemy. Take him out. <laughs> Take him out at all costs. Uh, no, I don't know. I think, uh, Delian threw the match. He might have just threw the match, I think. Because he didn't do anything with his polar bears, he didn't position himself properly. I think he might have just threw this match. Pretty sure that he did. Man, you just threw the match. What are you doing? You just threw the match. You just killed yourself. Why did you do that? Why did you throw everything like that? He was targeting the, uh... He was targeting the infantry when he could have yes. easily thrusted at the de this Gensui and denied him military production. Why did you not kill him? He couldn't get him back if you lost him. Their HP would go down in their attack. And then you could attack later. 
And now he's feeling so confident he's actually going to train some samurai swordsmen to front his army now. That's going to be a serious problem for you, man. Hope you can deal with it. Hope you can deal with it. That's for sure. Here comes the samurai swordsman. Now they're going to push on that stable and barracks and tower. It's gonna, not going to look too good. Yeah, not looking good right now for you. You're just taking a lot of siege over there. Lots and lots of siege. Lots and lots of siege. Lots and lots of siege. Yeah, I mean, at this rate, you got Japan to scan all the market technologies now because they feel so confident at this point. Again, is he actually going to start attacking the right unit? No, he's just attacking the samurai. He's, he's not really even... Yeah, now he's targeting the Gensui, but way too late. Now, if you killed him in the first encounter, you wouldn't be dealing with this. You would be dealing with a lot less units, and you definitely wouldn't be dealing with samurai right now. Not good at all. <laughs> not a good play at all. Yeah, you kind of just threw the match, buddy, by not managing your army well. Not making the right stuff either. You should have made some volunteers to do with the Shagumas easier. So that way you could focus more on the Kies and finish them off. But, you know, we make mistakes sometimes with our unit comps, and it happens. Yeah, Japan is doing great, though. Like, they they got their shrines working on the coin right now. They're actually getting the second mining upgrade from the market. He's actually in good enough shape to actually ship in some of the native uh, Naginatas natives, the Sohues, who will add the pikeman component to his army to really help in the sieging. Well, here's those volunteers he should have had earlier, though, to deal with these. They might be able to stall a bit, but I don't think so, especially since the Jensui himself, Siago Takamori, could actually effectively kill him on his own, since he is a hand cavalry unit. Yes. So he's an assault unit, actually, so that's kind of interesting, so that actually means he has hand armor. Like an honor guard, almost, just without the, uh, pierce armor add-on. Wouldn't it be insane if these guys also had pierce armor as well, to, uh, make him like an honor guard type unit? Nah, that's way too much abilities, you know. They'd kind of be broken at that point. Yep, here comes the, uh, so the Sohais right out of the Gensui, since he can receive shipments as well. Yep, he's gonna send that card again, since, you know, Japan can send unit cards twice. As well as crate cards and villager cards, so... Yeah, that's that's one of the specials of Japan, as you know, from Tad and D. Yeah, I mean, at this rate, it looks like, um... Yeah, Delene is not in good shape right now. He's gonna take a defeat, it looks like, right now. Definitely looks like it. Yep. Yeah, right there. Right there. GG. GG. <laughs> yeah, Del yeah, Kazan, good job. I mean, you, you performed well here with your Gensui attack. You probably threw your opponent off a bit by not going with the barracks, and that probably added to the advantage, you know. So, 
Good work uh, getting yourself out of a pickle here from the Danish, because if you handled that any worse, I feel like maybe Delian could have pulled off a 2 and 1, but instead you pull off a 2 and 1, so good job, buddy. Good job. Uh, let's look at the post game, you know, see if there's any stuff to look. Yeah, resources wise, Kazan really ate up a lot more resources. And in the end, he was able to do more with less, you know. Land Soldats, 43 of them. That doesn't mean anything because they're garbage, right? That's why you need to rethink your army a bit, add some volunteers in. You know, deal with the Shagumas. Because if you can deal with the Shagumas, then you could swarm against the Kies with some Hussars. And then Siago was left alone there to meet his fate. Anyways, it was a really fun encounter, you know. Both players did really well, you know, Delian, he is improving quite a lot. That's good, always good to see players improve, you know. It's good to see players getting better over time at being their opponents, you know, and the fact that they can pull off a tiebreaker match with some of these harder opponents like Kaza and Alucard just shows you how far he's come. He's come quite far, actually, yeah. Well, well, we'll go on to the next match now. The next encounter of Chori versus Alucard. This also appears to be a tiebreaker one, so this should be pretty interesting. Should be quite interesting, actually. Alright, so Chorizo starting with the Zulu. He likes the Zulu. Chilizo Zulu. Um, Alucard goes with España. Ole Santiago de España. <laughs> yep, the Toledo Civ that we all uh, know all too well. It should be interesting, you know. Both of these Civs are really famous for sending unit shipments in Age 2. Spain because they get a lot of XP. Zulu because they have so many good rushing unit options. So this is going to be fun to watch, you know. Who rushes who to death? Or does that happen at all? You know, it's it doesn't mean that they're using aggro civs that they're going to be aggressive. We could see a late game Zulu match, you know, with Ishikulos being used. Could happen. Who knows? You know, anything's possible in this day and age. Anything's possible. Yep, I'm just looking at the little timer there to see how long this match is going to be. So I can kind of guess what sort of gameplay we're going to see. As of right now, though, it looks like uh, Zulu is mostly focused on uh, building trading posts on the center map. They did they did this uh, last week as well when they were fighting the Hods with um, Moon. He... I guess the strategy here with Zulu is they try to get the stagecoaches early on and use it to buff up their resources so they can use that in conjunction with the hunts. Yeah, we do see three villagers getting shipped though, but we do not see any sort of a conda to support more population. To do that, he's likely going to use the library blue technologies to get porters, and the porters can build him a conda to get him population real fast. He can afford library blue one right now. You should see that any second coming out of this library. But in terms of the deck, spearmen, clubs, firebrands, not a lot in age 2. It's mostly going to be a lot of age 3 aggression, it looks like. And then, of course, we got some rushing options in age 4 here that are present. Yep, here comes Library Blue 1, Palisade. This will grant him a porter that he can use to build his population building, the Akanda. And then he can send the Blueberry, the. Library Blue number two to grant him even another porter, which will grant him even more population. Yep, because the Akanda is a 300 wood building, so if it wasn't for these porters, basically Chorizo would be dead right now because he would be housed to death to, before he could deal with Spain properly. Yep, here comes the first Akanda going, and then when he hits. He can, yep, uh, Library Blue 2 only costs about 280 food, so definitely get that. Central Tower, Sentry Tower, get another Porter. 
As for Alucard, though, what's his deck? So yeah, I mean, he's, it's a bit balanced. You know, he has still has Royal Mint and Refrigeration. He does have some upgrade options. But you do see Corsairs, Asars, Regulares in there, Infante de Molinas, Foot Artillery, so a bit of a mix of everything, you know. Certainly enough shipments to take advantage of Spain. Definitely. But no greedy capitalism coin trickle, though, for H1 play, which is kind of interesting. He's going to go up with the Statesman to get a tower and some coin. You know, it's quite similar to the Governor General for Vanilla. Where's Zulu? Zulu should be aging up any moment now, I think. Yeah, they're just about ready to go up to age 2 right now. Their blue bar, blue library blue tech number 2 is almost completed. See, with uh, Africans, you can either research usually two of one color, or you can research a little bit of all the colors to actually um, age up, right? With blue ones being considered civil technologies, yellow ones being economic technologies, and red ones being military technologies. Blue ones are the cheapest, but also research the slowest. Whereas red ones are the most expensive, but they research the fastest. And then yellow is the more nuanced variant between the two. Yeah, so you gotta plan out which library techs you need for your personal build order and sort of how quick you want to age up with. Technically a constant stream of a of blue technologies is great if you're Egypt, but maybe depend on the circumstances like if you're Ethiopia you can afford to do a yellow based fast industrial since they give you more food crates in return that you can get some resources from. So it's really really up to you and how you feel like you can handle your macro to reach the ages quicker. Interestingly enough, we see crates coming out before units, so I'm thinking this is going to be like a fast capital age type of a build for Zulu. Because really, technically, all he needs to do is gather that chest of coin right now, and he could actually start, he could actually get library blue number four right away. Yeah, I think that's my, maybe what we're going to see here. Yep, Library Blue number four, King's Throne. Now this one, at this rate, this one's actually give him two porters instead of one, so he could do a lot of things with that. He could build an Akanda, he could also build a Gunpowder Crawl or a Horse Crawl, so that he can actually start making the Scaries or Revolving Cannons, which are some deadly units for the Zulu to use. So... It will be seen whether he goes all Akandas with those or he, you know, adds a gunpowder crawl. The horse crawl would only be good if you needed maneuver units like dragoons, you know, since they produce the escorts and later on the Yulons if you send a certain card. Yeah, he already has good control of the map as well. I mean, he only needs like one more train post over here and he has both routes under his belt. I just don't know how this is going to go at this point, because it looks like Chorizo is very sure of himself and what he's doing, you know? Whereas you got, uh, Espana over here with not a lot of resources right now, just trying to pump out regularities in large numbers. And the main reason for that being he wants to deny these trading posts. He wants to get this trade route under control here. He does not want Chorizo pumping out a million shipments in age three. He does not want that to occur. Because if that occurs, I think uh Alucard could actually be defeated on Mendocino for a second week in a row. After Delay and delivered him the first upset last week, maybe Chorizo will do the same thing here this week. It's totally wholly possible. It's wholly totally possible. Hunting dogs coming in gonna help before the regular race since they are pretty ex yeah they are expensive they're about a hundred food you know standard muskets line infantry like only 75 food that's 25 extra comida to talk about
Here comes the Ascaris, the European trained infantry to rip apart the Regulares. Now, our guards got to be really careful because the Ascaris actually have more anti heavy infantry multipliers than standard skirms do. They actually have 2.5 instead of the usual 2. That combined with some bowmen here, it looks like Alucard is forced to accept this trade route to be Chorizo's for now. And what else are we seeing? We're seeing Impy being trained. Then we're going to probably see some uh, firebrands coming out to siege. Yeah, this is looking like a real mess if you're Alucard right now. Like, what do you do here? How much resources does Alucard have? Is the question. If he does, he have any food crates. Is he going to switch the food at all? Is he going to try to beat this in the capital age maybe with some assault cavalry or is he going to try to stick it out in this age? Because technically he is um, behind Chorizo because Chorizo is ahead in some of the units that he's going to be pumping out. So at this rate he's going to have to make sure one that these settlers do not get raided. Because that would be pretty sad wouldn't it? Yep, he's gonna uh, just barely uh, one arrow. What I thought the arrows were gonna kill him. He thought the arrow was gonna take an arrow right to the head, an arrowhead. <laughs> yeah, but at this rate, you can try to push a little bit this TC over here. But yeah, that one's gonna die. That one's gonna die. Stable going up. So you're kind of forced to go Hussars at this point alongside the Regulares, honestly. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, it seems like you don't want to push too far in with the Spearmen, though, because you want the range units to do the work a little bit. You know what I mean? You want the Skirmish. Because you're going to need those Spearmen to deal with any Hussars to queue their ways up. Queue their way up here, you know. But at the same time, it does look like he is cleaning his way through the regulares though, so that's good. Though, you know? That's definitely a good thing. Yeah, I mean, he, he is getting good casualties in there, so that's good. Get away with the Ascaris though if you're captain, you know. The Ascaris are like your key unit right now, so you can point the blues Bowman and Impy, but not the Ascaris since they're the most expensive unit, considering you don't... He doesn't have a gunpowder crawl yet, so... Yeah, he doesn't have any Ascari producing abilities yet. Well, this is good because he did keep him off of the hunts for a long time, and now he's going to be down on some more food since he had to invest in placer mines to boost his mining rate up. Yeah, I mean, at this rate, Teresa's looking pretty good because he has enough XP to get some more shipments across the finish line. Now you could also ship some more Ascaris in afterwards, so yeah, good good stuff overall, you know. Definitely think he's doing pretty well for himself at this moment. Going for another trading post, he could... Now wait a minute, no, the uh, African Explorers can't actually build TPs, only the Tradesmen can. That's right, only the Tradesmen can. Just one second away from building that. That is sad. That's a sad day for Trezo. Oh god, what now? Get the Hussars. Get the Hussars down. Get the Ascaris away from them. Well, yeah, yeah, get the MP. MP, MP, spear, spear, spear. Yep, alright. There we go, okay. Looking good again, alright. Looking good again. Get a tradesman and get this thing finished, man. This is, this looks kind of ugly to look at. Well, thankfully for him, the youth can actually train into mature into the tradesmen, so totally good. For those that don't know, Zulu don't actually train military units from buildings. They actually use something similar to the Zerg in StarCraft. They have these little little kids called youths, and they do a little dancing, little dance where they jump up and down. They turn into a adult male that you know kills villagers and stuff. You know? Very warrior-like culture. So, yeah. He can turn those into tradesmen if he wants to, so he can finish off this uh, trading post here. And militarily, he seems to be doing alright right now. He is 
doing some decent casualties to the Espana infantry. Okay, you gotta, yep, is he gonna get, no, 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 uh, spear trucker got him, yeah. Nice, uh, nice spear throw there. Is he gonna get that? Okay, um... Yeah, that one is going down. Is he gonna get that settler is a question. Yeah, that one's going down. Very good, very good. <laughs> very good. Absolutely good. Yep, get that regulari over there. Get that regulari over there. Yep, get that one. Hmm. Yeah, she, I mean, at this rate, I think Zulu has effectively cleaned house here because. I don't see uh, Alucard coming back from this real easily because he is down. How many settlers does he got? Like 33? Luckily he has a lot of them working over here away from the main action, but conceivably these clubmen... Let's see. How is... Uh, yeah, I don't think the clubmen can quite see these ones though. But does he know that those uh, animals are being hunted though? Nah, he actually doesn't even see this at all. It's completely black map for him. So he hasn't even gone fog of war there yet. So he doesn't know that there's a meat eating going on over there. Yep, Packety. Just looking for some raiding. He might find it on the way back though. If he does that, then I think Alcard is kind of dead at this point. Dead as a doornail if he loses all those settlers over there for free. Yep, Regulares coming in over there. What are these? Volunteers? Yeah, the Ranger, the Skirmish Unit. Yeah, he's just... Yeah, he's still bonking them, keeping them from doing a lot of economic work. Which is great, because that's really what you want to do right now, is Zulu. Yes, yeah, just keep making units at this rate. I mean, it doesn't matter what. You just need to make something to keep pressuring him. Wait. He does actually... He sees these because of the trading posts. That is not good, because now he knows about this going on, and you're exposed, buddy. You just expose yourself. You're going to get creamed over in this area, and you're going to lose, like, half your economy to this. Yeah, he knows that, and he's running like, I gotta skedaddle, I'm, I've lost that opportunity of eating. And he's gonna chase those down in pursuit. Let's, we'll see if he takes any casualties, because... Oh, he's got some working on this side, you know, he didn't take these ones. Oh, he sees him with the clubman, yeah, yeah, he knows, uh, uh, uh. He, he was probably idling over here, worried about this, and he didn't see that. So he's going to run the clubman out and try to find him. I mean, I don't think Chorizo could actually lose this at this point. He's basically won this outright. Just take the clubman around here. Start attacking the settlers down over here. Oh, attack the skirmishers first. Good. Then you can use these MP to attack them. Great. Yeah, that's great, actually. Yeah. Good work, okay. But you're not attacking anything, you're just sort of letting them run away. That's that's boring in the game. Oh, but then you can catch them over here. Yeah, that's good. That's very good, actually. Well, I mean, it's not that bad either way, because you are keeping him from working, you know, from gathering if he's running like that. So it's probably just as good as killing him at this point. And then you can obviously have these settlers just standing around waiting to be killed as they're eating all that meat up, all that carne. Oh yeah, yeah, fatality. Fatality. 
That is not good. Not good at all. Yep, and then get these regulars here. I mean, if you're Teresa, you're not you're not losing this because you just have more resources. You have a better economy at this point. You know, how many vills does he have? Like, um, thirty-one. Not bad. You know, he's probably just focused on applying deadly pressure at this point. He's not too worried about the eco. He is going to queue up some more bills though, which is great. He could ship in the firebrands, the bowmen. You still got card options to go with here. So yeah, you, you're, do, you're doing perfectly well in silver right now. A chorizo muy largo today. A chorizo muy muy largo. Nice, nice work. Nice work. Yeah, I mean, you got the settlers straggling over here, so they're gonna be picked up as well. Hmm. Good, good work. GG. Good work, Chorizo. Your Chorizo Muy Largo today. That's nice and juicy Chorizo. Alright. So, um,. Anyways, uh, let's look at the post-game, uh, resources, great, military, really phenomenal, got about the same amount of kills, but the numbers really mattered, 130 over 80. Yeah, and graphically, like, as soon as that, uh, Capital Age really took hold, you see this big jump in the Chorizo Zulu flame power here, and that's where everything started to go well. So yeah, good match, I mean... It's funny to see Alucard losing twice in a row on Mendocino to somebody. Mendocino is no longer his map, it looks like. Let's see if he comes back in the other match, you know, match two. Because here's the thing, sometimes people accidentally rec upload a third match. You know, when it's really just a duplicate of the other one, so... It, just because you see three matches in the recording thing here does not mean that there is a tiebreaker. We have to see for ourselves, with our own eyes and ears, if there will be a tiebreaker or not. That's the only way to know for sure. That's the only guaranteed way to figure that out, pretty much. Yeah. It's the only way we know. Only way we know. Plus Sigma, Atimos, Plus Sigma, Greeks, nice one, I like Greeks, good Civ, good Civ for this map too, especially, just plop the dock, use Crossing the landowner's game. investment to plop a dock down here, and then just do infinite fishing, because the dock will produce fishing ships for free, over time, like the Ottoman Town Series do with their villagers, so quite a powerful bonus, on the other side you got Bolivians, so, Alucard is probably very salty, losing to the Zulu, losing to the Chorizo Muy Largo today, so he's probably going to try some OP Juanita Boliviana rush with the Bolivians today, ideally with the Makayets. Yeah, this should be interesting. Should be very interesting. be nice to, well this is the Greek deck it looks like it's already available to see so we got settlers here we do have a bit of improvement to fishing here through the fish market card other than that crates really all the units like marauders sipes cleps and the trail phylax and eight streets or the same thing but we got some mountain artilleries here for anti building ship and siege we do get some torpedo boats, though, so a bit of counter water in here. Or maybe is that defensive water? And then in H4, you got more Choros. You got the infinite Marauders to make the home city useful into the late game. More Mountain Artilleries. And then, actually, Schneider Dangles Gun, which buffs up the Mountain Artillery attack and hit points. 
quite good, quite good stuff. As for the um, Bolivians here, they are going for a um, yeah war of the war of the Republicatas. This is definitely going to be a Republicate the Makaya build here. So the idea is build as many training posts as you can. And then each of those training posts will muster about three Republicate the Makaya natives. Which are sort of like a... Well, they're like a long-range infantry with a multiplier against shock units. So it really denies the Marauders any value. They're also decent against infantry since I think they got Pierce armor. If I'm not mistaken. And then after that, with all those free natives, then you just ship in a bunch of units. But looks like he doesn't have that here, so he's pro... It looks like he's going more in on, um, age 4, it looks like. Yeah, because we see the infinite Kearuna card here. We see the Dazas and the Francaterradores here, so it's looking more light gamey than usual. Maybe because Alucard is a macro pro, he doesn't feel the need to use unit shipments at all, and he can instead focus on economics. Oh, this is a pretty good card here. It improves your your Chelfliana, your Juanita Boliviana Explorer in combat, and lets them actually access the European style upgrades like Peerage and uh, Knighthood. I think it is. Yeah, the two ones you get from the capital, pretty much. I'm surprised you didn't get Mother's Day, though. Mother's Day um, will actually buff up the Explorer as well, and it also grants you a free shipment. Basically, upgrading your Explorer free of any shipping costs, because then you can send another shipment after that. So, yeah. Very interesting. Also, we see Sulpir Tax, which works good on trade routes. His trade posts are cheaper because he sent Mestizaje, which is the same thing as advanced trading posts, except it also increases the build limit of native warriors. Yeah, this is going to be kind of interesting to see Alucard's take on the whole Republicata rush build. You know, how different it truly really is from the one that Eternity uses. He will start out with the Croat natives. This is a good choice for this particular strategy because it grants you about 300 wood when it arrives. Almost like a core master, sort of. So you can effectively build about two more trading posts with that wood and still have 60 left over to work your way towards your fourth trading post. And we see it here, he's got shipments available so he can ship in some wood probably when he hits about that point where he could start with the salt pier tax how about um greeks yeah see they went with lascalina bobolina which is basically the uh, dark politician and any dark politicians that you research for greeks will actually increase the build limit of their fishing ships which they get for free Notice here how he's not paying any resources to get these fishing ships. And here he has about five of them working here, and he has two idling around over here. Effectively, he has about half of his fishing ship fleet already out on the water working for him. He's going to construct a barracks now with some wood behind that, so he can possibly build a stable and an artillery foundry, possibly, to make some mule artillery and marauders as needed. Because you never quite know what you're going to need against a Republicate to build. So he's actually going to build a native embassy here with uh, the Croatian colony. Assuming he gets this wagon out of that little hole here, this little ball neck. Right now he's surrounded by a bunch of crates. So he needs the Pongos to gather the resources around the wagon to be able to get out. Yep. Mm. 
Yeah, and then he's gonna plop a house down over here. The Croatian colony can finally begin construction. Yeah, what's going on here? Are you gonna build this one too? I guess this Juanita Boliviana wants to start up here with the Cree native Selma and then work his way down or across this giant arc here. Assuming he can do that. Well, he has started sending the Republicata card, the War of the Republicatas, because we do see the free Republicata McKay. It's already starting to arrive here along this whole route. Yep, here they come. Here they come. Yep, now he can start the siege on the statue before it boosts any military units up. Yep, good. Very good. And we do see Greeks over here going with Falas, Seifman, and Kleps. So, Pike and Shot, really. These guys being the skirmisher unit, the early skirmisher unit, and these guys being the uh, polearm unit. Alright, so now um, Alucard is going to buff up his uh, natives with this uh, card here, the native attack. Which is going to grant more stats to his Makayets and his Kaorunas here, the yellow soldiers. Also, he's going to start sending a mining camp wagon. Because uh, Alucard is going to start to boom a little bit by sending some mining wagons, some mining camps down. Mining camps are basically buildings you stick next to a silver mine like this, and it will produce pongos over time from it until it expires, because it lasts for only so many minutes. It usually produces about four villagers before going down, in groups of two. So it's quite useful for booming, as well as rushing, because remember, you can turn your villagers, the pongos, into these Kayarunas with your explorer using the Sarnas ability. So yeah, he could be doing that to boom, he could also be doing that to add pressure and to rush even further. Quite a powerful strategy to say the least. Marauders, interesting choice. If they get some rating in, that'd be pretty good since they're basically just Yuans, you know? They have low HP, high attack. They were designed right after the Yuans, since Yuans are no longer a standard unit you can train anymore. Yep, and this native force here is starting to apply some heavy pressure on the Gleeks. Can the Gleeks defend? Um, doesn't look like it. I mean, he's gonna need a lot of mule artillery to be able to defend against this, I think. From the looks of it. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, definitely. Oh, Here they come. Yeah, I mean, at this rate, it looks like. Um, oh, that name batch is definitely gonna beat him. Beat him to the punch. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely, for sure.
Hmm. Yeah, um... Oh boy, he just took down his uh, frontier weapon. <laughs> He's gonna take down the R1 too, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Yep. Ouch, that hurt. That hurt a big deal. That was painful. That was painful to watch because, um... You know, those are basically two towers, powerhouses they could have used to defend his base with, but he just lost them for free. That is just nasty to deal with. Nasty. Now he's going to send uh, Palenque. They have warriors trained much faster. So m maybe we'll see just Kayarunas, or possibly we could see Huron Mamplets add in as well. Totally a possibility. Totally a possibility here. I also don't know what I'm going to go with today in my matches. I have no idea. What's if I want to use it? Should be interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, it seems like these suppers are basically... These uh, peasants, I should say, are done for. Kleps, though, are going to be playing back a little bit with their anti-heavy infantry multipliers, but not too much. The only place where Greece is really dominating right now is the sea, because they got all these free fishing ships flying around and grabbing everything. Yeah, I mean, the only place Greece is uh, surviving is on the water, pretty much. That's pretty much it. <laughs> Does he have any more? Yeah, he has some bills over here. Here's a torpedo boat. At this point, since your land is basically ruined, the only place you can really defend at this point is on the water. So what is he going to do exactly? Is he going to start chopping wood up on this island? Is that what we're going to see? We're going to see an island construction here? An island construction. Oh my... He's going to actually build on the islands. Is this a madman? What does he think he's going to do up there? Is he that stubborn? Is he a, a, a very stubborn chorizo muy largo today? Like, wow. Very tenacious little chorizo today. Or a big chorizo, I should say. Wow. He's going to actually chop the trees on this island and actually fortify these islands. That is... I have never seen anyone actually do that before in the Liga. It looks like something I would do at a younger age against the AI, but he's actually doing it against an actual human Juanito Bonito opponent in the Liga game. He's actually going to build something on this island and probably age up with it, too. This is... I Here's the thing. When I saw the settlers moving towards the coast, the peasants, I initially thought of this, like, what if he decided to bore them into a boat and build on the islands here? What would happen? What would that look like? You know, because, yeah, I mean, that's really the only thing you can do, you know? It's really the only thing. He's going to build a town center on here. What? A town center? I would have probably put a tower house down and just um, built a barracks. Or something, like an artillery foundry and made some mule artillery out of it. If it was me, that's what I would have done. If it was my personal decision. And this is only possible due to Greeks. Only Greeks could do this type of mess. Only Greeks could do this. <laughs> like, seriously, like, if he wasn't Greece right now... He would not be able to pull this off because he just happens to have so many fishing ships deployed on the lake. That he's able to just float them around and grab all the 
marine assets. And then he's gonna just ship in the coin next. Yep, and then what after that? Um, I mean, he did he send any fishing ship upgrades yet? Because he could actually get some more fishing ships out before this dock. Yeah, the dock is kind of done for at this point, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I think that dock is just about done for at this rate. Yep, right into the water. <laughs> right into the water. He's gonna train sailors though from his uh, coastline. It looks like you're actually forcing Alcard to go out on the water. Wow, this is some desperate acts right here. Desperate acts calls for desperate measures. Desperate acts. Yeah, I mean, desperate calls calls for desperate measures, but you get the point. I mean, he's actually living on these weeny little islands here. These little, these tiny little islands. Enough to fit a couple houses and town centers. And he's gonna try to make a comeback from the islands. This has got to be for YouTube. I don't, I don't think he knows, he thinks he can win this. He's doing it for, to get me subscribers, probably. Or maybe get subscribers for him on Twitch. I don't know. Because he has, Chorizo has his own Twitch, by the way. Chorizo he's, he's a he's a Twitch live streamer now. So, it's totally possible he's doing this to get more views for his uh, Twitch channel. So, kind of interesting anyways, though. It really is. <laughs> yeah, this, this is, this is um, something completely new to me. Something... And here comes the canoes, though. The canoes are coming out. Here comes the canoes. Does he have another torpedo boat that he can... Unfortunately, he does not. And what's Alucard going to do? Is he just going to spam out a lot of canoes? Yeah, he's going to go full pop canoes with all three to four native sites. Oh, he's... What's... Oh, he sent the Croatian Falkuza boat from the Croats. See, you only get access to these special red-sailed ships when you age up with the Croats. So he actually went with the second Croat age up just to get access to the Falkuzas. So he could use an additional warship to attack his islands with. And what he could do actually, he could train some mourner sailors, the Croatian immigrant sailors, to land onto this island here and then throw them onto here to help siege the TC down. Which would probably be safer to do than throwing your ships at it. And here comes the army of Pro Stigma sailors. Ready to go their way south into the Bolivian base. Lots of Pro Stigmas. Lots of Fulames, lots of Malestas. A Gleek Dark is going down over here. But you still got this Valkuza to deal with as well as some canoes here. Fortunately, he didn't... Yeah, Alcar did not do a lot of HP damage to this TC, it looks like. Still seems to be holding on pretty strongly. Yeah, seems like it. It definitely seems like it. Yeah, is he gonna... Yep, he's gonna come up with the Valkuza again and try to attack this TC. Oh, he's gonna put his Kearunas in there. Good, good, good move. Um, and then you just have to put these on to siege. I mean, siege isn't the best, but it's not the worst. About 25 siege per unit. So they'll get that TC down in relative decent time. How about the sailors, though? What are the sailors gonna accomplish? Like, I see the sailors marching in right over here. And then he's gonna be able to shoot stuff one by one over here. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Um, yep, take out uh, that pongo, then that pongo, and then that pongo, 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 pingo, pongo. Yeah, that. Yeah, the, the sailors here are actually doing pretty good. They're gonna. They might even take down a TC, which would be kind of funny. Kind of a troll move on Chorizo Moy Lago's part.
Yeah, here comes the town sir going down. Comes the TC going down. Oh! Wow! Wow! You're living on little islands and you somehow burned down a town center on the mainland. That's dedication. This will. This is definitely to get the Chorizo Zarate some, uh. some, uh, Twitch subscribers. He's gonna make a lot of money from this, man. He's gonna be a rich man now. Good, good luck, Juanito. You're gonna definitely have some, uh, good money coming into your Twitch after doing this type of thing. I guarantee you that he doubled subscribers after doing this little charade. Look at that. Yeah. First you beat beat Alcar in the first match and then the second one you do this type of stuff. This is Wow, look at this. Sailors are still alive, they can actually kite these here on these Wendats if they wanted to, but I guess he called it quits at this point, you know. That was fun to watch though, you know. It doesn't matter that you were outplayed a lot by the strategy, you just made it into something fun that we can remember now. So good job with that, you know. You will always remember Chorizo Moy Largo as the one that builds on the Little Islands in Hudson Bay. No one else in the league has done that but you. You, sir, have done this. You have set a new standard for the competitive world scene to live up to now. So, good job with that, you know. Hope you're proud of yourself, because we're hopefully see a lot more people do that type of stuff. Yeah, hopefully. Um... Yep, now we can move on to the core games, and we can see, um... Match number three on Jebba Musa, the tiebreaker. Question is, who will be broken first? We'll see. We'll see who's broken first. This should be a good one. Very good one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um... We got Chorizo with the Paraguayans, probably looking to play it safe. Um... Alucard has the Germans, Germany. I hope, um, I really hope that Chorizo can win this. Because, um, you remember when I did this matchup, right, with Jeff? I got completely handed to me by, um, Germany. Yeah, let's see if Chorizo can think of a better build than I did when I was playing against Jeff when he was German, so maybe Chorizo will prove that um, Paraguay can beat the Germans, potentially, you know, because the last couple of times I've tried it, it just not hit, it just doesn't work, you know, it's like they carried the same curse they had against the British when they were the house booming civ, and, you know, Paraguay could never beat the British because of their red code, so even though the civs have changed and the Rosses have changed, with who does the house booming, it just seems like house booming civs kills Paraguay. At least from what I've seen so far. But we'll see though, I mean, just because it happens to me doesn't mean it'll happen to Chorizo. Chorizo starting out with Mendoza's cereal mills, a nice food works to trickle him some food. About um, 180 food it looks like. Yep, and it'll go up a little bit more if he stands his explorer next to it. Not this one, the, um, this one right here. Okay. Benjamin Acevel. Alright, and then he's gonna ship in the woodworks, so he's gonna have a bit of wood trickle going on from that works as well. I think the key with being in Germany with Paraguayans is getting your economy figured out really early on. With how many works you're going to need, getting the upgrades for them in time, and deciding when you're going to go for that capital age and start pushing out the Coheed rockets. Because Germany unfortunately has a lot of strong units. They got strong line infantry, they got strong hussars, they got strong cuirassiers, they got free artillery. They can produce land worn from train posts for free with the Hanseatic League. So what is the Germany deck going to even be here? So we see Frankfurt Trade Fair. This is like the comp, this is the OP choice. We've seen it in action previously with Cerbero today. Now Alucard's going to do it. In terms of other cards, we see Lion Infantry, some crates. We see uh, 
food food economy cards here. We see Bismarck model and the RD text, so possibly some Land Warren units being used a little bit later, especially in the form of this muster right here. Because essentially what you can do in the late game is you can use these muster cards, which are infinite by the way, to muster a certain group of Landwehr infantry or cavalry from every readout as well as telegraph trooper you have on the field. Then essentially it serves you infinite units pretty much. Hmm. Yep, we're gonna start seeing those market techs fly in since they're free now for the Germans. Whereas Paraguay's gonna be thinking about aging up now. So what exactly? We'll see. I think it'll be the French wave, I'm pretty sure of that. Yep, French wave. Grants you some XP crates. The bakery card is quite good because when you combine it with Hemeroteca. Basically, you can get an easy three food works in age. Um, actually, four four food works in age too, which is really good because you start out with the bill limit of two food works, and then you get three in age two. But with Hemeroteca, it goes up plus one. So you combine that with the bakery's card to the French immigrants in age two, and you can get four food works. It's quite quite good for spamming Pardos, and does help against the other units too, like the uh, Primero de Lignes or the Akiyabotai um, trash units they get for free that you can also train. As for Alucard, he's looking at the Statesman. So this will grant him some coin and a redoubt wagon, which will definitely help with doing musters later on since this is basically the same thing as the Governor General in Vanilla. Yep, about just finished researching his last uh, Age 1 market technology, and then as soon as you see Age 2 coming in, you're going to see Steel Traps, Amalgamation, and Log Flume coming out right away from his market, because they're all free. And then upon Age 3, you'll see Circular Saw coming out right away. We got the explorer up here working on the smuggler. Oh, nice, nice work. Nice work indeed. wood it looks like so definitely doubling up on the uh, wood shipments that'll definitely help with manor booming with its mites carrying houses because each of these houses will produce one free settler quite useful for economics Yeah, at this point, um, Paraguay has, what is that, about, um, two food works 
going. They got the, uh, yep. And they also got coin works. They got wood works, so economically Paraguay is looking pretty good right now, you know? Definitely doing a good job for themselves. Very good job. And we also see two barracks up producing free Primero de Lines. These are basically like the Machetro, so like in a for the salt unit, but a lot weaker. A lot weaker than that. I still got the same amount of splash, which is pretty good. Yeah, mostly house booming for the uh, Germans. I do see some Freischelers up here, which are their pikemen unit. A little bit different than the standard pike unit since their multipliers and attack or work a bit differently as well as their resource costs. What are they doing resource wise? I mean. Could they conceivably go capital aid soon? Possibly, they just need to ship in that 700 coin, I think, and they could reach it pretty easily. If it was me? Yeah, I think so. Definitely. But what do we see here? Um, we see the Royal Decree coming in, Berlin Conference. So maybe we're seeing a shift to land warring units in age 3 once um, the Bismarck model is sent. Definitely possible. Or we're going to see a fast industrial so he can start mustering them from his redoubts. Right now though it seems to be just be manor booming until he gets his vill pop out. Then he can start thinking about plopping down towers and really tapping into the um, muster units. He definitely has the food for a capital age right now. But the coin, not quite yet. He's often just for the Fresslers right now because he knows that the trash units that Paraguay produces are both shock units. Thus these uh, pole arms are pretty good in both cases against those. Yeah, let's see him, uh... He can, uh... Yeah, now nah, he's gonna hang out in the back there for now. Did they get any kills? Well... Looks like, um, yeah, I got some kills out of that. We might even get an Escapatero out of this. Maybe, maybe not, no. Well, he did actually do quite a bit of damage to him, though. Which is the most important thing. And I mean, he's throwing his opponent out. Look, who wins, I think, determines on if Alucard makes it to Industrial Age to start mustering stuff. Or if Paraguay can pull off a quick siege before that, it really makes a big difference here. Yep, see, they're also going to Capoid, so... If he can get his Coquit rockets going in time, that might be enough to deal with the Landwehr infantry spam that's going to be mustering out of those towers. Yeah, that might be the key for... Chorizo to actually pull a major upset here and win a 2 and one against Alucard. Definitely, definitely. He needs some more houses though, because he really wants to get a lot more trash units out than he already has. At this point. Might take some of your Kuegwas over to wood, possibly. Just so you can slowly build up your number of houses. I mean, just still. No, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Everything, I think, that determines the victor here is going to take place in the next couple of minutes. Like, yeah. Alucard, yeah, he's just slightly ahead, heading towards the capital age. 
He's gonna spam a bunch of towers there, which inevitably they have multipliers against shock units, which is gonna be really annoying. So I think at this raid, if Trezo's gonna be pushing, it's kind of fine, his house numbers, because he's just gonna lose some of those shock units anyways, to be able to replenish them. Yep, yeah, but now we're gonna see a shipment of a coin, like this, and then he's gonna hit industrial age. Well, no, he's actually gonna go for the uh, Bismarck model now, and then he's also gonna send Will Politic, which lets you train the landware infantry and cavalry from your barracks and stable, respectively, but they do become more expensive the more you have on the field. So think of like the old Australia anti bonus, where units were more expensive the more of them you had. That's now a thing with this technology. And what uh, Bismarck Mole does, it makes sure that the Land Warren don't lose any more HP. You know, see, since Land War Infantry and Cavalry are technically emergency units like the Minutemen, they do lose HP over time. But if you send this card over here, they no longer lose that HP anymore. Yep, and here comes the Industrial Age with the Social Light. This will grant him about 800 to 900 coin, which he can then use to upgrade stuff. He's already starting to tech into the veteran landmore infantry. And conceivably, once he gets the Social Light down in age 4, he'll be able to upgrade him to guard landmore infantry. Also starting to ship in the um, Essence style work to get a croup factory, so you can start pumping out some foot artillery as well. Yo, so he's gonna trees. Oh, good idea. Build a fort. You're gonna need it. You're gonna need a fort if he's gonna do a lot of land more infantry. Certainly doesn't help out on this flank. He could probably could have put it more in the central point here, but whatever, whatever floats your boat, I guess. Yeah, next we're going to want to send this, fund, Fundaciones, to get some Coheed Rockets. Right. 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 Yep, just as I predicted, he's going to send the Heavy Works building to his base so he can start producing the rockets, the heavy artillery pieces he's going to need to defend this. Because he either needs to attack really well or he's going to need to defend really well to survive this next uh, step from Alucard. So he's even starting to train some of the land in himself. Is that right? And as soon as he hits the shipment, I guarantee you we're going to see um, this muster take place over here. And that's effectively going to create about... How many? Um, about 28 land war infantry with each shipment. Which is kind of insane, considering they have siege unit multipliers. Which makes them good against yeah. grenadiers, basically. And they actually don't have any infantry tag besides the standard infantry tag. So, skirmishers, as well as things like... Um, yeah, skirmishers don't do any multipliers against them. Anti-skirmishers don't do any multipliers against them. So, yeah, the, basically these uh, Akayabotai cavalry with their anti-skirmisher multiplier unit actually won't deal any bonus damage against these guys. It's just kind of insane. And as you see right here, now we see guard land more infantry coming in. We also see all three coop factories working on steel guns since the Essence style work lets you produce uh, steel guns, the heavy artillery unit from these. Also Judaism. The Kabbal has just begun it looks like. So if you can't win with steel guns and land or infantry maybe your Kabbal will let you win. Let's go. Let's see how this goes. Hmm. Oh, 
Oh, he produced those from the redoubts from the musters, yeah. Because each um, redoubt you build comes with the Landwehr Infantry Levy and the Landwehr Cavalry Levy. Once you send them, you can't send them again, but in general, he was able to use that to buff his numbers up to about 42 of the units. Yeah, unfortunately, yep, Teresa's probably doing this just to get more XP, I think. Because he really is going to need a lot of XP to deal with this type of an attack. How is his rocket numbers doing right now? See? About two rockets only. Yeah, you're going to need more of your rockets to, to keep up with this, I think. Get a house up, hopefully, before, um, yeah. Well, he'll get one. Good. Because he's going to need more than two rockets to handle this, I think. Any at least three or f actually all ten rockets, really. Celso, has he even upgraded any of these guys yet? Nah, you're gonna want to upgrade these too. You're gonna need to upgrade the stats on these uh, shock units. Now we send Himero Tekka. Sieging on the barracks next. Had the seal guns arrived yet? So he has about. Alucard has about. One steel gun so far. He still has to wait for the iron ones to come in though. Then he'll have about three of them, which would be much better. Oh, now he's on the diaspora, so he's gonna get a bunch of uh, free supplers from that. A bunch of supplers with big noses. Here they come. Oy vey, that's a lot of settlers. Yep. Bereit. Thirteen settlers, yeah, that's pretty good technology. Yeah, quite good. Judaism has always historically had good technologies in Wars of Liberty. The Yom Kippur being the best one, it basically makes the units 50% cheaper in food, but it adds a faith cost to them. Yeah, Judaism is one of the few religions in Wars of Liberty that's still viable, I would say, for sure. And, um, yep, here comes a muster right now. So what this muster is going to do is it's going to produce four land war infantry from each of the towers here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at that. <laughs> oh, boy. Look at... Look at the splash on those Primero de Nines coming in to factor in. Um, well, he lost the rockets, so he does need to kill the steel gun. Yeah, he's got to steal, kill the steel gun. Is he? He's not targeting the steel gun, which is totally just wrecking him right now. That's just not good. You can't do that. You gotta kill the steel guns, man. You gotta kill the steel guns. Well, actually, first thing you gotta do is you gotta get some artillery out. Like, you need to save this rocket. You need to get some more rockets down here. And then when you get enough rockets, you might be able to go in for a real push. Is this... Yeah, this is in... Yep, this is in limber mode, so it's... Why is it taking so long, though? Like, jeez, these uh, guard land war infantry are gonna actually snipe this rocket down. Not good. Not good at all. Not good to send at all. Nope. Not at all. Not that good. <laughs> yeah.
Yep. Very good. Very, very good. Yeah, I mean, this is this is basically what I did to Sog, but I was on this side of the map of Germany. He tried to attack me, and I had all these land war infantry lined up to deal with them. And when he came in, he didn't know what to do basically because it was just a total lot of spam and stuff. Yeah, yeah, big time. Definitely was not ready for it. That's for sure. Yeah, that's that's too bad. <laughs> too bad indeed. Now Trezor is starting to get the Coheed rockets trained from the heavy ones, but is it gonna be enough? I don't know. I don't know, man. You got Valcard has like uh, almost definitely more than double, like going towards triple the score that you do. Triple the score. Yeah, I mean, this is not looking good, sir, at all. Yeah, that's... That's not good. Yeah, that's now that you have like five of the rockets, see this is what you needed before when you were doing the initial course. Like you could have killed the steel guns in one hit and then you Yeah, then you would have been able to kill the land warriors. But now now that you don't have a lot of them, now you're kind of in the bad place right now. Yeah. Because apparently the good thing about these rockets is they just have a generally good crush attack and splash, so it doesn't matter if what the multipliers are, they're still going to do relatively well with what they shoot at. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the rockets seem to be doing somewhat alright here. So yeah, that's what you know you would need to do. Imagine if he had like double the rockets right now, he had the full 10 rocket build limit going. That would have been perfect for him. We've had everything we needed. Yep. Well, you gotta be careful with um, the units you make, you know? would have done a bit of market train before and got like 10 of those green rockets. I think he would have been able to shell his way through the land more infantry a lot easier. He's trying to use some uh, artisanal cans as well, it looks like. I mean, that would have been another good option too, you know? Because they obviously have anti-infantry multipliers, which would actually penetrate through these land more infantry. As well as the crush damage, you know? would have negated their armor. Well, you would negate their armor anyways from range no matter what, but still, you know what I mean. You gotta make sure you build enough artillery when you're dealing with this type of a strategy from Germany. That's all you can do. All that you could possibly do. Yeah, I mean, GG, GG, 
GG, uh, Trezo Moilago. I think in general, though, this was a pretty good, uh, encounter. You know what I mean? Whenever you can see a tiebreaker match, that means that the car was really well done, usually. And I think, uh, the first build that Trezo did with the Zulu was very spot on. And then, um... His second game, even though he did die, he did have a funny way of uh, dying. You know, he obviously went onto the islands and built the sailors and actually managed to burn a town center down. So that was that was very impressive work. Very impressive work. See, this is the problem with Germany. When you have the Frankfurt Trade Fair, you effectively end up with like double the resources by the end of the game, which is unreal. You know? And with just a bunch of free units without a, any tag but infantry effectively killed all of this. And seeds all of this. Yeah. That's about it, really. I mean, so much more to it. Yeah, look at this graph. Just, just insane stuff. <laughs> really, really is. <laughs> All right, we'll move on to the next encounter right now. All right, let's keep going. So next encounter will be Jeff versus Darkus. Let's see if Darkus could somehow conquer Jeff. That would be hilarious, wouldn't it? <laughs> It'd be the the the, in, the uh, encounter of the series of the uh, universe if he did that. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see though. I mean, let's get the fog of war going. Already on this side, we got. Uh, Darkus with the Espanians, and then we got Jeff up here with the Koreans. Yeah, interesting civs, you know. I like Koreans. They're kind of my favorite Asian civ in Mords of Liberty, honestly. You know, maybe even more than Indians, who knows, you know. Cool thing about Koreans is they're great at booming with their villagers. They got some fun units to play around with, and uh, oh, it's overall a good time to play as Korea. Definitely fun civ to use. Never get tired of playing Korea, honestly. That's why I'm really excited for them to make more Asian civs in the future. Because that would definitely be cool to see way more civs and see what wonders they get. And But I do understand that Asian civs are the hardest to, to mod in Wars of Liberty because um, of the wonders you have to build, of all the unique cards you have to make, all the unique units you have to plan for them, all the features you have to plan for them. It's, it's not easy, and I get that, but... Definitely want to see some more Asian civs coming out, just like these Koreans. Yeah, basically their houses look almost like shrines when they start out, and then as the match progresses, you notice that the textures of the Korean houses is far different from that of the Japanese. You know, they have much more of like a greenish, I guess, tint to their buildings. Something like that. Whereas the Spanish here, we've already seen them under uh, Alucard. So, yeah, they basically work the same way as Vanilla, just with um, different year roster pretty much, for the most part. Now, this is interesting. Instead of Settlers, he's using Cords of Wood. Huh? Why the wood? What's up with this? What is he doing? You, want, you, you really need this first, and if you want to send some wood after, fine, but you really need this one first. You really do need the three settlers. Yeah, you definitely need the three settlers. I don't know what you're doing with that. Now, this on the other hand, trade empire instead of the three villagers. That's more manageable because it gives you a trade... a trading post rickshaw that you can build a TP down on. It also invokes more HP for trading posts and also make some cheaper in wood as well so it's almost like advanced TP but take out the range attack and replace it with the rickshaw pretty much so yeah it's it's reasonable you know you can definitely use it to great extent it 
definitely use it to great extent. Yep, and now we see the uh, three villages being shipped in for the Koreans, so he's going double cards in age one, it looks like. I'm curious what wonder he's going to go with, you know. Koreans, you got a little bit more flexibility with the wonders you pick. You can either go for the Pyong Hall, I think, or you can go with the uh, Grand Palace, usually. You could actually go with the Hacienda Temple as well, if you really want technologies, so really up to you what you go with, I think. What your preference is. One problem with Hacienda Temple now is that religion is kind of bad, so giving us, like, faith is probably not too good. Always oh, gonna go with the Hwaseong Fortress. This is another good option for a wonder starting out with. Think of this as like an Agra Fort, but basically, instead of training infantry at the start, it trains artillery units. Yeah, and it doesn't train anything else at all, just artillery. So you can make huachas, you can make the chongtongs, and you can make the um, fire cow from it. It's also a, kind of works in tandem with the castles. You know, yeah. the castle building, the, the Asian towers, when you upgrade the castles. It also upgrades the Hwasung Fortress and vice versa, so they do use the same technologies between the two. Making it a bit more discount to upgrade. Let's see what uh, Spain does now that they're in age, um, age 2 now. So we see them moving more towards um, building on a frontier wagon up here. So it looks like he went with the statesman, actually. This is the governor general style politician for his age up. He's going to start by shipping some Pizzateros mercenaries. The Pizzateros are basically a mercenary skirmisher unit. And he's going to combine that with 700 food. So it's looking like maybe aggression from Spain today. And I wonder what Korea is going to do. Korea could inevitably do the same thing because, you know, they'll have this defensive fort to protect them and then they can put the barracks around here. Also, when you get the Hua Seong Fortress, you get free Yumi, well, not Yumi, but these are Myung Yungs. These are basically a Korean style of archer. Not much, well, here's the thing. I think they actually got reworked for the Great War Patch. They were reworked to be treated as an early skirmisher instead of a later game skirmisher so they actually have shorter range and different multipliers now which works in both directions i guess that means that the myung youngs will actually do better against like shock units now but against everything else they'll be slightly weaker also means that they're cheaper now as well that will be cheaper in resources Alright, and now he's going to build the Grand Palace to start booming a bit with some free villagers. Since the Grand Palace produces free villagers and also has access to the level 1 uh, 
market technologies from Europe for double the price, so double price hunting dogs, placer mines, gang saw, as well as the blunderbuss and the um, great coat. This might um, inevitably put Korea ahead of the Spanish, but we'll see how good these Pizzateros do in raiding. Yeah, it'll have to be seen. Can he get... Yep, we can kill one. So this is actually enough units to instant kill stuff in one shot, right? Yeah. Get another one. Yep. Very good. And then he can get another unit. Yep. And then he can kill this one here. Oh. Just barely... He just barely got out with that one. What does he do now, though? Does he try to retreat... I don't know at this point, like, he's gonna try to sneak up around here. Oh, he killed the one that it was low HP, yeah, that's too bad. It's nice that he's keeping him distracted, though, and keeping him from gathering a lot, because you can see right here his food and his coin is rather low. And he's gonna do rushing, it looks like, with Regulares. And he also shipped in some Infante de Menina to aid with their crush attack. Could, yeah, he could chip in some more regulars if he needs to. He's also got another food crate. I'm just worried, without any coin crate, how would this uh, Spanish deck get you out of the Second Age and into the Capital Age? You know, to access some of your later cards, like your foot artilleries, like your bigger group of Pizzetaros, or your regulars. Like, how do you deal with that? Vice royalties? Um, why? Why do you need this? Like, put in a shipment of Curacaos, I think. That would probably be the way to go. Like, three Curacaos. Pretty solid, I think. Scaling around with the Parzans, it looks like. The little pikemen. Gang hunting dogs, too, for his food eco. Yeah, looking good. How about Jeff? So he's gonna start training some dang spearmen. Spearmen are pretty good, you know, they got good siege, they're pretty good against uh, shock units. So if that's usually a pretty good star unit. He also shipped uh, three huaches, it looks like. Yeah, three huaches. Two huaches. Wait a minute, he trained a huacha and he shipped some huaches. Brutal. You. Oh my, look at that, he just killed that whole Pizzetro ship and a couple of barrages of those flaming arrows. Yep. You gotta watch out for those things, the flatches are not to be trifled with. Not in the least. Yeah, I just don't know what you're going to do with these Parzans. Are you going to try to go for the houses, maybe? Yeah, maybe the market. Like, if you could see the building down or two with them, that would definitely grant you some XP. Then again, you send the emergency units in to chase those away at this point, so... I don't know what you're going to do. 
Oh yeah, he made he made doggos. Lots of doggos. Lots of pillows. These pillows are not to be messed with. They're pretty tanky since they don't have any real tags, and therefore no way to really multiplayer do a lot of multipliers against them. So. Yeah, they can be pretty messy, and they can actually mess up your hoatches if they get close. They're biting. They're epic teeth that can rip apart pieces of wood and artillery. Why are the dogs and the uh, pikemen up here? We should really be um, regrouping with these. Ah, that's a lot of barrages of flaming arrows, man. Look at that TP go down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Pretty decent barrage there. Yep, what's what's the barrage go down to these uh, watches? Yeah, that's quite a bit of damage actually. I like too how they do a bit of splash, like you know, some of the barrage there was actually hit to the side here in the house. That's a neat little effect. Yeah, it's, you see, some of the barrage is actually hits in the back and hits the towers, which is also pretty neat. Or is it targeting the tower? Yeah, he's targeting the tower. But. As you can see right here, the Watches are going to clean this up really easily because these barrages of arrows, not many things can survive against them. Yep. And then, of course, the Dang Pospiramen can also siege really well. I don't know what these young Yungs are really going to do since we don't see any Corsairs on the field for them to really take advantage of the fight. Yeah, I just like watching these things barrage like that. One of the coolest artillery units in the game, I would say, besides like the stone throws and some of the Maori stuff. I also like the design of the Chinese Long Dragon too. It's a pretty neat looking piece of artillery. Yep, just scan the TC and you should be good. Oh, Chong Tongs. Yeah, the Chong Tongs are nice too. They're like the uh, Korean Covern units. And they look a lot more like the Flaming Arrows of Japan. They're good against buildings, artillery, and ships. So, a wide variety of things. And they're a good support unit you know, to have with your Hoatches, usually. Yeah, the, I mean, these Huetzas are unbeing right now. They're just clawing their way through these uh, Spanish buildings like it's nothing. There's really nothing Spain can do. How much resources does Spain even have at this point? Like, yeah, they actually do have the resources to go for a Capital Age push, but they just don't have the wood. And who knows if they can get the wood, get the TC up in time before the Huetzas arrive. Yeah, it's a pretty scary situation to say the least.
Yep. Looking pretty good as Korea right now. Very, very good. I just don't know why Spain's holding on at this point. It just doesn't look too hopeful for him. Sorry, I mean, you got the resources to do some stuff, but um, you're going to have to do some crazy maneuvers with your settlers to build a decent army to deal with this. Like, you, if he, if uh, Spain made, like, 20 Hussars right now or something like that, crazy amount of stuff, I think he could actually clean this army up and, like, no problem at all. You know, the spearmen won't even be an issue at that point. But, yeah, then he has more spearmen, so I don't know, like, why are you still in this match if you know you can't beat this out? Oh, he is actually going to go for a capital age push with um, the political exile, so it's the fast age up. And then with that, he can ship in some foot artilleries as well as some pizzateros and maybe try to make a bit of a comeback story, perhaps. Yep, just garrison the TC and then ship some stuff in. Yep, ship in foot artillery. Foot artillery ship. Yep, here comes the Infante de Menina first. Probably to clean up the watches and then he can send the foot artillery to deal with the infantry. But Looking at this mass right now, can the TC su survive long enough to receive the shipment? I don't think that it can. Look at look at all those fiery, fiery bolts coming out of the those corals. Disgusting. Nasty if you're Spain, but neat if you're Korea. Yeah, GG. Good job, Korea. That was a that was a nice fire firework display of watches. Can't say much for Spain in that one. I don't know what Spain was doing that old game. Like, yeah, resources were down, like, barely any units. Yeah, I just can't tell what was going on that game with Spain. I don't know what Spain was playing for. Howdy, I just found out that um, we got some visitors today from uh, ESOC TV. That's pretty neat. Welcome, everyone, you know. Sorry for the late response. Um, I was trying to go through a match there and didn't notice anybody came in. I'm going to try to work on getting a chat widget add in so I can see the chat while I'm playing. So, yeah, hope you're fully you enjoyed this um, showcase of Wars of Liberty matches. We got quite a few of them to continue. You know, I think we got about 15 matches total today. About five more of them to go. So you can catch up and see um, the end of the encounter for Darkus, I believe, as well as. Um, yeah, we got the Darkus encounter with Jeff, and then we got, I think, Rommel, which we haven't seen in a long time, and then we got one more after that. So. Good stuff. Good stuff overall. Good stuff overall. Um, Alright, so let's go into record games. And basically, for those that haven't seen these matches before, the rules are pretty simple. We do best out of uh, three. If, for instance, somebody beats somebody again, we go to a third map here. And the maps are pretty standard as well. We go from... Uh, Start out on Mendocino, and then we go on to Hudson Bay, and then we finish off in Jebel Musa. That's the standard maps. Reasoning for those maps is because we used to have an issue with hurtables, buffing up units during the recording process, which, you know, that's a broken bug that destroys the balance of the game and is unfair, so we had to pick maps that didn't have animals on them. You know, sheep and cows and stuff, so those three maps work pretty well. Anyways, We'll move on now. We just finished up Jeff and Darkus, and uh, we're going to do their second match now, and then we can see uh, GMP and Eternity, and then Kaiser and Rommel. We haven't, I haven't seen Rommel play in the Liga in a long time, so that's going to be pretty fun to see how he does after such a long time. Yeah, he's been pretty busy lately, so it's good to see him getting back into the competitive wool scene.
Yep, and um, all right. So we got Toopy. I like this Civ. They're pretty fun, you know. They're what you would imagine the Toopy to be, you know, like a heavy native Civ that um does a lot of uh, a lot of raiding. The thing about the Toopy is, once they reach their uh, veteran upgrade, they can actually make their units stealthy. Right, so they can make their archers stealthy, their clubmen stealthy, their uh, their like pike style units stealthy, as well as their blowgunner stealthy. So they're really good at sneaking up on you and attacking you, and they're also good at rushing because they're really good at natural resource gathering. And probably the most important detail of Tupi of all is is um they don't know what this is this uh, silver they don't acknowledge what money is so they don't actually gather coin at all and therefore nothing costs coin for them they just live on food and wood there are two resources literally almost like age of mythology without the fav oh no not like age of mythology like some of the um nintendo tiles of aoe sort of but for um Darkus here he's canadians so he's really going to be tapping into a lot of wood here. They love to collect wood. In fact, all the Canadian Ajeps replace their food costs with wood. And then you get these wonderful little log cabins here that uh, trickle wood. About 0.2 per uh, cabin. And so effectively you can trickle up to 4 wood per second if you max out their build limit. Which a lot of people do just to build walls of these uh, houses. And the great thing about all Canadian buildings is, is when you construct a Canadian building, they produce uh, free maple trees around them. Trees spawned by a Canadian build and harvest for wood. So yeah, these can actually aid in walling up your base pretty good. So yeah, these are actually two very old civs in Wars of Liberty too. Both of these civs came out um, before the initial Wars of Liberty civ release, back in the days when the mob was called War of the Triple Lions. So, yeah, very old stuff, very old. But at least they got a little bit of touch-up work. Canadians got technically a new unit in Age Two for the French Canadian faction, so things are a little bit different for them. Let's go over the deck super duper quickly. So we got two fur traders. Here we also got um, two team pioneers. And by the way, anyone that's uh, in the stream right now, you can actually check out the VOD for this on Unstoppable Stiletsi YouTube channel. After um, I think I have it on my have it on my Twitch there. You can check out the channel there to see other content as well. I always record this for the YouTube to get people to go in on there and watch it. But back to the deck here. This deck looks, um, I've seen, uh, Darkus go with this deck before. He really doesn't do a lot of unit cards for some reason. He really should have, uh, Light Cavalry, Militia, and, um, his factional card. Like this one. You see this one here? It sends either seven Fencibles or seven Metis Rebels. Basically, the unit you receive depends on the faction that you send. Or the faction that you age up with. For Canada, you get two factions. You got um, the French Canadians and you get New England, or the basically the British Canadians. And they all come with their own sets of units with different properties. The Canadian units technically have better hand attacks. The Canadian units, for the British side, you know, they're better at attacking at longer range. So They generally follow a certain type of theme. And each politician has their own unique technology as well. So, factional civs that we call Anglophonies, which encompasses United States, Canada, and Australia, all get their own unique technologies. As for Tupi, we can look at their deck really quickly. Um, basically, well, this is... I have, I'm trying to remember if I've seen Jeff play Tupi before, but... It looks like he has a lot of economic cards, you know. These two here for the quinoa and the potatoes. This is for the farms, the Akas. Which is a special, like, farming and building that the Tupi have. That kind of combines a house with a mill. 
And then over here, you got about um, two cards here for wood. Yeah, two cards for wood. This one also benefits wood gathering. Also, you got um, the one unit shipment here, 15 Renegade Brazilians. Basically, this will send 15 Voluntario de Patria, which is a Brazilian sort of skirmisher unit that they get access to. It's actually not too dissimilar from the Renegade Spanish cards that um, you see with the Aztecs that send the Rodelros. So think of it sort of the same way as that in D. The way I think this is going to go is, is um, we're probably going to see a lot of uh, Archer, Polearm, and uh, Clubman spamming from the Tupi. That's going to directly pressure the Canadians into defeat. Because I just don't see a lot of unit shipments on the Canadian side to keep themselves sustained here. You know, Canada, if they want to do one versus one, they need a lot of unit shipments to facilitate their early game. And I just don't see it right now. I just see the Spontooners, which is, you know, a pikeman unit for them in that deck. And therefore, I think Tupi are going to have a real field day here ripping through them. They're starting to get the hunting dogs technology here tracking. Since they don't have any coin, uh, tracking basically just costs about 100 wood. It's also shared with the other South American native civs, namely the Mapuche and the Incas, which will eventually be changed to the Quechuas. So yeah, they all use sort of the same market technologies overall. Big difference being, Tupi don't get the second, uh, market technology for hunting since that one costs coin called the hunting boas so only mapuche and inca can get that and we'll see here what sorts of strategy the tupi go with now um copper axe is coming in that's the first chopping upgrade also we gotta check what canada is doing so a quick way to find out what faction you are with is Canada is just check the card. It says it will... Oh, actually, no, it doesn't say it here. It doesn't say it, what it's going to deliver. Because normally, I, with some of the other cards, it'll tell you, okay, it's going to deliver you seven metas or seven fencibles, and then you can tell what faction you're going to get. But in general, I feel like we're going to know if he went with French Canadians very quickly. Because he's, yep, he's got Troupas de la Maline. This is a French-Canadian H2 unit. If he would have went with the British faction, he would have had Fencibles, which is a grenade-throwing unit. It's a grenadier. And for those that are new to Wars of Liberty, I must explain how grenadiers work in this game. So, the grenadiers are actually like a alternative version of the musketeer. Instead of having a bayonet to combat cavalry, though, they get a charge attack. That charge attack is a grenade throw. The grenade deals about 1.25 multipliers against infantry, and it also has no malice. So it dishes the same amount of damage to shock units like cavalry as it does the infantry and artillery. Quite an effective weapon. But that being said, you have to wait 45 seconds approximately for that grenade to recharge so you have to be really careful of when you decide to toss that grenade because if you toss it at the wrong time you could end up losing that unit to whatever army they're dealing with on the other hand the troopas de la marine he is the marine infantry unit so he dishes out crush damage siege damage the same damage that falconets deal with as well as that of other artillery pieces dish out, the same attack type, basically allowing him to crush through the armor of both skirmishers as well as hand units quite easily. And unlike the Grenadiers, it's not a charge attack, so he can do this constantly. The main idea of this being it makes him better against ships. So good against light ships, heavy ships, siege ships, doesn't matter. He will be good against ships, he will also be good against artillery as well. Since he will dish out the same amount of damage as he would anything else to the artillery pieces. 
now that we've got the basic introduction out of the way, we can uh, see what the combat situation is going to look like here. So it looks like uh, Jeff actually went to the Capital Age, oh, yeah. Age 3. He's going to ship the Pomberos through the Kapoor support. This will ship you Pomberos. It will also improve the siege attack damage against buildings of them. The Pomberos are a very macabre unit that um, I don't know where they come from really, but they are basically almost like an Aero Knight. They got a really long range, but unlike Aero Knights, they are good against things other than artillery and buildings. See, they do actually get multipliers against infantry with their flaming green fire arrows. Well, it used to be green fire. I don't know if they still use green fire, but... It seems like the color of the fire that comes from their arrows is very different than that of other archers. I always figured it to be like a yellowish green. But they're, they are the strongest unit in the Tupi's roster. So if you see these guys, you know to run far... Yep, see the green fire coming from their bows? These things are like like demonic necromancers or something. They just deal so much damage. Uh, you got about 28 damage with splash, mind you, with splash. Making them almost like a falconet. Then you get the multiplier against uh, infantry, about 1.3. And now they're going to start to shoot apart these... Chupas de la Malines. Oh, yep, see that? This is why these archers are really good. This is why you want to use these whenever you possibly can. But unfortunately, their multipliers do not carry over into the hand attack. So these Pomberos must constantly retreat when they feel like they're going to be put into a melee. And this is why Darkus is actually opting to use his sabers to fight them. Just so he can deny them their arrow shots by getting up close and personal with them. But at the same time we see the both Ibisi archers as well as the blow gunners coming in. These blow gunners are basically to be treated like dragoons in that they have multipliers against cavalry units. So both light cavalry units and heavy cavalry units. For those that don't know yet, uh, Wars of Liberty uses a different unit tag system than vanilla AoE 3 does. Y this little bird, this little uh, bird here called the scout unit. This little white bird represents scout units, which includes hussars and yuans and stuff like that. Whereas the big red sore fist looking thing for assault unit, that is for things like cuirassiers, Spanish lancers. Generally, cavalry they're more effective against heavy infantry. So, in order to be good against both, is very rare. Since normally maneuver units, as they're called, which is basically dragoons, only have the multipliers against the assault units, but not the scout units. And here's another little tidbit of the Tupi. They can also use their big bun technology at the town center to produce archer units. And they can actually do it infinitely too, which is kind of insane. The trade-off being that it gets more expensive over time, so... Over time, it can cost more and more food to send the scouting party out. But you can easily get like 20, 30, 40 archers out with it. Which is usually enough to round out a decent army to defeat your opponent with. Uh, Canada is basically turtling up at this point, building some redoubts, which are basically just outposts around the base. He's also making some Cree Curio de Bois from his... Cree native settlement, and then he is going to go with Austin Calavier of New France. This is actually a very good politician since uh, his technology actually lets you get a bank wagon. I don't think we're going to see it this game because Canada is under a lot of pressure right now, but in more casual circumstances you can get a nice bank wagon with him. His unit will be the Metis Rebel. Which is a, um, it's a skirmisher unit that costs food and wood. It doesn't have that long of a range, but it does have a larger attack. It also has a decent hand attack as well and has more armor. I think its armor amount is about 40% pierce armor, which most skirmishers, besides things like, you know, the Casadors and Vanilla, tend to have something like that. I just love spamming them usually. 
I wish um, poor Darkus here was under better circumstances though, because it just feels like he's getting overrun here by this stuff. And then he's got the blowgunners in stealth, and he's gonna scout his way in here in stealth like a ninja. Until the town center spots him, of course. And yep, the town center spot him, and now he's gonna have to run in and start shooting his darts like right away. Yep. Yep, even they fire like a green fiery bolt from their blowguns, which is kind of interesting to watch. Yeah, very interesting to watch. Um, look, Darkus looking to make some Kree trackers to round out his army a bit. Yeah, I don't know at this point. I mean, it seems like Kanda's in really deep doo-doo right now. I mean, I I play a lot of Canadians myself, and I try not to end up in the situation usually. And this is again due to not having enough unit cards available to get your initial army up up and going. You know, now you gotta hope that you can get those Whitworths out in enough time, or which you won't be able to do because you got these Pomberos raining down on you. Look at that. Look at the damage that they do to buildings. And you know how much range this is? This is... well... how much range is that? About 28 range? That's almost 30 range. That's way more than the skirmishers can do. It's way more than most of the skirmishers can do. And then you get this nifty little toopy villager in here to grab the wood crates. Sneaky, cheeky. See, wood log cabins when they're sieged leave a wood crate behind. And therefore, if you're very smart, you can get a villager in here to grab the wood crates. And that effectively denies them recovering that wood. And effectively houses the Canadian Civ in really badly. Uh, here comes the clubmen, the Maratakoras. They're basically like coyote runners, but they have multipliers against artillery units, which really helps them out a lot. And then they can further upgrade their multipliers against Ardy, as well as their armor later on to the home city, so they get pretty good. They get pretty good. And these are unupgraded ones. If, if he upgraded them with the veteran upgrade, he would be able to get, the, get them into stealthy and you'd be able to sneak them up on economic units which is quite helpful or you could actually flank skirmish units with them as well which is great when I say skirmish unit I literally mean archers and skirmishers because in this mod they do get their own unit tag here as you see this one called skirmish unit just so we can allow our units like the Lanceros and the Sawars to deal multiplier damage to them but not have to add a malice against the heavy units it's way more effective that way. Alright, and now we just gotta see... Yeah, these uh, fur traders are definitely gonna go down now. Fur traders are basically semi-explorers. They don't get any abilities, though. They can build town centers and trading posts. But... Another thing that makes them good is they can hunt for food. So, Kanda just lost out on a lot of food economy by getting them killed by these poisonous darts. That was really bad for them. And at this rate, we see the um, civilization trying to retreat a little bit here. We're almost. Uh, I wonder at this point what Kanda's thinking right now. Like, Recovery-wise, like, are they thinking a lot about recovery right now? Because I'm trying to see this force over here coming up up top over here. Around this corner. Here's the enclosure. The enclosure basically produces animals. Most notably the macaws, which you can use to scout around the map. They actually can't be shot at, so they're like a free scout unit that's always there. As well as tappers, which are huntable that you can produce from the building, that you can eat eat them pretty much. And here's the Akas that I was talking about, those little teeny weeny little houses that also you can gather food from. Quite quite good, because they get a lot of upgrades actually. Not only do they get upgrades at the building themselves, 
even the berry gathering upgrades from the market actually benefits the farms as well. Agriculturally. Yeah, I mean, at, at this rate, Canada, you, just, you really should just resign at this point. Because this is not this is not good. I mean, you've lost your town center, you're running around with your Cree natives, villagers, as well as your standard pioneers here. Foe well, looks pretty familiar, doesn't it? Yep. Yep, I thought the same thing when they made that portrait for him. And, um... Yeah, I mean, Tupi did really well here with their rushing. Instead of the traditional raiding party rush, they went for the Fortress Age Pombero attack, which it's a little bit more greedy and it doesn't always work, but here it worked out really good because he was able to protect his Pomberos very easily. And these, by the way, are the Boca Fuegos. These are a Culverin unit only available to Native American civs from South America. So Tupi, Inca, and Mapuche can make these. It's actually the only common unit they have between each other. Which is kind of strange because, you know, the North American natives don't get any sort of common unit at all. And what you can do with these guys is, is you can kill artillery with them, you can also use them really well for sieging, and they can also be good against ships. Alright, so it looks like he's going to be defeated any moment now. Just waiting for that resignation to come in, or that defeat. He does have some units, so he's probably going to have... He does actually have some Krupp steel cans here that he never deployed. I don't see why you deploy them anyways, but that's besides the point, so... GG. Very good. Alright. So, um... I guess I'm gonna restart this and set up the next match pretty soon. Let me just boot this out. Let me go up to here. Alright. Here comes the, um, queuing over here. I hope everyone that came in, what was it, like 20, 30 minutes ago from ESOC TV really enjoyed these uh, matches. You know, I tried to go through a lot of them within a day. Sometimes we even go through like uh, 9 to 10, maybe even 11 hours of matches to get them all done so I can do other content the rest of the week. These Wars of Liberty League is a pretty fun, you know. If you want to try out Wars of Liberty for yourself and try that out to different civs in Legacy, then feel free to talk to me about getting involved in the League at some point, you know. We could always use new people and make the League even bigger. I mean, if we had, like, uh, Leagues with, like, double the people or something, obviously I wouldn't be able to do these streams in one day. They'd have to be done over multiple days, but, um, yeah. Always looking for new faces to come to our tournaments, you know, and try out these different civs. They're really fun civs that have been around for many years, you know. I've been playing Wars of Liberty since t 2015, when it first came out in the fall. And since then, this thing has gone through a lot of different patches, you know. Lots of different updates. So, very impressive stuff overall. Right now, for everyone, we do have about two remaining encounters left. We got the Eternity and Gene P1 here, as well as the Kaiser and Rama one. These do not appear to be tiebreaker matches unless they had some sort of file issues. Occasionally we get two matches, but, um, you know, apparently they skip over a map because the recording didn't work or something. It's totally possible. So, let's get started with the Eternity versus Gene P. They're both very capable fighters, too. I've seen them play before. Quite good. Alright, so Eternity with the Swedes. He's been trying these out pretty lately. Uh, wait a minute, one second. Uh, something's going on right now. Let me pause real quick.
You know, I try to avoid these pauses whenever possible, but they happen. You know, things things happen. We're going to try to resume this where we were. We were kind of at the beginning of the match, so it wasn't that big of a deal, I guess. So, anyways, let's keep continuing. So, we got Eternity here with the Swedes. He knows how to use this sim pretty well, actually. I've seen him beat Spain in late game with it, which is a pretty good feat. <laughs> also, we got... Gene P with the Russians. This has been as if he's been exploring for a while. The Russians in Wars of Liberty are essentially almost the same Civ as you know them in Legacy. You know, the whole concept of the Strelet, the weaker Musketeer, the Rusket, as well as the other stuff. But there are a couple of key differences in terms of unit roster. Also, they do get another Civ bonus too. That one being, if you siege a building of the Russians, they have this ability called Russian Winter. Which will produce like a little snowflake underneath the unit that slows it down. Making it harder for military units to advance on you. Because it basically be, be uh, slowed down for a couple of seconds. As far as units is concerned, they actually get hand units in age 2. Which is actually similar to the changes they did to Russians on the DE side, but instead of a halberdier, they simply just get pikemen in the form of the partisans. And they do get a royal guard upgrade called the Opelshenets, so they do get upgraded throughout the late game, so don't worry about that. And then they get a fourth unit at the blockhouse called the Blastuni, which is a Ukrainian foot Cossack that uses a swastika sword. And basically he's like a foot cuirassier, or a foot assault unit, so he's meant to be used against both heavy infantry and light infantry. Just a bit weaker since, you know, he's Russia. In Russia the units tend to be weaker. Also I should note that um, there are no more cavalry archers in the Civ, they use regular dragoons. But the Royal Guard tech has gone to the line infantry. Which, you know, they're just musketeers, basically, you know? Europe doesn't use musketeers, it's the 19th and 20th century, they use line infantry. They get an RG, I think it's called the Frontovic. Yeah, they're called Frontovics. We'll look at their decks to see how good they are. Um, so this one for Russia. Essentially, you actually get three cavalry cards with Russians. You get the two Kozak ones that you always knew about, and then you get the Bostuni one here for eight. So essentially you get three different uh, shock unit shipments. Pretty good stuff. You know, you can do a lot of raiding with this. And then the kind of the glue as you head towards the third age is this card here. Infinite Bostuni. This is pretty good, you know. Essentially what you can do is, is you can um, basically rush out against large groups of heavy infantry with these. And on the other side, we're going to check out the... Um, because it seems like a pretty standard Russian deck here with advanced heavy fortifications, national readout, stuff that you're pretty used to. Oh yeah, I should mention these before we go over there. These are the Kevzers. These are a Georgian, like, knight unit. They're actually just mercenary doppelsolners, so they basically kill cavalry and they have splash attack. For the Swedish, though, the Swedish deck has this card here, Advanced Torp. Beveringer allotments at the Torp are available one age earlier and contain more units. I gotta explain how the Swedish work to newcomers here. So Swedish work in a really weird way. Every one of their mainstream buildings, except for stuff like houses and livestock pens and things like that, they get a special building called an annex that you build adjacent to the unit to the building that you actually build using the building. So the town center actually constructs its observatory annex, 
and it adds an additional functionality from that building. For the Torp, for instance, you would build this using a barracks. And by the way, annexes have a build limit of one, so you can't build multiple annexes. You only get one of them at a time. So the Torps, it's like a house. It has 15 population available to it. So almost like a Hod's longhouse almost. And then it um, has these things called allotments from it, which is the second Swedish concept. So basically allotments are armies, big bun armies, that you produce from that building and they become more expensive every time you send them. With a card like Advance Torp, that allotment will start out being a lot cheaper and will also be more valuable since more units will be in it, totaling to about 12 Beveringers, which are basically, um, you don't see them in this uh, deck at all, but, um, they're basic. You know what the Carolinas are in D3 for the Swedes? They're kind of like. Well, they're actually very different from them. So the Beveringers in Wars of Liberty are basically a hybrid between a pikeman and a musketeer. They cost wood and food. They have a high siege. They actually have a stronger multiplier of 4x against cavalry compared to that of the standard 3x. But in every other way, they're heavy infantry their musketeers because they have the ranged attack and the cost in terms of food and wood is quite similar to that of a musketeer just about so yeah however this Swede is gonna ship in Rangers the volunteers and he's gonna be training grenadiers again grenadiers they don't throw grenades all the time in this mod they just use it as a charge attack and that they use every 45 seconds and basically, once you do that grenade throw, you have to wait 45 seconds for it to come back again. So you have to make sure you manage it well. And very cheeky opponents can actually throw a native scout in front of your army when you're idling and get them to waste their grenade throw on that and then attack you. So you have to be very careful about this. You know, at the same time, grenades as you see here, 20 crush damage, no malice, and basically 0.25 against infantry. Quite good, quite good stuff. We actually do see the uh, Swedes starting to train some Beveringers right now. Alongside his Grandiers, he's also going to ship some Hussars in. Big job for Swedes right now, get this blockhouse out of my base. Because if I don't get this out of my base, we're going to have some serious problems to deal with. We're going to have infantry running amok all over this place, and we don't want that, right? Yeah, like these guys, the Cantonists. Don't get confused by the name. These are basically just Trellets. Just more modernized, you know. And slightly more Jewish. Yeah, that, that's basically it. That's basically it for the Cantonists. He's gonna throw the Hussars in front of the Cantonists to try to snare them down a bit. Which should be pretty easy to do. And, yep. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Very good. And now he's going to move on to the stable here. Let's see how this goes. I think this should be pretty easy for him to do. But then again, you see the Russians queuing up Cossacks out here, so they're going to cause a bit of a problem. I don't think he has quite enough uh, Beveringers yet to really deal with these Cossacks effectively. Then again, Cossacks, you know, one pop, but they're weak. Do you like the uh, new design on these, by the way? They, um, they use lances now, which is a little bit more accurate to um, some uh, Napoleonic era mods I've seen with these Cossacks before. They have the blue uniforms with the correct hats, and then they use the lances to play instead of the sabers. What's this? Cossacks raiding. Yeah, he's using the special formation to keep them super duper close so they can raid easier. Oh, yeah, that's... Oof. That hurts. That really does hurt. That really does hurt a lot.
It's also going to be training some uh, line infantry from uh, this blockhouse over here. He's going to have to build a second one to defend the area though, because the only real way you're going to deter this early aggression is using lots and lots of uh, fortifications in the form of blockhouses. Oh, no, nah, no, nah, this isn't... you don't want to deal with that. See, Beveringers, 4x against shock units. Not a good idea. Not a good idea at all. To boot, Beveringers actually have a faster movement speed than standard heavy infantry. So they can actually outrun you a lot easier than other units can. Which is kind of a shocking fact, you know, you wouldn't think of that because they're like a musketeer, they're not that quick, right? No, they're pretty fast. You know, Grenadiers only have about 4 speed. These have about 5 speed. And the Hussar is only about 1.75 ahead of that. So, much greater chance of getting snared by those things. So you have to be very, very careful. Like, like he has to be very careful of getting raided. Man, man, you need to, you need to get the Beveringers over here, like, right pronto. Pronto, yeah. There you go, okay. See, these buildings here, these are called sawmills. They are basically like banks, but they deal with wood. They trickle us wood in two ways. They trickle wood directly, and then they tr give us wood crates. The wood crates the settlers can gather alongside the building, and it's very common for you to keep a settler sort of idle around here to grab them from both buildings. However, I must note, that um, the, uh, you normally don't get a build limit of two of these sawmills. You actually have to send a card called um, Norland Logging to improve its build limit to two and also make it cheaper to build because it's normally 350 wood to make one, which is kind of a pain. But once you send uh, that card, it goes down to like 210 wood or 240 wood, something like that. It's a lot easier to get it. Oh, walling. Not a bad idea, you know. To boot, um, Swedes can also get a sort of big bun text from these sawmills called Renovations that actually improves the HP of all buildings, including walls, so. Yeah, that's another neat little bonus for the Swedes for you. Um, this raid... I don't know who's winning right now. What do you think? Do you think that the Swedes can come on top here, or do you think the Russians are going to hold out and go for a big rush at some point? I mean, I'll look at the resources for the, like, the Russians right now while this raiding is going on. Yeah, this is some bloody raiding going on. These Cossacks have been at it for a while with the settlers here, and it's been kind of, kind of interesting to see them going back and forth, taking kills here and there. But yeah, GMP, he's got some resources, he's got some food, he's got some coin. He's not doing too bad right now, you know. Not doing too bad, not too shabby. He is able to afford uh, Cantonist blocks as well, which, you know, they're not, they don't come cheaply, you know. 375 food and then the wood costs. Definitely not cheap. He could still ship in the Pastunis hypothetically to round out his army a bit. And he might want to do that next. Oh, he's going for Gangsaw. Yeah, looking for a bit of better wood chopping there. Also, great code, apparently. Is he worried about Hussar raids, potentially? I mean, I wouldn't be. I don't see any stable up yet. But then again, you never know. We've seen some wacky people today sticking buildings, like, literally on the edge of the map over here. So you literally don't see it coming to you. So, yeah, I could uh, totally understand why you'd do that, you know? Makes a lot of sense to me. It's going to try to attack again, though. You know, it seems like it, um... You got an army of, like, line infantry and cantonists down here. And basically you got to, um... Yeah, you got to basically come up here and, uh, attack them. Straight, at, straight away. Yeah. Straight away. Because? What? 
готов. Что? Здравствуйте. У меня возвращается сила. Oh, nice. Double queuing up on the line infantry. Very good. I think he has a well-rounded enough army to maybe go for a push at this point, like... But wait a second, wait a second. I gotta I got look at the Swedes here. Because the problem with the Swedes is, is they, um, get access to this card way too early. And therefore they can get level, like, age 4 level towers. Or redoubts or outposts, whatever you want to call them. In age 3. So they're already firing cannonballs. That's why I'm looking at the resources here to see maybe if uh, Swedes are going to go for any sort of like age 3 very soon. He is going to put the tower right here in front of the wall though, so it looks like he's turtling up for that type of a play. But he does have a lot of idols here though, man. You know, you got to do something, put him over here, bring him over here and... You know, idling is never good, you know, there's really no reason for it. It's the one thing that really kills you very badly is your idle times, because you're basically losing villager seconds for free. Hmm. Now he's in a desperate situation, needs to train some grenadiers, it looks like. Yeah, did you see that grenade throw right there? That was pretty good, you know? And sometimes, if you can get enough grand deers and you place them in the right spot, they can take out like five, six, seven, sometimes ten units. You gotta play it carefully, though, because if you don't, you get a wasted grenade throw, and that equalizing effect that the grenade throw has is now gone. He will get a little bit of it back, though, when these other grenadiers arrive to add their charge attacks into the fold. I just don't see what the next step is for Swedes yet. Are they going to stick it out in age 2 the rest of the time? Are they going to eventually turtle up properly and slowly add in some better units in age 3? Uh, yeah, I mean... Did you see how good that grenade throw was? It really damaged so many units, you know? That's, that's why grenade throws are not to be trifled with. In large numbers, that could have been the death of all those units. He is going to start to make some volunteers now. These are basically just crossbowmen, really. You know, crossbowmen. Same 2.5 against heavy infantry, the same against dragoons. Yeah, they're just crossbowmen. And like crossbowmen, they don't normally get an upgrade beyond veteran. Unless they get, like, some sort of royal guard for it, like the Belgians have or the French. So be aware of that as well. Oh, this isn't good, because the grenades are just... You see, this could be a problem. You you siege the wall, right? And then you idle... See, Gene P knows this. He's smart enough not to fall for that type of trash. That trash being, if I spend too much time sieging on the wall just standing there, the grenadiers are going to get a nice solid throw that kills 20 of my units and sends me actually all the way back here retreating. And that would be fatal. That could be v pretty much fatal for you. Can virtually be fatal for you. Also, these Cossacks are looking a little bit angry because um, you got these Beveringers right here protecting the flank over here too, which is not helpful. Oh, we saw grenade throws. We, does he have any more though? If he gets some more in, and he can s squeeze them against this barrier over here, that would be a bloody mess. Um, yeah, I mean, he's sending, uh, sending steel traps right now. Just so you're aware, he sent a card called Land Mana Party. Basically, every market technology will give you a free villager, a free settler. So, think of that like the Italian Civ and Defib edition, how they get, like, free villagers with each technology. It sort of emulates that and actually precedes that system being created, you know. The Wars of Liberty Swedes had been around for a good number of years before DE came out, so maybe even the Italian Sib bonus in DE came from that of the Swedes over here. Who knows, you know? You never know. I've already seen enough references from the Polyonic era and Wars of Liberty show up in DE3. Wouldn't surprise me one bit.
the gunsmith. Don't want the name for you, that's just the uh, marksman, so what's the skirmisher style units? I think for some reason the Swedish one gives you like these uh, archaic style volunteers instead of the skirmishers, which is kind of weird. Could be wrong, it might actually give you actual skirmishers, but we'll have to wait and see. Can't tell all the time what changes are done in these patches, you know. Because Boys of Liberty's been patched so many times it's not even funny. You know, starting in 2015, all the well, actually 2016 came out the first patch, and then ever since then it's began being updated at least two or three times a year usually. So, lots of new stuff. And now for the Russians, um, are they going to be aging up? Yeah, they're almost actually already there with the cornet. This is going to guarantee him free Cossacks. But he's going to get. Where are the free Cossacks? Right over here. I think they came in right over here. Yeah. Either there or somewhere else. He definitely got free Cossacks from that. I remember the name pretty well. Yep, and here comes the uh, volunteers. Yep. Oh, that's not good. Um, kind of smudged in there. Ugh. That must hurt. He might get away with just like he gets away with one of them. But uh, yeah, don't you hate that when the AI just does some weird debauchery like that with the units where it's trying to figure out where to go and just starts twitching like that? Uh, and they well, they're just getting stabbed and stabbed and sliced. It's just you know. Get, pick up your mind and just figure out where you're gonna go, you know. You're basically giving them free kills doing that. It's not even the human's fault, it's a little bot in the game doing that, you know. It controls the movement speed and the pathing. Oh, we do see foot artillery though coming in from the Russians, yeah. Two of them shipped in and we're probably gonna see three of them trained. Is that right? Three of them. See, what can I pay attention to that? Oh, oh, four's all right. I mean, he can, yeah, he's saving that so he can get up another queue going with potentially one or two more on top of that. So, you know, this might be what he needed to go in for a full push. You know, foot artillery. Same thing as Falconet. You know, they just use a different name. They're really just the same unit and the same model and the same icon, same stats. So yeah. Foot artillery, Falcon F, whatever you like to call them. They're gonna probably beat back the Swedes, but that's Oh, what's going on here? I just saw grenades being tossed at civilians. Talk about war crimes. Serious war crimes. Um, yeah. I mean, he's, he's still adding in more artillery pieces to this mess. This is gonna be a nasty situation to deal with the Swedes. They better have a big army of Hussa troop base, their assault cavalry, or the, um large group of Hussars or something to deal with this mess. Because even if you decide to turtle up and up... Yep, he did. He upgraded them to fortified redoubts with the cannonballs, so... Even with these things, an army of artillery of this magnitude can still blast their way through that. Even if you add renovations cards to it to buff up their HP, you still gotta be careful. Yeah, I... He's going to put a fort on this side, though, so I don't know if we're going to see some sort of counter-offensive over here, down this road. Totally possible. Absolutely possible. Yeah, I mean, at this rate, it's like, um... Oh, Culverins, yeah, that's, 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 a, good, that's a good answer to it. Culverins, actually a really good answer to it, because 
You'll be able to sit behind the walls here and be able to shoot these uh, foot artilleries down in groups of one or two, potentially, if you're really good at targeting and microing. Which I know Eternity can do really well. He's, he's a really high level player in D. He's like. I don't know, like 1.4k or 1.5k at low, something like that. So he knows his way around micro and stuff in general. You know, he's not a stranger to it. Amalgamation. Uh, yep, here comes the mining. Yep, and uh, here comes three culverins. It's gonna have to... Well, you probably want to keep him on this side of the wall, unless you can find a better reason not to do that. Is this wall even working here? It, just, it seems like there's a little bit of a squeeze area that the Cossacks can get into. How else did these ones get over here? I don't know. Like, how did they get over there? But, uh, does he know about the Culverins? Um, he should at this point. He should know about them at this point if he's seen the wall yet. Yeah, like, what are you going to do? Like, yeah, they're going to roll them in in bombard mode and start blasting them down. Like this. Yeah, he's going to shoot this one next. This one's going down, yep. Now he's just got two of them. That's a lot of resources lost. That's a lot of resources lost, man. That's like, what, um, 300 wood and 1.2k in the coin department? Yeah, you don't really want to be wasting resources like that, because you don't know when you're going to get them again. You know, I mean, this is still the mid-game, you know. You're not in the late game with all your big, fancy, schmancy, late-game capital upgrades for Eco. You, you got a long way to go before you get there, so. If you start losing resources now like that, it might not be so pleasant for you. Likewise, we see Hussars being shipped in. Are these, uh, did he get veteran hussars yet, by the way? That would be a pretty decent idea right now, because he's gonna want some sort of shock unit, I think. Yeah, he just took these stragglers out over here. Veteran grenadier coming in. Totally, how many does he still have? Does he have a sizable, only 10 of them. Come on, man, you need to make more of these things to really get them going. You need, like, 50 of them. 50, 60 of them before they really are going to start blasting through lines of infantry. Seriously, you need big numbers of those grenadiers to really get the value you want out of them. And if you do build the numbers of them, great, they're going to work great for you. But if you don't, you're not going to see a big difference. They're only going to be minor supports, you know. Better off just training beverages, <laughs> because it's kind of the same thing in gun-to-gun -gun combat. Well, I shouldn't say that, actually. I think that the, uh... Well, I think the Grenadiers actually do dish out a bit more range damage with their muskets than the Beveringers do, so I sh should hold my tongue on that. They also have the Pierce Armor, obviously, so they're a little bit better against infantry situations than, uh, the Beveringers would be, traditionally. And they... That's a pretty good armor value, too, so... Let's... Yeah... Here's the, here's the thing, though. You need to get over here to deal with this issue. You know, you got some Dragoons, you got some Veteran Line Infantry, Cantonists, you got the Foot Artillery, so you need to creep up on these guys. Wow, we, we're seeing Marines coming in. These are Naval Infantry. They are, you know, the Troupas de la Marine of the Canadians? These are the European Common Unit variant of them. So somewhere over here, I don't know where, Somewhere over here. Find a look. He's training these things. Oh, he's making them from the fort. Yeah, that's right. Apparently you can make like, uh, marine naval infantry from forts. That's a special feature of forts now. He might not be able... He could actually upgrade them if he could build a dock in one of these little ponds and actually upgrade them. Which would be really great, you know. Because marine infantry... Those would be really good in this matchup, since they actually have the uh, skirmisher tag, so they actually wouldn't take any multiplier damage from these at all. They'd actually be immune from that. And these, my folks, are the Hussa Truppe. These are basically Swedish Cuirassiers. You know, they work exactly the same way as the Cuirassiers do, but they're Swedish. And, um... 
Yeah, the only big difference being they're slightly weaker and they can be made into allotments from the paddock. The paddock is a annex you make for the stable. I don't see advanced paddock in the home city. I didn't see it there, so I don't think we're going to see any allotments of these particular things. But one thing they do get, though, that... Oh, yeah, he doesn't have it. They actually get a nice card where they can actually get a multiplier against heavy infantry units. So we're making them a hybrid between the splash base Cursor and the um, multiplier base Escolta that the Latin American use. Because uh, heavy cavalry for the Latin Americans is basically like the Spanish Lancer, but with multipliers exclusively against the um, heavy infantry units. Yeah. Oh, Culverins on Culverins! Culverins on Culverins! That's a little overkill, isn't it? I mean, you could have just used the uh, Dragoons to do that, don't you think? Uh, I don't know. I'm a little bit... Well, they did they get the job done, though, so that's good. They did kill one of them. I mean, I just have to shoot down the Arwen next. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, yeah, I mean... Oh, these are the Plastoonies. Yeah, these guys are pretty good. Notice they actually get a charge attack here where they do a bit of splash and a little extra damage. So yeah, think of them as like, you know, I don't know, like a coyote runner with more hand armor or something. If you don't know what Boar's Liberty is, yeah. Pretty fun, you know. Pretty fun to play around with. Um, the Latin Americans get a better version called the Machetro, which costs um, food and wood instead of the coin costs. And they actually have a splash attack all the time, so they're technically a bit stronger than these guys. But then again, if you run out of trees, you can't make them anymore, but you can keep making these for plantations. Or states, whatever you want to call them, pretty much. Yep, here comes the Plastoonies, going in with their swastika attack. Did pretty good there. And now they have to pull back a little bit and wait for some more numbers to arrive. What's, how is their resources doing? Uh, they're doing great in coin, you know. They could certainly pop out a lot more cans if they wanted to. A lot more artillery. But against all these hustle troop bays, um, I don't know if you really want artillery. You probably need more dragoons, honestly, right now. To deal with this mess. Get some dragoons out. He did ship those dragoons, so we know he didn't train them. You know, he should consider training dragoons right now. Because Dragoons are really good in this case because they are specifically made to counter these types of Assault Calvaries because they have the multipliers and they deal a type of damage, pierce damage, which they don't have armor against. They only have armor against hack attacks like bayonets and stuff and sabers. They're not meant to be shot at. They can't deal with that for too long without taking some serious hits. Looks like Russians are kind of exhausted though at this point. Like. It seems like uh, they're going to resign any second. Yep, GG. GG. I mean, they could have held on for a little bit longer, I, could, I would assume, but um, let me see. It kind of felt like they were both in the... I guess not. I guess not. It just felt like uh, Russia had a lot more to do here. Resource-wise, uh, pretty similar militarily. Yeah, it's clear that the Swedes got the kills, though. This is this is the factor here that really made a difference. And if we look at the timeline, yeah, things didn't really take off for the Swedes in, in terms of units until a lot look, towards the end, it looks like, because there was a lot of back and forth, you know. This was a very even fight, mind you, you know. That I definitely enjoy. You know, I like it when we have matches like this where it's very even. You know, there's a lot of back and forth. All right, so let's um, move on to the next one. Got about three more matches to go for the stream. We got to finish the rest of this encounter, and then we get one more encounter to do after this, and we should be good. 
You know, I mean, this was luckily one of the smaller weeks. You know, not as much matches. And, um, alright. Alright, so this is Eternity versus GMP match 2. And this will be on Hudson Bay. This will be on Hudson Bay. Let's see how this one goes. It should be a fun one, you know. The first one was pretty even. I expect the same out of this one. They're both very capable D3 players, so... Yeah, we're going to see some fun action today. Just making sure that the OBI... Alright, good. Oh boy, yeah, I mean, I, it looks like um, Eternity is looking for a quick victory here. Because we see Bolivia. Yeah, Bolivia is one of those quick finisher sieves in a 1 versus 1. Because of one particular build that they use that we know Eternity invented pretty much, as far as we know. It's called the... It's no specific name for the build, but it revolves around one card that I can find for you right here. It's called the, um... War of the Republicatas. War of the Republicatas. What it does is, is every trading post you build gives us three native warriors called, um... The, uh... Let me... The Republicata Machaeats. And essentially what there is, is there is a special, like, heavy infantry unit that, um, has multipliers at range against heavy infantry. Against cavalry. So they're basically like dragoons on foot. They also have pierce armor, too, which is kind of odd. It makes it hard for even infantry to shoot them down. They got a reasonable range, so... Yeah. And to boot, the way you really get it going is, is you, um... Use this card here, Mestizaje, which is same thing as advanced trading post for the Europeans, but it also improves the build limit of native warriors. And then you usually age up with the Croats for 300 wood as a benefit, so you can essentially take over this whole map of trading posts except for the one lodged behind here with the Cree on the opposing side. Gene P, on the other hand, is going up with the uh, Portuguese. The Portuguese. These, these you know very well. You know, they are basically the sieve that gets free covered wagons with each age of. I think as an add bonus, they get um free uh, fishing boats with each age up from the water as well. That's sort of the bonus that Wool added to them. They actually are going for an age one card, uh, Colonial Militia. So. This is usually a good pick for Portugal to deal with a lot of heavy pressure, which he knows 100% he's going to get here, because Jean P is very advanced in Wars Olympics in this mod, so he knows exactly the build that uh, Eternity is going with here. Yeah, definitely. 100% aware of him. And I'll give a bit of a bigger backstory to Bolivia, for those that don't know them, so... Bolivia gets, it's one of the weirder sieves. As you can see right here, these uh, villagers are losing hit points every second. And no, they are not heavy smokers. Um, they, it's basically a special sieve bonus or an anti-bonus they get to encourage you to use something with your explorer here. The Chalfiera, this uh, nice Juanita here. So what she does is, is um, there's a a big bun technology in age two you get called Sarnas from the TC. Once that's researched for only about 50 wood and 50 coin, your uh, explorer here can use this little aura ability, like it's a little circle you put over or cast over some of your villagers, and it will turn them into soldiers called the Yellow Soldiers, the Kayarunas. They are just a musketeer that is a native warrior, so they actually don't cost any population, they only have a bill limit. And you can keep doing that on top of the Pongos, as these villagers are called, who are, have like zero HP. And for those that are a little bit concerned with that fact, I think the devs for the Great War patch have decided to remove that little thing so they don't lose HP anymore out of nowhere. So they do remain the same HP unless obviously you attack them or try to kill them or shoot them or something. So yeah, they will work a little bit more normally now. And it, you probably don't feel as pressure to use the Sarna's ability as much now. Which is a good thing. First Italian wave. This is an uh, immigrant option I was not expecting. 
I should explain how immigrants work, shouldn't I, for those that are coming from the ESOC TV stream. Immigrants are basically like a, a sieve within a sieve. You are Bolivia, but you can bring other nations, peoples, into your, um, into your colony, and they will come with their own special colony town center called an immigrant colony. For Italians, they get an immigrant Italian colony, and from the Italian colony, you do multiple things. You can train a particular villager from them for a coin, and each of the workers for the different countries has a special quality to them. The Italian workers are good at farming, they're good at plantation work, they're good at anything with agriculture, but they're worse at everything else. And what these workers can do is two things. They can build a lot of your standard buildings, like villages do, but they train, instead of a town center, they train their immigrant colony should it be destroyed. Because you only get a build limit of one for immigrant colonies, with very few exceptions. Also, they can build a special house. For the Italians, their house doubles as an agricultural building, so it can be configured to food or coin for villager gathering. A lot like a rice paddy, yeah. And they, you can also, with these immigrant town centers, research special technologies. Two of which become available at that colony with each age up that you pick for that colony. So like if I got Italians now, I would get two technologies from the colony. But if I don't pick them again for the rest of the match, I'm not getting any more techs from that colony. I'll get them at the colony that I picked for the other ones. And lastly, what Italian immigrant colonies does is, or any colony, you produce special units called immigrant units, which are, in terms of tags, are basically just consulate units. But, you know, and as a result, they actually shadow tech with each age up. But otherwise, you know, their stats are pretty normal, you know, and they usually encompass unit types that you don't have access to. So, like, maybe they might reflect a Yulon, or maybe a Doppelsolner, or something like that. So here becomes begins the War of the Republicatas. You already start to see these free Republicata Micaeids coming out. These guys are very dangerous indeed. And um, basically, now Portugal has to turtle up in their town centers to survive. Because this, for most civilizations with only one town center, they would have already died about now. And now he's going to use his um, frontier defense's card to get two readouts to defend the town centers even further. And what Gene P is hoping for here is that he can turtle out so effectively that he can boom his way out of this mess of all these native warriors coming to his base and sniping down his army one by one. And that could be a very scary situation. Yeah, like this right here. Yep, see that? He was trying to transfer him to the other TC to improve the the uh, garrison attack, and he ended up losing a settler in that exchange. You have to play this very carefully, because, you know, Eternity is a master of this build. I don't know for how long some of you people have been here. We actually saw this build done earlier today by um, Alucard with a different set of cards. A bit of a more of a late game version of it, but still the same concept. Yeah, it's a pretty nasty build, and I can attest to it, because I've actually used it before, just to prove that it works. And I got some pretty nasty kills, though, in multiple situations. You know. If you're ever looking for a decent build to do that kills your opponent off early, consider going with the Bolivians to do the War of the Republicatas build, because it generally does a lot of damage. You know, this one card right here can cause so much havoc, it's not even funny. Not even funny. Not even funny. Yeah, because you're looking at uh, Portugal right now. I mean, let's look at their deck real quick. They got a reasonable amount of crates. They got some units here, but not a lot, you know. It's not like they doubled up on crates or anything. So if they eat through all those crates just to survive here, that could actually kill them right in age 2, you know. Because they really need to get to age 3 and start making the cacadores. Or the Casadores, however you want to pronounce them. You know, the Portuguese skirmisher. 
and then start shipping in things like org. Well, wait a second. They don't get organ guns in Boys World Day anymore. That's right. They actually make falconets, or what they call here, foot artillery. Yeah, that that was a change that um the team decided because they figured um, you know, organ guns in the 20th century, kind of anachronistic. Honestly, they should just be using like uh, normal European cannons. Honestly, for their anti-infantry. So yeah, they just gave them like normal falcs. Not a big deal. But unfortunately, they don't get a two falconet card though. So that that kind of stings quite a bit for them. They have to rely on a one falconet card, which. I wouldn't get that if I were you. I'd just get like more like halberdiers, well, line infantry, something like that. Another wonderful thing going away, halberdiers. Well, They're going to be removed from the mod in the Great War patch because they kind of want to add more emphasis on the partisans, I think, and other unit types like the grenadiers a little bit more. I think Spain might get them at some well, point, but nobody else really. And then Austria, of course, has their special halberd unit, the uh, Trabant that does the splash damage. So, pole arms are going to be pretty rare for Europe besides like pikeman style units like Russia and French do really well. Spain. Yeah, it's a bit of a range unit exchange right here, honestly. Yeah, I mean, at this rate, it's like, um. Kind of a back and forth, you know, I think technically the volunteers will do a little bit better here since they have the multipliers on their side. And the range if they use effectively, but yeah, if you're taking shots like that though, where you're losing them for free and stuff, um, yeah, that's not going to work out too well for you, I mean, you really got to make sure you're, um, you know, you're not getting targeted like that. It could be because of lag as well, you know. You don't know how the internet quality is when you're viewing these recordings, so possibly he might have meant to do a bit of a kiting here, and then the lag pushed him forward. Yeah, lag, lag can kill people, you know, it really can. I don't, if it, you know, lag is lag, you can't control it unless, you know, you can get better internet service, but, yeah, that's besides the point. Lag is definitely a killer. <laughs> I just don't know where he's going to make up the food to get the capitalized with. He has the coin in the bag, but as far as the Kamida is concerned, I just don't know where he's going to pull that rabbit out of his hat. You know? I don't know. I don't know how that's going to happen. Then we got, um... The, uh, second Italian wave coming in already. So maybe what we're going to see is maybe some Italian immigrant units, you know? could be possible. Italians actually get quite a few units, you know, they get the red shirts, they get the Tadamidians, which is like a Spanish Lancer style immigrant unit, and then they get the uh, Nagulicola, which is like the Basigadieri, so it's basically a foot dragoon, you know. It has like the anti-cavalry style multipliers of a dragoon, but not the artillery ones, and it fights on foot, you know, that that's the big thing about it. And if it was Italy, they'd be training those from the barracks and not the stable. That's really the big difference for them. But for these, for this sieve, you, they're basically the Italian immigrant variant of those. Alright, so this should be arriving real soon. Mamma mia, that's a lot of comida. <laughs> Yeah, the, it always shocks me how much food you actually get from that age up. It's like 1.3k comida food. Yeah, a lot of spaghetti and pizza. What the manjo. Alright, so... Yeah, here comes the Tata Dominion, Asian. These are going to be good against all infantry. Note that they are assault units, so they have hand armor and not pierce armor, so dragoons would eat them up for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, basically. Oh, now we see the stagecoach coming in. Yeah. Stagecoach is definitely coming in now. I 
I mean, at this rate, it's like, uh... Oh, they do get a capital H in there. Nice. Is he going up with the gunsmith? Yep. They can get some free cacadores from that. But not too helpful against this mess, though. That's definitely for sure. I still think Bolivia is going to win this, just because they seem to have the map control, they have the trade route down, they got more room to expand a bit. Do we see any mining camps coming up yet? Um, no, we don't yet. I don't think we see any mining camps coming up yet. Mining camps, for those that don't know, for Bolivia, um, basically like these little buildings you stick next to mines. They have to be built next to mine resources. And they produce villagers for free from them, like an Ottoman town center. They will often build about two sets of two villagers, and then they get destroyed. You know, they they basically blow up out of existence, and then you have to keep rebuilding them again and again. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting concept. But now we see the Wendat Mantlets coming to attack um, from the south here against the Portuguese. Wendats are basically the same as Huron, just with a different name to keep up with the updated times. I, I, I think for him, Capulets couldn't come soon enough. You know, he's he's barely hanging on to resources here. Look at this. This is kind of a scary situation. I mean, frankly, your most safest uh, frontier's got to be the water here, where, you know, you've been getting free fishing ships with each age up from. You know, this is probably the place where you feel safest and most at home at right now is the water. He's going to ship in some halberdiers. Halberdiers, you know, the, for those that are a little bit concerned about that idea, just know that they were updated to have the stats of Defensive Edition Grenad Halberdiers, so they are stronger. But then we see these Grenadier units, the Dazas coming in. These are the Bolivian Grenadiers. These guys, uh, be careful of them, you know. Be very careful of them. Latin America does not get a common Grenadier unit, so only sort of like unique units like this you really ever see being used. And then of course there's a second type of Grenadier called the Bombardier, which works like the old Grenadiers do where they constantly throw the grenades instead of having a gun. But they, I think they throw a little bit slower and they're a little more expensive because again they don't have any sort of malice against uh, crush attack against any units, so they end up just, you know, a lot more damage than they would on average. Hmm. Yeah, the Halberdiers did pretty good there. They cleaned up the Tower Millions pretty well. Oh, and then the Minutemen come out. This is gonna be a bloodbath. You know why? You know why? Siege unit tag. Siege unit tag. What, what's the one multiplier does this have? Siege unit multiplier. This is the time when Minutemen just obliterate armies, you know, and then all you got left is a couple of the Francotiradores here. These are just mounted skirmish units. Mounted skirmish. And I guess I should explain this part too. Notice how there is no maneuver tag here. This means that skirmishers will not do multiplier damage against this ranged cavalry unit. Skirmishers only have multipliers against things with the maneuver tag, not the skirmish tag. Pretty clear. This way, mounted skirmishers like these and the ones that Brazil has, for instance, can act like true skirmishers and they don't have to worry about being countered by their own kin, basically. You know? Feels a little bit more at home for them. What doesn't feel at home is the fact that you can only afford, like, one one skirmisher out of your barracks. That's not good. That doesn't feel very home-like at all. Like being in a very scary wilderness somewhere. Like, I don't know, the Hudson Bay. How is the economy of eternity doing? Yeah, yeah, night and day. Look at that economy. It's got all the coin he needs, all the food he needs. He's starting to send, um, Wendat Sun Ceremony in. So he's thinking about really getting out large numbers of those Wendat natives. This is, uh, looking a lot like a fatality coming up, you know? Also, these wonderf this wonderful card here, Infinite uh, Daza Grenadiers. This is going to ensure that he can constantly send in more and more of these things throughout the match. Yeah. Throughout the match. 
Hopefully we see an ultimate building today from the Civ. That'd be cool. Ultimate buildings are basically a unique building that every Latin American Civ has access to. The one for the uh, Bolivians, the Sociedad Folklorica. Folklorica is basically just like a big giant native embassy, you know. It actually doubles the... or increases the build limit of all native warriors. As well as letting you train not only native warriors there, but also your ultimate unit, the uh, Colorado, which is basically a musketeer that can also beat drums to increase the speed of nearby units instead of being in attack mode if you choose to. It's a neat little bonus. Yeah, definitely. Ah, oh, these uh, Daza Grenadiers did pretty good work at the helm. Now they just have to get in the back and deal with the Minutemen next. That's going to be the hard part, because the Minutemen can actually fire back and do some serious damage to them. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And here comes the Wendat Trade Dominance. Trying to remember, I think that actually brings him some manlets to him. Yeah. Yep, he's gonna get a lot of uh, siege units out of that for sure. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm just waiting for one of the grenades to just instantly kill like all of these Minutemen. Cause that's one of the weird little side effects of throwing grenades is you can actually kill this whole army of like emergency units in one hit if the grenade falls the right way. Alright, so now we see more of the Yellow Soldiers, Kayarunas, Frankateadores, Mounted Skirmishers, or actually rather think of them as Mounted Crossbowmen because of the multipliers, yeah. Yeah, keep in mind, yeah, these are like multipliers of a crossbowman, not of a skirmisher. And here comes the Machetros, like the Plastoni, but a lot tougher because they retain their splash attack all the time. I like the Machetro, they're one of my favorite units. The thing, the weird macabre thing about the Machetro is, is it's um, considered an archaic unit, so they only get veteran level upgrades, but most of the civs that get Machetros can either get Royal Guard upgrades for them, or they can actually unlock their Guard and Imperial upgrades later, like Mexico does, so. You know, they don't really feel like that much of an archaic unit. They get a lot of respect, with they sh which they should, since, you know, Machetros in this period of time are pretty useful soldiers in a lot of battles and stuff. You know, so they definitely deserve their respect and should be allowed to be used in the late game a lot. By most of the Sims. Not much like the case for Brazil and Peru that don't get a lot for them, but certainly for anyone else. Machetros are a very solid unit to use all around. And now I feel like he has the time to really start sieging in on these buildings. Yeah, looks like it. Oh, but then he has another batch of the Minutemen. Oh, jeez, that's... That's too bad. That's too bad. Oh, but then the Madlets are coming in, the Wendats. That should certainly help deal with these town centers. Some defending halberdiers, it looks like. Yep, you just gotta shoot back at these guys. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think you're gonna get them down eventually because of the splash attack, but still. Minutemen definitely uh, stalling out this match. You know, if it went for the Minutemen, I think this kid would have already been dead by now. Yeah, what do you think? Like, uh, yeah, I think we have already been dead by now. I would say if, you know, you didn't have these multipliers like that from the Minutemen constantly stalling the time for him. Yeah, GG it looks like. I mean, 
Yeah, you got some skirmishers here, the casting doors, but uh, yeah, I don't think that's good. Yeah, see that? See, that's why grenade throws are just dangerous in general. They can just blow up entire armies when they're well placed like that. Yeah. Oh yeah, see that? Yep. <laughs> Little actual bombs, you know, actual deadly bombs. I wonder what would happen if he adopted this grenadier system. How they would end up working, you know? Would people use them all the time, or would we rarely see them being used that much? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Because technically not all the Grenadiers work like that, only some of them do. They're called the Western Grenadiers, like, you know, like, the Polyonic armies use. Everybody else uses Bombardiers, which work like old Grenadiers, basically. It replaces the old system where Grenadiers used to work like the old ones with, like, 3x multipliers against infantry, which, against infantry, that was just unreal and insane, but against everything else, not that bad. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so, um... Yeah, that's GG. Good work, GNP, in trying to defend that. I mean, that must not have been easy for you to defend this. The Bolivia build with the Republicates is an actual menace to society. And any attempt to stall your end by that much, by like 20 minutes, not bad work, you know? You tried your best, I mean... I, I didn't last that long when I had to deal with his build. You know, you you did great. You really did. Yeah. Yeah, just... The math, everything, it's just... I don't know. It's the math. Math is against you when you do it, you know? You just don't last very long. It's kind of a crazy situation, you know? We got only, like, one encounter left. I hope everyone's happy with the stream so far and enjoying the better HD resolution on the screen. Hopefully nobody's experiencing stuttering or else we're in deep trouble because I'll have to re-record this stuff again. I don't think we'd have that issue, right? No. If you enjoy this type of uh, coverage of Wars of Liberty, this will be put up on my YouTube channel, Unstoppable Stiletzi. Same Same name as the Twitch channel, you know? I only do game streaming on Twitch just to bring some Twitch people over to my YouTube channel to sort of, you know, entice people to come over there. Otherwise, I'd probably just use YouTube to do streaming. I grew up with Twitch being the supreme uh, streaming platform, so I kind of still consider it to be so. Yeah. Um, last encounter. Kaiser vs. Rommel. Rommel, a very dear friend of mine in the Wars of Liberty community who I've faced many, many times. It's been a while since I've played him for a constant amount of time, so it'll be good to see how his skills lie. Kaiser, on the other hand, another person I practice a lot with, he loves to invent new strategies and new build orders that surprises everyone when they show up in the tournaments. This is actually going to be a pretty fun one to watch. Now, Kaiser is probably, if I know Kaiser well, he already has like two strange build orders in mind to completely freak out his opponent and drive him into the ground. But we'll see. China. Try Ming Trufa Haoda. I think I know what build he's doing with this. He, he tried it with me a couple of weeks ago. It's a special type of build using emergency units from the villages. And essentially, he's going to build up, like, a large army of them and try to swarm. Now, I had the perfect counter for that, so he actually lost a bit of uh, morale when using it after seeing what I did to him. But, um, it looks like he's going to give it another try again. You know? going to give it another try again. I don't really need to introduce China much. You sort of know how they work. Obviously, since it's the 20th century now, they got a lot of different... Some of their units... Simply just changed uh, names and models and icons. Other ones actually did get different stats and were reworked with other stuff, so... Yeah. One thing to note for the age ups, though, is that, um... Chinese get one free villager from each village and town center with each age up. And therefore, you don't get any more refugee cards from the home city. It's baked into the sieve itself. And as a sort of like a negative bonus to balance it out, I think they actually get a negative economic theory applied to them from the start of the match. So they actually... 
they actually gather 10% slower than other villagers do. Sort of to represent sort of the economic turmoil in China during the time period. You will notice, yeah, you will notice that the villagers gather a bit slower, so getting the most villagers earlier on is really going to be essential to survive as the sieve. Everything else is pretty much the same. We got Rommel with the Peruvians. Peruvians, you know, they're pretty fun sieve. They got these special villagers called the, um, called the Cholos. The Cholos can garrison in a building, so they can actually hide in these houses. You know, and in military buildings, they can actually shoot back, I think, in like a barracks or a stable. And other than that, they got a pretty nice lineup of unique units too, so they got that going for them. They're good on water because their ultimate building is a water unit. It's like a water-based factory. They can also produce heavy ships that train special naval units only they, only they have access to. So a very fun sip to play as. He's already shipped in about three of the Cholos. As far as the rest of the deck is concerned, he does have Llama Ranching. So maybe he's going actually up with the Chinese immigrants, which focus a lot on livestock pens. He also has um, Spice Trade. He also has um, 20 Llamas in age 3. So I'm thinking maybe this is some sort of economic play to go towards llamas with Chinese houses, because Chinese houses for the immigrants are livestock pens. Possibly. Possibly. Also, I should point out these cool little cards here. They basically send units from liberating countries, helping them out. So this one will send some independistas from Gran Colombia. This one will send some Granadero uh, Caballo from Argentina. So... Horse grenade, horse grenadiers, just like the ones you see in uh, Definitive Edition. Yeah, there were horse grenadiers in Definitive, in Wars of Liberty, and also Napoleonic era long before they showed up in D. Just so you're aware of that. Kind of an ancient concept at this point. As for his opponent, he's actually going to start out with Team Provincial Administration. Houses and longhouses have more hit points and support more population. This is a vanilla card, but it has one more effect that it does not have in DE. It increases the build limit of youngs. You might be asking yourself, what is a young? A young is a very weak, trashy gunpowder unit you get from the village. It costs about food and wood. It's supposed to be like a secondary emergency unit. You know... But the thing is, they actually don't cost population and you can train them like regular units. So the point of this Kaiser build is, basically, uh, oh, he's doing the Porcelain Tower in Age 1. This is just like we're doing in DE now. This is what the DE meta has changed to. I guess it works in Wars of Liberty as well. I think he's going to use the Porcelain Tower to afford more youngs to be able to make out of the villages and mass up a large army with them. That's my guess. What's your guess going to be? Is he going to try something a bit different? Now, my guess is, yeah, my guess is since he's sent the trading trade empire, so he has the trading post down, he's got this down, this is going to be a young rush. Yep, here comes the youngs. Zero pop. Just the build limit. Almost like a native warrior, right? But they're very cheap to train. They're not that expensive. Just just not that strong, obviously. So, in terms of stats, like only 10 attack, about only like 80 HP. But you can build about 25 of them at this point in the match. So, you know, if you add them up to like 25, then you, I guess they're doing about 250 damage per shot if they aim at the same thing. So, that could be strong, you know. It could be strong. Now this is interesting. I see him going with uh, snatch of the P snatch the pebble. Shaolin master attack and hit points increased. Also gives your Shaolin master the ability to inflict area damage, delivering critical strikes on every hit for a short interval of time. So this is like a kung fu fighting synergy deck or something. Yeah, see, cool. The cool thing about the Cholo is just hide in the house. You don't have to do anything else. Just hide in the little house, the little casa. 
you're all good to go. And then it's gonna force him to move on to the main base over here with his youngs. And then he's just gonna have to attack this um attack this uh set of villagers over here. Should be good to go. How's the siege on these? Nine siege. Makes sense. Not much better than the range attack. Yeah, see, in little groups, they don't do a lot of damage, but if you get, like, all of them, they can arguably start killing things in one shot. Now, Peru's gonna have a bit of a fighting thing here, so they actually went with the Japanese immigrants. Yeah, the Japanese immigrants. Basically, they can create these guys called cavalry medics. They basically are, like, hussars that can heal your army. Hussars that heal your army. Think a lot like Valkyries in Age of Mythology, you know, cavalry that can heal your units. Oh, look at the Kung Fu fighting! Look at all the karate. Kung Fu fighting. Yeah. Oh, jeez, that, that's some serious Kung Fu fighting right there. All those critical strikes. Oh, jeez, that was... Uh... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it seems like... You need to you need to kung fu fight these guys though. Um, what are you doing? Oh yeah. Well, the youngs the youngs I think can handle themselves now. Yeah. Just gotta make sure you're targeting one unit at a time though, because otherwise you lose that strength in numbers. Oh, yep. You gotta make sure you get the shots in though. Yeah. Fortunately. Yeah, well, the cavalry mechs have a lot of HP, so it's a little bit more cumbersome, but the Machetros you can handle pretty well, I think. Oh, Grenadiers, the... the Legion Puanas. These things will definitely shred these guys up, you know. Only, at like, a handful of grenade throws could probably wipe out this entire army, I would say. Yeah. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Uh, yep, and now we see the youngs coming up here. Uh, Tigerman. Yep, here comes the Tigerman. These are just Quang Pikemen, pretty much, except they trade their spears for like a sword and shield, pretty much. So not much too different about them. You can get them in the same armies as you can in... You get Quang Pikemen in, uh, D. But yeah, he's probably scared of these things, though, these Lucian Puanas. They're definitely going to be a serious problem for him. One more thing to keep note of the Peruvian military, if you kill one Peruvian unit, the rest of them gain speed to help them retreat faster. Or if they have superior numbers, they'll help them chase after you faster, you know. So, almost like the Serbs bonus, where they get more attack from nearby unit deaths, they just get more speed from nearby unit deaths. And then, uh, actually in Age 4, they get a card called the Last Cartridge that actually swaps it for the Serbian bonus. So again, they would start to gain at more attack from nearby dead units and not the speed anymore. The line of sight bonus that they get will stay though, which exists for both situations. Ah, oh, so we see a mix of Chukonu, Youngs, and uh, Tigerman. Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen next year.
Alright, so now we see the cavalry medics going for a bit of raiding up here. Yep. Right over there. And then... Um, Yeah, I'm trying to see what's going to happen after. Where are these medics going to go? Are they going to try to go onto the mine? Yeah, they're going to probably try to get some of these because it's just... It's like looking in a tree full of apples at that point. Just eat one of them. Consume me, you know. Oh, that one they might get because... Yeah, oh, no, no. He didn't, I don't think he got anything there, did he? No. I don't think he got anything out of that at all. So, when does this Chinese build pick up, anyways? See, right now he's just running around with a bunch of these really weak units. He's got a couple of pikers here, a couple of archers. Where does it really pick up? You know, like, when do we see this really start to conquer the enemy? Because it seems like, um, what tags do they get? Yeah, they. Yeah, they don't get any tags or anything, so they actually don't get any sort of malice against them. It's just that the attack is so weak that they only do about 8 damage per shot against them because they get 20% pierce armor. So yeah, only about 8 damage per shot against those units. Okay, so now we see the Confucian Academy coming up. This means he's going to get some skirmishers in the form of the Zangus. Same thing as the Arquebusier of the uh, Ted and D. And instead of the Flying Crows, they produce Long Dragons, you know. They're actual cannons, you know that have some decent multipliers against units. I don't think they have as much of a splash attack as the Flying Crows do. They're better against targeted units most of the time. What are you doing, Peru? What's Peru's plan? Peru, is, I think, is just trying to survive right now. You know, he doesn't know what to expect. He's just getting his Legion Piranha numbers up. Has some Machetros here, has some Cavalry Medics here. I mean, if you heal them that, yep, they'll start to heal each other now, which is great. You know, he definitely needs to heal up a bit. Yep, he's getting healed up as we speak. Stone washing, the first mining upgrade for Land Americans. And the other unit that the Japanese immigrants get is Japanese get is basically just a musketeer style unit, so not as flashy as the Italian immigrants in terms of units, but they actually get better technologies, I think. And his workers, the Japanese forager, is good at gathering berries, which this cherry orchard that the Egypt came up with will gladly show you. The Japanese immigrant houses, as you can imagine, are just shrines, you know. They work the same way. You put them next to uh, next to a couple of animals like this, and they'll improve the trickle of it. Build limits a lot less than Japan Civ, obviously, but it could be a nice addition to your eco. You know, and just like Japan, you can later configure it to trickle XP instead of the other resources too. And I don't think we're going to see it today, but immigrants also have something called a ultimate power. The ultimate power is basically something you get if you stick with one immigrant the whole game. It's like this really powerful Imperial Age effect that grants you something really, really strong. For Japan, it would actually increase your ultimate building limit by two. By one, actually. So you can make a second ultimate building. Which for Peru is useless here because there's no water to put it on, no water gather point. But Let's say if he was Bolivia, that would actually make a big deal. Or if he was um, Brazil or some other city that has Japanese immigrants available. Yep, here's some hand mortars from China alongside the Zangus. These nice female skirmishers. You should be ready to push in at any time now, I think. Yeah, look at all these boxers that just shipped in. That's exactly what he needs right now. Just get these right by the hand mortars, and I think you're good to siege. You're really in a good spot to go sieging right now.
行下命令。行下命令。Yeah, I mean, definitely watch out for these though. These cavalry max, they can sneak up on you real easily. Quite a fast unit too. Well, they're actually not that much quicker than the Hussar, I don't think. I know the Gunter wires that Japan gets, you know, basically the same model and everything, just with the Sawar style multipliers added into it. It's a bit speedier, it's like 7 speed or something, so they run really fast. Oh, no, 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 you gotta protect the moors, you gotta protect the things. What are you doing? Oh. Oh, that's bad. You should not let that happen. Issue averted, thankfully, but still, it kind of gave me a heart attack there. Man, you're gonna let him run right into him. What are you doing? I mean, you got it under control now, but still, you got those ones in the back there. Oh, yeah, that that is not good. That is not good at all. It's frankly really bad. It's very sad. Huh. Now Rommel is up in age three, so now you got another issue to worry about. What is Rommel even going to do in H3? What has he even got up his sleeve? Um, yeah, he could obviously send infinite numbers of these uh, Legion Piranhas or the Vivanderas. Now, these are just female skirmishers. I call Juanitas Muy Bonitas. That, um, they heal your units, you know, alongside being able to act as a skirmisher. I think they're a little bit weaker than European skirmishers, but the healing ability definitely does make up for that in some cases. Give or take. Um... He also has some Lancero shipmen. Think of them as like Sawars or Nagis in terms of their stats. All the land American civs just about have them, or some variant of them. Unique variant of them. Oh, he's going to be going up with Catholicism. I could go into religion for you, but, you know, religion isn't going to be around for that long anymore. Like, in the Great War patch, religion is going to kind of go away. General idea, it was basically a system where you take your villagers to come on here to go pray. And with that faith that you get from praying, you could research special technologies. Like Catholicism, Counter-Reformation, this, this uh, technology grants you a free shipment. As well as other nice, nice little things. And usually the technologies that further appear to the right of the UI tend to be more powerful. Like making your villagers 70% cheaper, um, giving you an actual avatar demigod of Vishnu for Hinduism that shoots lasers out of its sword for like 20 minutes. Yeah, stuff like that, you know, and I guess the team is looking for a more efficient way to represent religion that's not so cumbersome to code and, you know, stuff like that, you know. I'm fine with religion going away for a while since it kind of was nerfed in this version a bit since faith technologies did not boost gathering anymore, which was a big selling point for it. Uh, we'll find a way, we'll find a way to bring religion back. We don't have to be secular or atheist forever, I guess. Oh yeah, look! One villager! Good work! Oh, there's more of them over here, my bad. Oh, I thought I was just going down there to shoot one, one Cholo. Oh, there's more of them. There's more of them. Now you just gotta shoot uh, this one. Oh, here comes the horse grenadiers, the Granado a Caballo. Basically, they're just hussars, normally, but they have the charge grenade throw added into them. So yeah, be careful of that, because they can actually do a lot of damage. Now, their grenade tosses do not have any multiplier against infantry, but, with a big but, they do actually... Since they are scout units, they are affected by a technology called Steel Point Spear, which actually grants them a 2x multiplier against skirmish units to their grenade throw. And that can make them deadly against light infantry units like skirmishers, archers, anything with the skirmish tag. Even mounted skirmishers like the Franca Terradors you saw in the 
you know, the previous match. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Definitely gotta be aware of that. Definitely. So, uh, what's next? What's going on? What are they planning? Veteran level Legion Puanas? Then we got the disciplined boxes up here. Oh, uh, oh, Irish villagers, Irish devotees. So the way these guys work is they're good at praying. You know, they're good at working at churches, pretty much. They're good at praying at churches, and they can also build their Irish houses, which are also churches. You know, they have the church technologies, they can train priests, and, you know, you can uh, pray at them, you know, like a church like any church is, pretty much. De de they're devout Catholics, just like they are in, real in reality, you know, very devout Catholics. Yep, and, uh, wow, look at that. Look at the boxes. That was a good grenade throw, though, to be honest. I mean, he, what, he was, like, only one of them, but for a unit that you, uh, can't get back, I mean, he did pretty well with them, you know. You have to play Argentina to actually train these guys. Or you have to play Gran Colombia, who has a different variant called the uh, Granadero uh, Tarqui, which instead of acting like a Hussar, actually has the multipliers of a demi of a Spanish Lancer, multipliers against infantry with its lance. So yeah, only two civs have mounted grenade throwing units so far. Hopefully that voice continues to grow. A mounted bombardier would be fun, you know. Something like the old store, old school horse grenadiers are just through bombs and nothing else. Which these guys used to do, yeah. Used to do that. I'm just trying to see here, um, what's the next step? A uh, good amount of time on this match, though, and I don't know who's going to come out and kill who at this point. Oh, we got, do got sneaky Peruvian tactics, though. We do see the shock units like the Machetros, the Horse Grenadiers, as well as the uh, Cavalry Megs just sneaking up down here to do some attacking. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's good and all. Very good. Very, very good. And here comes the uh, Lusitano Dragoons. Very good unit. Especially against... Well, the thing is, so you're aware, Dragoons in general or any other maneuver units tend to only deal um, multiplier damage in hand against scout units like Hussars. Which might sound a little bit weird to you that they only deal melee multipliers against Hussars, but because they carry that scout tag, they're only one minute to like the melee. The only thing that they have the range multiplier against is like the assault ones, like the Corsair and stuff. Oh, now we're seeing the exposed grenadiers here taking a lot of damage from all these hand units, just swarming up on them. Just the sheer numbers are killing them at this point. We do see the purple banner armies coming out over here to deal with them. Oh, we see San Patricio Horse Artillery Legion. This should be pretty nice. Yeah, this should be really nice, actually. Yep, and we do. Yep, we see two standard armies, or what they're called boxer armies now, coming out here. Yeah, but seriously though, those cavalry mechs are doing some good work over there, they're keeping the Chinese a little busy. I think in the end, the boxers should be able to handle it though. Definitely. Definitely should be able to handle themselves. Yeah, now they're going to start really snaring it. Yeah, see, the cavalry mechs are going to try to go home to save their base, but the boxers are actually snared them a little bit there to cut down on their time. Just enough time for these hand mortars to really 
shell their way into that base. But then he's gonna have to move his boxes up here. Because obviously you got the cavalry medics coming in. So you need to defend that siege unit really well here to be able to initiate the push. Yeah. And at this rate, I think uh, Peru is basically finished at this point, you know? Really finished at this point. Very, very finished at this. Oh, yeah. I mean. Yep. Oh, nice. Yeah, good. I think he's about almost finished here. Still has some scout units, though, so he has to be careful of that. Uh, so, so be uh, careful of that. Yeah, he still has some more cavalry mags here, too, so he's not out of the woods yet in terms of trying to deal with a going without any pressure, you know? You totally get pressure at any point here. Yeah, I think this new young build, mentioned by Kaiser, may actually be pretty good, because it seems like having a lot of youngs on the field provides a nice meat shield and free unit, pop free unit that you can just spam into your armies. You know, and do a lot of uh, work. Well, they don't do the damage, but they certainly distract the other enemies to the point that your rail units can get the real damage done through and through. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it does seem a little weak getting off the ground, though. Like, I'll I'll tell you how I countered this build. I um used Egypt and did a Bedouin rush with the Bedouins, which are basically Egyptian houses that are basically just mounted camel nomads that um, shoot arrows, so like cab archers. So they, they're technically a building and they're also a cavalry unit, which is kind of strange to think of, but until you realize Egypt doesn't have normal buildings, they just use caravans to go around. So yeah, basically I would just keep spamming the caravans, and because they have so much HP and it didn't matter that they only dealed about 10 damage with each arrow shot. They actually were able to kill the youngs in sufficient numbers to keep well down their numbers right in front of the base. I moved my town center caravan right underneath his and started shipping in things like spearmen, firebrands, even native warriors on the map since it was Mendocino, so I made, you know, some of the Mapuche and Zapotex. Yeah, it was a, it was a fun way of dealing with it, you know, when I really got the job done. Let me just put the light on real quick, it's getting a little dark in here. Be right back in one second. And watch this in the meantime. This wonderful epic uh, pursuit. So, um, here we go. Oh, he, these guys, by the way, are the Kanzu Braves. Essentially, they are a hybrid between a musketeer and a skirmisher. In melee, they obviously have a bayonet to kill cavalry units at range. They actually have skirmisher-style multipliers against, like, maneuver units as well as heavy infantry units. So they're good in a wide variety of situations. And they get shadow tech with each upgrade as well, too, so they're pretty strong overall. Yeah. 
Yep, and now he's gonna have to retreat back to me. So you see, I think he's gonna resign any moment now because, um, at this rate, he's just running out of, uh, units. And he's running out of. How much resources does Peru have at this rate? Yeah, barely anything. I mean, they have plenty of coin to, like, make artillery or something. Like that. And he can obviously make immigrant units, since immigrant units cost shipments. Should have mentioned that, they only cost shipments, they don't cost resources, so... Think of them as like cards of return to build bounty. Because they actually get some XP back. Right here, see that? Yep, yep, you see that jump? Yeah. Yeah, you get a little bit of XP back from making them, so they're actually more efficient than unit cards. At least for this version, and... In the Great Warpath version, they're gonna lose that build bounty because it kinda makes them insane to rush people with. You know, certain immigrant units, when rushed like that, can really destroy somebody. Yeah. Good match, I mean... I give my hat to Rommel for holding out as long as he did, and I also like the build that Kaiser did, too. I should go try that sometime, you know, with China. I don't play a lot of China in Wars of Liberty, so... Maybe since I have such respect for him in DE, maybe that's the maybe that's the way to go. Yep. All right, one more match to go, and we're good. It's the end of the stream. Yeah, I hope everyone's enjoying this stuff and. Hope all the new people from ESOC TV really enjoy watching Wars of Liberty gameplay, you know. I tried to tell, like, a story for each one and try to go through all the, um... Go through all the, um... Matches that they do each week. This week there was only about 15 matches, but other ones you usually see more of them. And overall it's a fun time, you know. I usually recommend anyone that uh, has any questions to send me a comment on the U this what's a YouTube channel typically about Wars of Liberty. It's pretty easy to install. You can um, you can basically find it on the web real easily. The installer is easy to use. You just need Java for the update, or that's about it, really. But everything else is pretty simple. All right, last but not least, Kaiser versus Rommel match two. Alright, so we got Mapuche. I, oh, I know what build he's going with here. Yeah, I know this build exactly what he's doing. He's going to do something with forts, I believe. The South American native fort called the Pukara. Yeah, he's going to use Pukaras here, because they have such an insane range attack. On the other side, though, we got Germany with Rommel. So, yeah, he's... Rommel coming out of that defeat probably figured let's use the strongest Civ in Wars of Liberty right now. Yeah. I would do the same thing if I was desperate to get a win. Yep. Definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. And for sure, in this situation, we definitely need to take into account the type of strategy Germany goes with, because um, if Germany goes for a super duper rush but doesn't build a lot of manor houses, oh yeah, this is very important for people that are coming from DE that never played uh, Wars of Liberty in the past couple of months. Germany is now England. Germany is now British in that they get manor houses now. They're called Mites Canaries. Same cost, same effect of a free villager when you build the thing, so... Yeah, they're just British right now. And actually, their roster is somewhat Britishized, too, because, um... Their Royal Guards are the Musketeer and the Hussar, or the Line Infantry and the Hussar, so... They even adopted that from the British, so... Yeah. And British, in turn, are a very different Civ, you know? They actually get a unique roster. As unique as the Asians, possibly, you know? Everything but their artillery is all unique. And I think even at some point they might be getting unique artillery, too. Which, in uh, the next version, Great Warpatch will actually get upgraded English voice sets, too. 
to be more 20th century like and less uh, Shakespearean. I'm gonna check out. Oh, here's a funny little tidbit for you. Check out the deck of Mapuche. What is going on, people? What's going on? Where's no? Why are there no cards over here? Is this guy? Um, is this guy? Um, is this guy? Uh, you know, eating mushrooms or something? What's going on? Well, basically, um, he is not. He is okay. He knows what he's doing. He knows this because Mapuche actually get cards from their explorers. Doesn't that sound crazy or what? They get cards from their units. Yeah, so apparently each war chief here has a different set of cards that you can send. This effectively means that Mapuche can literally send their entire home city with them if they wanted to. Which they can literally do in some matches. Every card that the Mapuche have access to, they can send during every match. Which totals to like, I don't know, like 200, 300 cards or something. It's madness. But at the same time, if you lose these explorers for whatever reason, then you can't send any more cards and that would cripple you. And each of the uh, War Chiefs has different combat abilities, like this one uses a bow, this one condemns the, you to hell, and I'm not kidding you. She does a little wave of her staff and this this uh, Erwin Rommel will meet Adolf in burning flames and eternal hell. Fire, so yeah, yeah, literally, you know, and I'm not kidding. That's actually one of the abilities that's kind of again removed from most of the mod in the Great War patch. Only I think uh, Grigory Rasputin, which is a special priest that the Russians can get in Imperial Age, will have that condemn ability left. Everybody else is just going to go back to being regular healers again, which is kind of sad because I I really like the condemn ability a lot. It's kind of cool. I think Napoleonic era did something similar, but it literally just worked like a bomb. You see the Munich just getting blown up or something. Yeah. Kind of cool stuff. Yeah, see, she's going to con condemn this polar bear to hell right now. Hellfire. Yep. That bear is landed in the lake of fire. He doesn't need that warm coat anymore where he's going. <laughs> yeah, very good. Very good. Very good. Very, very good. It's actually not a bad treasure either because Mapuche, as you know, since they have so many cards in their hand, they really like the experience points. And to aid with experience points, all villagers, as they're gathering and working, will trickle XP as they're working. Yeah, that's kind of insane to think about, that they're actually gathering two resources at the same time. The stuff that they're actually gathering and then the experience. So that they can inevitably send out more cards. And I could give you a rundown too of the particular cards that they send. So he sends villager cards, crate cards, basically everything from, uh, yeah, pretty much all the crates and villagers, explorer cards, that type of stuff. This one will send you stuff related to, you know, civil stuff like forts and stuff about towers and build limits and building hit points and native warriors that type of stuff and uh, this one will send you stuff for military units like infantry and artillery they actually get a separate war chief a six one that you can unlock that will deal with exclusively cavalry units and then this one oh this uh, let me get the other one um, where is she yep this one is all economic stuff, so all the resource gathering technologies. And lastly, this one deals with support cards, naval cards, like sh fishing boats and stuff, and also um, renegade cards, like uh, renegade Argentinians and Chileans, which they have a couple of shipments for. Yeah. Alright, so that enough about Mapuche, let's go back to Germany. So Germany did something really OP, they just sent the Frankfurt Trade Fair. It makes all of the market technologies free to research. All of them. Everything from hunting dogs all the way up to circular saw. Wow. Who came up with that idea? I don't know. But, um, it's a thing for now. 
the devs finally came to their senses and got the card booted out for the Great War Pats, though. So, once again, you can defeat Germany eventually in 2024, hopefully. It's actually not that bad, I mean... If you're very smart and clever, you still can beat Germany, but you just have to be more careful with it, though. But I think once people really caught on to the Frankfurt Trade Fair, things really took a nosedive in terms of capability of defeating them. Right now, he's currently on Log Flume and Steel Traps. I don't know if he has Amalgamation yet, but once he gets that, he's going to have all those technologies locked in for free. Alongside being able to make settlers for free from his houses. What is this sieve? And then you get free military units from your barracks. One landware infantry. Now this one's kind of funny to watch because he's actually a Minuteman. You can tell from the multipliers he's a Minuteman. And he actually loses hit points over time. See, Germany has these weird Minuteman style units. They also have a cavalry version which works a bit like a Sawar. When you build a stable. And in order to negate that effect, oh, he doesn't have it. There's actually two cards called uh, the Bismarck model, which lets you um, stop them from losing hit points. So they actually become useful military units. And then a second uh, Royal Decree card that they can get called Wealth Politic, which will actually let you train these guys at barracks and stables, respectively. And also allows you to upgrade them. But the thing... The trade-off would be is um, they get more expensive um, the more of them you have on the field. So they're, you know, you remember Australia? People who played Wars of Liberty ages ago. Australia, when the units became more expensive, the more of them you trained. Yeah, that applies to these guys once that Royal Decree comes out. So keep that in mind. And you can also acquire this unit from the Redoubt. The Redoubt has a, you know, how the town so you can make a batch of Minutemen. These towers, the redoubts, can do the same thing, but they can send a group of the Landmore Infantry, and they can then send a group of the Landmore Cavalry if they want to. Obviously, you can't make it again once you send it. So, you would literally have to lose this tower, build another tower to use it again. Yep, here goes the Mapuche War Chiefs. Yep. There we go. Yeah, very nice. Very nice. Very nice. What cards is Mapuche again? Uh, yeah, the Mapuche Ross. So this is the Pucara. This is the South American native fort. It works a bit differently. Well, yeah, because they actually get bet big bun technologies too that gives them special effects to your sieve. For the Inca one, it will give them a multiplier against cavalry to the cannon attack here. For the Mapuche, though, it, what's their spearmen? The Wakalafs actually um, build landmines underneath the ground that blow up when enemy units walk over them, instantly killing them. Sounds pretty sick, right? Yeah, it is. It's pretty, pretty sick indeed. Pretty sick indeed. And uh, spies in this game can also do that, too, since spies... Um, they don't just kill mercenaries anymore, they do a bunch of weird functionalities, too. So what is he making exactly? He's making Hwamplins? Yeah, don't make Hwamplins, that's that's kind of a bad idea. Yeah, make Trocatufes. These these are good, these are good units. These are basically skirmishers, but they have high hit points. They have high hit points. High hit points. Yeah, pretty much you would send a group of these alongside the Winnetou phase, which is a ranged cavalry that throws a bow ass at the enemy. They're actually, in Definitive Edition, is the native unit that they have. So, pretty similar to that, actually. And then you got these guys, the Mawadanches. They're basically like a super god unit that um, you get as an emergency unit. Instead of being only good against, like, siege units, it has a multiple... It, it works like the Kanzu Brave, where its range attack is like that of a skirmisher, and its melee attack is like that of a line, in, like a musketeer. But, it has high HP, shadow techs, and it deals... 
has 40% pierce armor, and it deals all, all hack damage, so melee damage. It's melee damage in range, and melee, range, melee damage in hand. My, my. And I think about this time he's going to try to go for some sort of push on his opponent right now. Yep, and now you're going to be attacking the Zeppelins here. Good. Very good. What is Germany going to do, though? That's why I'm wondering, because Germany, as you know, they have a lot of different... Op oh, yeah! By the way, by the way, by the way, um, Corsairs are now a common unit for Europe. Yeah, that's... <laughs> yeah, so basically everybody became France now. They all have these guys that they can train. And Yuan's are no longer a German unit, but he got these from a fancy card called, um... West Prussian Yuans, yeah. And also, Germany surprisingly has skirmishers again, you know? No more Jaegers, at least for now. So they, they're just using ordinary skirmishers again. They don't get a Royal Guard for them, though, sadly. But, um, they probably will... Well, yeah, I don't think they're ever going to get a Royal Guard again since that goes to the Hussars and the Musketeers now for the Civ. Or the line of the if you want to be modern. No, it's the 20th century, after all. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, at this point... Oh, look at that Maladanchi! He just killed all the Corsairs. And there's still a wide number of them left, too, just slicing through the armor of the skirmishers. Unreal. Unreal indeed. What does uh, Germany even have up their sleeve to deal with this mess? I mean, yeah. he's, he's going to try to fish boom a little okay. bit, you know, get a little bit of fishing ships going. You know? Yeah. Three curses. I mean, they actually do quite a bit of damage. I mean, they got like two splash. They are going to be nerfed in the Great War patch, so that one splash. So, fortunately, that's going to occur. The main reason being, they really shouldn't be able to kill that many units than they should than they do right now, being a mainstream unit at this point. And this is the other thing in Germany I should mention. They get this wonderful building called the Krug Factory. It produces artillery for free. And we can configure it to produce other different forms of artillery as well. And in fact, with a card like this, the Essence style work, you can actually even make heavy cannons with the crew factory called uh, steel, steel guns in this game. With a bit of a different model. You know, they have the same stats, they just look a lot more modern looking. And your crew factors will actually be able to produce those heavy cannons. Obviously at a slower rate than these Falks here, but, um, yeah, pretty, it, eventually they'll come out and they'll do a lot of damage. Mm. Biggest threat though would be the Boca Fuegos, obviously, these Culverins here. And, um, yep, here comes the Essence style work right now, actually. That'll grant him a free crew factory, so he'll have about two of these pumping cannons out. About two of them. Yeah. 
Ja? Yeah, I mean, at this rate, it's like... It's kind of an interesting fight because technically the German army at this game is technically stronger, but... Yeah, I mean, they actually even have a better score right now economically. Like, I don't know who's gonna come out on top here, honestly. So these guys, the Trangolafs, don't be fooled by them. They do look like the Ironwood Clubman natives, but they actually have the opposite purpose. They're good against infantry. They're basically an assault, foot assault unit, so they're like a Spanish Lancer on foot. So they have multipliers against, like, infantry. So they're good at throwing in the groups of things like skirmishers, also musketeers, stuff like that. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Pretty much. Oh, um, looks, ah, so Mapuche are actually going to ship in some canoes to destroy the German water economy. That's always fun. Yeah, remember, Mapuche, they have infinite cards, so... Not literally infinite cards, but, well, they can act... Some of their cards are infinite, but, um, they do have every card in the book that they can use, native-wise. So, they shipping in a group of canoes to their water gabber point is no problem at all for them, really. How many canoes is this going to be? Yeah, about five of them. Yeah, that's going to devastate that economy. Might actually have to make a light ship called an Aviso to counter that. Will he make one? Will he make an Aviso or is he just going to let the water just fall apart? Really depends on his priorities, really. Uh, yep, get that foot artillery down, that falcon. Try to get some shots in if you can. Okay, but then you got the Book of Fuegos, uh, I'm surprised this candid- Yeah, I, I was gonna say I'm surprised it was still alive there, because it seemed like it should have been dead a while ago, but... Yeah, now they're, now they're getting clobbered. This is not good. I don't wanna get clobbered like that. Yep, here comes the uh, Corsairs, followed by some skirmishes and free falconets. At this rate, I would probably say that um, Germany is actually on the losing side of the battle at this point, because he's dealing with these really nasty tanky skirmishers that he hasn't really been able to deal with yet. Also, the Tranglers are doing a pretty good job at defending right now. So I don't know what's going to happen there. It seems like Germany is struggling quite a bit. Also, you got these artillery pieces, actually called artillery pieces, that, you know, they're basically like mini falcon heads. It only costs, like, what, four? Four resources, so, yeah, these guys are pretty strong. Pretty strong unit. Yeah, yeah the canoes definitely cleaned up that side of the map, that's for sure. No more fish to talk about. No more fishing ships. Oh, 
Yep, more cursors. Well, it kind of was their opportunity because the wake laughs and the remaining Maladanches kind of threatened them from doing that. But it's going to try going for another splash attack carefully placed here, which. Yeah, that's not going to work. Um, yeah, I think Kaiser has it from here, though. Yeah, don't be fooled. I mean, Kaiser technically has a lower score, but <laughs> because he's keeping his army alive, he now has the real advantage. Yeah, most certainly. And then he's going to... Germany's going to try to send his two barracks wagons to try to protect it. It also uh, makes the veteran musketeer upgrade free as well, so yeah, yeah, that's the other good thing of it. Yeah, because normally two barracks wagons would be like, that's kind of a weak ship at like 400 wood value, really? But no, it does actually give you a free technology as well. Yep, and then um. The crew factory is going down. That's not gonna. That's basically fatal for Germany because that's his free source of artillery. Yeah, good, good work, uh, Mapuche. You know, Mapuche are always the underdogs. If you know, they're not that strong. I've noticed in the past that Mapuche are not that strong of a sit militarily. So when they can pull off really good wins like this, it's kind of fun to watch. You know. This is, by the way, a, um, a European heavy warship right here. This is the way they look like. They're called a battleship. And basically, they're the ones that have the broadside attack now. There's this little system in Wars of Liberty called the Naval System, where um, there's light ships that take bonus damage, take hard damage from the heavy ships. The heavy ships... Um, take heavy damage from seed ships and then the seed ships take heavy damage from the light ships so it's actually the same ship system that exists in age of mythology between you know the hammer ships the uh, arrow ships and then the uh, seed ships so yeah it's actually the same system but they brought over to aoe 3 yeah i mean i felt like this was a good encounter between rommel and kaiser i haven't seen rommel play in a while so I think he's going to have to, you know, play a couple more matches before he gets back into the swing of things, you know, in the competitive play, but overall a good attempt. This Kaiser build with Bapuche actually killed me the day that he did it, because what he did was, he had an army of samurai attacking him, and this fort with this giant range attack actually killed a lot of my samurai instantly, which completely obliterated everything. You know, I lost everything because of that. So yeah, it was pretty insane. But GG. Good encounters. You know, good encounters. Not just Kaiser and Rommel, but everybody's encounters was great today. All 15 matches in total. Uh, I'm going to look at the post game, see if there's anything. Yeah, Rommel had the more resources because of the Frankfurt Trade Fair was basically cheating him in resources practically. He, uh, but Mapuche kept up with the unit numbers and therefore got the kills they needed to really push and siege. Yeah, that's basically it. I hope everyone enjoyed all these matches today. I know some people came in a bit later from ESOC TV. As you see, we do things a bit differently here for these types of live streams because um, there's so many matches to cover. You know, you can't really sit and converse too much about stuff. I do a little bit of talking at the beginning, though, usually. Like, before I turn the recording on, you know, to give everybody, like, ten minutes to come in and stuff. But if anybody missed any matches at all, because I've been at this since ten this morning, you're more than free to see the VOD on Unstoppable Stiletzi YouTube channel. That's where I put all my VODs on, you know. Just so I can keep them all in one place, sort of, and keep everything organized. Yeah, that's what I usually do, you know. YouTube is like my main platform, really. So, that's where I put everything. I don't just do AOE 3, I do Age of Mythology, I do AOE 4, AOE 2, whatever I'm in the mood for. I even do Star Wars Battlefront 2 stuff, and I got more plans coming, too, in the future, so watch out for that, you know. I'm always thinking of new stuff to do. 
things are a bit tough right now, but when things ease down a bit, I'll be able to do more. So yeah, see you next time. Signing off now from this stream. Hopefully we do League of Week 17 next week or the week after that. See you then.